On the Creed, a sermon to the catechumens by Augustine of Hippo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A sermon to the catechumens. Receive, my children, the rule of faith, which is called the symbol, or creed. And when ye have received it, write it in your heart, and be daily saying it to yourselves, before ye sleep, before ye go forth, arm you with your creed. The creed no man writes, so it may be able to be read, but for rehearsal of it, lest haply forgetfulness obliterate what care hath delivered, let your memory be your record roll, what ye are about to hear, that are ye to believe, and what ye shall have believed, that are about to give back with your tongue. For the apostle says, With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For this is the creed which ye are to rehearse and to repeat in answer. These words which ye have heard are in the divine scriptures scattered up and down, but thence gathered and reduced into one, that the memory of slow persons might not be distressed, that every person may be able to say, able to hold, what he believes. For have ye now merely heard that God is almighty? But ye begin to have him for your father, when ye have been born by the church as your mother. Of this then ye have now received, have meditated, and having meditated have held, that ye should say, I believe in God the Father almighty. God is almighty, and yet, though almighty, he cannot die, cannot be deceived, cannot lie, and, as the apostle says, cannot deny himself. How many things that he cannot do, and yet is almighty! Yea, therefore is almighty, because he cannot do these things. For if he could die, he were not almighty. If to lie, if to be deceived, if to do unjustly were possible for him, he were not almighty. Because, if this were in him, he should not be worthy to be almighty. To our Almighty Father it is quite impossible to sin. He does whatsoever he will, that is omnipotence. He does whatsoever he rightly will, whatsoever he justly will, but whatsoever is evil to do he wills not. There is no resisting one who is almighty, that he should not do what he will. It was he who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, invisible and visible. Invisible, such as are in heaven, Thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, archangels, angels, all, if we shall live aright, our fellow citizens. He made in heaven the things visible, the sun, the moon, the stars. With its terrestrial animals he adorned the earth, filled the air with things that fly, the land with them that walk and creep, the sea with them that swim. All he filled with their own proper creatures. He made also man after his own image and likeness in the mind, for in that is the image of God. This is the reason why the mind cannot be comprehended even by itself, because in it it is the image of God. To this end we were made, that over the other creatures we should bear rule, but through sin in the first man we fell, and all are come into an inheritance of death. We were brought low, became mortal, were filled with fears, with errors. This by desert of sin, with which desert and guilt is every man born. This is the reason why, as ye have seen today, as ye know, even little children undergo exsufflation, exorcism, to drive away from them the power of the devil, their enemy, which deceived man that it might possess mankind. It is not then the creature of God that in infants undergoes exorcism or exsufflation, but he under whom are all that are born with sin, for he is the first of sinners. And for this cause, by reason of one who fell and brought all into death, there was sent one without sin, who should bring unto life by delivering them from sin all that believe on him. For this reason we believe also in his Son, that is to say, God the Father Almighty's, his only Son our Lord. When thou hearest of the only Son of God, acknowledge him God. For it could not be that God's only Son should not be God. What he is, the same did he beget, though he is not that person whom he begot. If he be truly son, he is that which the father is. If he be not that which the father is, he is not truly son. Observe mortal and earthly creatures, what each is, that it engendereth. 
Man begets not an ox, sheep begets not dog, nor dog sheep. Whatever it be that begetteth, that which it is it begetteth. Hold ye therefore boldly, firmly, faithfully, that the begotten of God the Father is what himself is, almighty, these mortal creatures engender by corruption. Does God so beget? He that is begotten, mortal, generates that which himself is. The immortal generates what he is. Corruptible begets corruptible. Incorruptible begets incorruptible. The corruptible begets corruptibly. Incorruptible incorruptibly. Yea, so begetteth what itself is, that one begets one, and therefore only. Ye know that when I pronounced to you the creed, so I said, and so ye are bounden to believe that we believe in God the Father Almighty and in Jesus Christ his only Son. Here too, when thou believest that he is the only, believe him almighty. For it is not to be thought that God the Father does what he will, and God the Son does not what he will. One will of Father and Son because one nature. For it is impossible for the will of the Son to be any whit parted from the Father's will. God and God, both one God, Almighty and Almighty, both one Almighty. We do not bring in two gods, as some do, who say, God the Father and God the Son, but greater God the Father and lesser God the Son. They both are what? Two gods? Thou blushest to speak it, blush to believe it. Lord God the Father, thou sayest, and Lord God the Son, and the Son himself saith, No man can serve two lords. In his family shall we be in such wise that... Like as in a great house where there is the father of the family and he hath a son, so we should say the greater lord, the lesser lord? Shrink from such a thought. If ye make to yourselves such like in your heart, ye set up idols in the one soul. Utterly repel it. First believe, then understand. Now to whom God gives that when he has believed, he soon understands. That is God's gift, not human frailness. Still, if ye do not yet understand, believe. One God the Father, God, Christ the Son of God, both are what? One God. And how are both said to be one God? How? Dost thou marvel? In the Acts of the Apostles, there was, it says, in the believers one soul and one heart. There were many souls, faith had made them one. So many thousands of souls were there, they loved each other, and many are one. They loved God in the fire of charity, and from being many they are come to the oneness of beauty." If all those many souls, the dearness of love made one soul, what must be the dearness of love in God, where is no diversity but entire equality? If on earth and among men there could be so great charity, as of so many souls to make one soul, where father from son, son from father, hath been ever inseparable, could they both be other than one God? Only those souls might be called both many souls and one soul, but God in whom is ineffable and highest conjunction, may be called one God, not two gods. The Father doth what he will, and what he will doth the Son. Do not imagine an almighty Father and a not almighty Son. It is error blotted out within you. Let it not cleave in your memory. Let it not be drunk into your faith. And if haply any of you shall have drunk it in, let him vomit it up. Almighty is the Father, almighty the Son. If almighty begat not almighty... He begat not very son. For what say we? Brethren, if the father, being greater, begat a son less than he. What said I begat? Man engenders, being greater, a son being less, it is true. But that is because the one grows old, the other grows up, and by very growing attains to the form of his father. The son of God, if he groweth not, because neither can God wax old, was begotten perfect. And being begotten perfect, if he groweth not, and remained not less, he is equal. For that ye may know Almighty, begotten of Almighty, hear him who is truth. That which of itself truth saith is true. What saith truth? What saith the Son who is truth? Whatsoever things the Father doth, these also the Son likewise doth. The Son is Almighty in doing all things that he willeth to do. For if the Father doth some things which the Son doth not, the Son said falsely, Whatsoever things the Father doth, these also the Son doth likewise. But because the Son spake truly, believe it. Whatsoever things the Father doth, these also the Son doth likewise. And ye have believed in the Son, that he is almighty. Which word, although ye said not in the creed, yet this is it that ye expressed when ye believed in the only Son, himself God. 
Hath the father aught that the son hath not? This Arian heretic blasphemer say not I. And what say I? If the father hath aught that the son hath not, the son lieth in saying, All things that the father hath are mine. Many and innumerable are the testimonies by which it is proved that the Son is very Son of God the Father, and the Father God hath his very begotten Son God, and Father and Son is one God. But this only Son of God, the Father Almighty, let us see what he did for us, what he suffered for us, born of the Holy Ghost and of the Virgin Mary. He, so great God, equal with the Father, born of the Holy Ghost and of the Virgin Mary, born lowly, that thereby he might heal the proud. Man exalted himself and fell, God humbled himself and raised him up. Christ's lowliness, what is it? God hath stretched out an hand to man laid low. We fell, he descended. We laid low, he stooped. Let us lay hold and rise, that we fall not into punishment. So then, his stooping to us is this, born of the Holy Ghost and of the Virgin Mary. His very nativity, too, as man, it is lowly and it is lofty. When's lowly? that as man he was born of men, whence lofty, that he was born of a virgin, a virgin conceived, a virgin bore, and after the birth was a virgin still. What next? Suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was in office as governor, and was the judge, this same Pontius Pilate. What time as Christ suffered? In the name of the judge there is a mark of the times when he suffered under Pontius Pilate, when he suffered, was crucified, dead, and buried. Who? What? For whom? Who? God's only Son, our Lord. What? Crucified, dead, and buried. For whom? For ungodly and sinners. Great condescension, great grace. What shall I render unto the Lord for all that he hath bestowed on me? He was begotten before all times, before all worlds. Begotten before. Before what? He in whom is no before. Do not in the least imagine any time before that nativity of Christ, whereby he was begotten of the Father. Of that nativity I am speaking by which he is the Son of God Almighty, his only Son our Lord. Of that I am first speaking. Do not imagine in this nativity a beginning of time. Do not imagine any space of eternity in which the Father was and the Son was not. Since when the Father was, since then the Son. And what is that since where is no beginning. Therefore, if ever the Father without beginning, ever the Son without beginning. And how thou wilt say, was he begotten, if he have no beginning? Of eternal, co-eternal. At no time was the Father and the Son not. And yet Son of Father was begotten. Whence is any manner of similitude to be had? We are among things of earth. We are in the visible creatures. Let the earth give me a similitude. It gives none. Let the element of the waters give me some similitude, it hath not whereof to give. Some animal give me a similitude, neither can this do it. An animal indeed engenders both what engenders and what is engendered, but first is the father, and then is born the son. Let us find the coeval and imagine it co-eternal. If we shall be able to find a father coeval with his son, and son coeval with his father, let us believe God the father coeval with his son, and God the son co-eternal with his father. On earth we can find some coeval, we cannot find any co-eternal. Let us stretch the coeval and imagine it co-eternal. Someone, it may be, will put you on the stretch by saying, When is it possible for a father to be found coeval with his son, or son coeval with his father? That the father may beget... He goes before in age, that the son may be begotten, he comes after in age, but this father coeval with son, or son with father, how can it be? Imagine to yourselves fire as father, its shining as sun. See, we have found the coevals. From the instant that the fire begins to be, that instant it begets the shining, neither fire before shining nor shining after fire. And if we ask which begets which... The fire the shining, or the shining the fire, immediately ye conceive by natural sense, by the innate wit of your minds, ye all cry out, The fire the shining, not the shining the fire. Lo, here you have a father beginning. Lo, a son at the same time, neither going before nor coming after. Lo, here then is a father beginning. Lo, a son at the same time beginning. If I have shown you a father beginning, and a son at the same time beginning, believe the father not beginning, and with him the Son not beginning either, the one eternal, the other co-eternal. 
If ye get on with your learning, ye understand. Take pains to get on. The being born ye have, but also the growing ye ought to have, because no man begins with being perfect. As for the Son of God indeed, he could be born perfect, because he was begotten without time, co-eternal with the Father, long before all things, not in age, but in eternity. He then was begotten co-eternal, of which generation the prophet said, His generation who shall declare? Begotten of the Father without time. He was born of the Virgin in the fullness of times. This nativity had times going before it. In opportunity of time, when he would, when he knew, then was he born. For he was not born without his will. None of us is born because he will, and none of us dies when he will. He, when he would, was born. When he would, he died. How he would, he was born of a virgin. How he would, he died on the cross. Whatever he would, he did, because he was in such wise man, that, unseen, he was God. God assuming, man assumed. One Christ, God and man. Of his cross, what shall I speak? What say? This extremest kind of death he chose, that not any kind of death might make his martyrs afraid. The doctrine he showed in his life as man, the example of patience he demonstrated in his cross. There you have the work that he was crucified. Example of the work, the cross. Reward of the work, resurrection. He showed us in the cross what we ought to endure. He showed in the resurrection what we have to hope. Just like a consummate taskmaster in the matches of the arena, he said, Do and bear, do the work and receive the prize. Strive in the match and thou shalt be crowned. What is the work? Obedience. What is the prize? Resurrection without death. Why did I add without death? Because Lazarus rose and died. Christ rose again, dieth no more. Death will no longer have dominion over him. Scripture saith, Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord. When we read what great trials Job endured, it makes one shudder, it makes one shrink, it makes one quake. And what did he receive? The double of what he had lost. Let not a man, therefore, with an eye to temporal rewards, be willing to have patience and say to himself, Let me endure loss, God will give me back sons twice as many. Job received a double of all, and begat as many sons as he had buried. Then is this not the double? Yes, precisely the double, because the former sons still lived. Let none say, Let me bear evils, and God will repay me as he repaid Job, that it be now no longer patience but avarice, for if it was not patience which that saint had, nor a brave enduring of all that came upon him, the testimony which the Lord gave, whence would he have it? Hast thou observed, saith the Lord my servant Job, for there is not like him any on the earth, a man without fault, a true worshipper of God? What a testimony, my brethren, did this holy man deserve of the Lord, and yet him a bad woman sought by her persuasion to deceive, she too representing that serpent who, like as in paradise, he deceived the man whom God first made, so likewise here, by suggesting blasphemy, thought to be able to deceive a man who pleased God. What things he suffered, my brethren, who can have so much to suffer in his estate, his house, his sons, his flesh, yea, in his very wife, who was left to be his tempter? But even her who was left, the devil, could have taken away long ago, but that he kept her to be his helper, because by Eve he had mastered the first man, therefore had he kept an Eve. What things then he suffered? He lost all that he had, his house fell. Would that were all, it crushed his sons also and to see that patience and great place in him, hear what he answered. The Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away, as it pleased the Lord, so hath it been done, blessed be the name of the Lord. He hath taken what he gave. Is he lost who gave? He hath taken what he gave, as if he should say, He hath taken away all, let him take all, send me away naked, and let me keep him. What shall I lack if I have God, or what is the good of all else to me if I have not God? Then it came to his flesh, he was stricken with a wound from head to foot, he was one running sore, one mass of crawling worms, and showed himself immovable in his God, stood fixed. The woman wanted, devil's helper, as she was not husband's comforter, to put him up to blaspheme God. How long, she said, dost thou suffer so and so, speak some word against the Lord and die? So then, because he had been brought low, he was to be exalted. And this the Lord did in order to show it to men. As for his servant, he kept greater things for him in heaven. 
So then Job, who was brought low, he exalted. The devil, who was lifted up, he brought low, for he putteth down one and setteth up another. But let not any man, my beloved brethren, when he suffers any such like tribulations, look for a reward here. For instance, if he suffer any losses, let him not peradventure say, The Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away. As it pleased the Lord, so is it done. Blessed be the name of the Lord, only with the mind to receive twice as much again. Let patience praise God, not avarice. If what thou hast lost, thou seekest to receive back twofold, and therefore praisest God, it is of covetousness thou praisest, not of love. Do not imagine this to be the example of that holy man, thou deceivest thyself. When Job was enduring all, he was not hoping for to have twice as much again, both in his first confession when he bore up under his losses and bore out to the grave the dead bodies of his sons, and in the second, when he was now suffering torments of sores in his flesh. Ye may observe what I am saying. Of his former confession the words run thus, The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. As it pleased the Lord, so is it done. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He might have said, The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. He that took away can once more give, can bring back more than he took. He said not this, but, As it pleased the Lord, said he, so is it done, because it pleases him, let it please me. Let not that which hath pleased the good Lord misplease his submissive servant. What pleased the physician, not misplease the sick man. Here his other confession, Thou hast spoken, said he to his wife like one of the foolish women. If we have received good at the hand of the Lord, why shall we not bear evil? He did not add, What, if he had said, would have been true, the Lord is able both to bring back my flesh into its former condition, and that which he hath taken away from us, to make manifold more, lest he should seem to have endured in hope of this. This was not what he said, not what he hoped. But that we might be taught, did the Lord that for him, not hoping for it, by which we should be taught that God was with him, because if he had not also restored to him those things, there was the crown indeed, but hidden, and we could not see it. And therefore... What says the divine scripture in exhorting to patience and hope of things future, not reward of things present? Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord. Why is it the patience of Job, and not ye have seen the end of Job himself? Thou wouldst open thy mouth for the twice as much, wouldst say, Thanks be to God, let me bear up, I receive twice as much again like Job. Patience of Job, end of the Lord. The patience of Job we know, and the end of the Lord we know. What end of the Lord? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They are the words of the Lord hanging on the cross. He did, as it were, leave him for present felicity, not leave him for eternal immortality. In this is the end of the Lord. The Jews hold him, the Jews insult, the Jews bind him, crown him with thorns, dishonor him with spitting, scourge him, overwhelm him with revilings, hang him upon the tree, pierce him with a spear, last of all bury him. He was, as it were, left, but by whom? By those insulting ones. Therefore thou shalt but to this end have patience, that thou mayest rise again and not die, that is, never die, even as Christ. For so we read, Christ, rising from the dead, henceforth dieth not. He ascended into heaven, believe. He sitteth at the right hand of the Father, believe. By sitting, understand dwelling, as in Latin we say of any person, in that country he dwelt, said it three years. The scripture also has that expression, that such an one dwelt, said this, in a city for such a time, not meaning that he sat and never rose up. On this account the dwellings of men are called seats, said this. Where people are seated in this sense, are they always sitting? Is there no rising, no walking, no lying down? And yet they are called seats, said this. In this way, then, believe an inhabiting of Christ on the right hand of God the Father. He is there. And let not your heart say to you, What is he doing? Do not want to seek what is not permitted to find. He is there. It suffices you. He is blessed, and from blessedness, which is called the right hand of the Father, of very blessedness, the name is right hand of the Father. For if we take it carnally, then because he sitteth on the right hand of the Father, the Father will be on his left hand, is it consistent with piety, so to put them together, the son on the right, the father on the left? There it is all right hand, because no misery is there. Thence he shall come to judge the quick and dead. 
the quick who shall be alive and remain the dead who shall have gone before. It may also be understood thus, the living, the just, the dead, the unjust, for he judges both, rendering unto each his own. To the just he will say in the judgment, Come, ye blessed of my Father, receive the kingdom prepared for you from the beginning of the world. For this prepare yourselves, for these things hope, for this live and so live, for this believe, for this be baptized, that it may be said to you, Come, ye blessed of my Father, receive the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. To them on the left hand, what? Go into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Thus will they be judged by Christ, the quick and the dead. We have spoken of Christ's first nativity, which is without time, spoken of the other in the fullness of time, Christ's nativity of the Virgin, spoken of the passion of Christ, spoken of the coming of Christ to judgment. The whole is spoken, that was to be spoken of Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. But not yet is the Trinity perfect. It follows in the Creed and in the Holy Ghost. This trinity, one God, one nature, one substance, one power, highest equality, no division, no diversity, perpetual dearness of love. Would ye know the Holy Ghost, that he is God? Be baptized, and ye will be his temple. The apostle says, Know ye not that your bodies are the temples within you of the Holy Ghost, whom ye have of God? A temple is for God, thus also Solomon, king and prophet, was bidden to build a temple for God. If he had built a temple for the sun or moon or some star or some angel, would not God condemn him? Because therefore he built a temple for God, he showed that he worshipped God. And of what did he build? Of wood and stone, because God deigned to make unto himself by his servant an house on earth, where he might be asked, where he might be had in mind. Of which blessed Stephen says, Solomon built him an house, howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made by hand. If then our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost, what manner of God is it that built a temple for the Holy Ghost? But it was God, for our bodies be a temple of the Holy Ghost, the same built this temple for the Holy Ghost that built our bodies. Listen to the apostle saying, God hath tempered the body, giving unto that which lacked the greater honor, when he was speaking of the different members that there should be no schisms in the body. God created our body, the grass God created, our body who created How do we prove that the grass is God's creating? He that clothes, the same creates. Read the gospel. If then the grass of the field, saith it, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, God so clotheth. He then creates who clothes. And the apostle, thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die, and that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be but a bare grain as perchance of wheat or of some other corn, but God giveth it a body as he would, and to each one of seeds its proper body. If then it be God that builds our bodies, God that builds our members, and our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost, doubt not that the Holy Ghost is God, and do not add, as it were, a third God, because Father and Son and Holy Ghost is one God, so believe ye. It follows after the commendation of the Trinity, the Holy Church. God is pointed out, and his temple For the temple of God is holy, says the apostle, which temple are ye? This same is the holy church, the one church, the true church, the Catholic church, fighting against all heresies. Fight it can, be fought down it cannot. As for heresies, they went all out of it, like as unprofitable branches pruned from the vine, but itself abideth in the root, in its vine, in its charity. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Forgiveness of Sins Ye have this article of the creed perfectly in you when ye receive baptism. Let none say, I have done this or that sin, perchance that is not forgiven me. What hast thou done? How great a sin hast thou done? Name any heinous thing thou hast committed, heavy, horrible, which thou shudderest even to think of, have done what thou wilt. Hast thou killed Christ? There is not than that deed any worse, because also than Christ there is nothing better. What a dreadful thing is it to kill Christ! Yet the Jews killed him, and many afterwards believed on him and drank his blood. They are forgiven the sin which they committed. When you have been baptized, hold fast a good life in the commandments of God, that you may guard your baptism even unto the end. I do not tell you that ye will live here without sin, but they are venial, without which this life is not. For the sake of all sins was baptism provided, for the sake of light sins, without which we cannot be, was prayer provided. What hath the prayer? 
Forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. Once for all we have the washing in baptism, every day we have washing in prayer. Only do not commit those things for which you must needs be separated from Christ's body, which be far from you. For those whom ye have seen doing penance have committed heinous things, either adulteries or some enormous crimes, for these they do penance, because if theirs had been light sins, to blot out these daily prayer would suffice. In three ways, then, are sins remitted in the church, by baptism, by prayer, by the greater humility of penance, yet God doth not remit sins but to the baptized. The very sins which he remits first, he remits not but to the baptized. When? When they are baptized. The sins which are after remitted upon prayer, upon penance, to whom he remits, it is to the baptized that he remitteth. For how can they say, Our Father, who are not yet born sons? The catechumens, so long as they be such, have upon them all their sins. If catechumens, how much more pagans, how much more heretics? But to heretics we do not change their baptism. Why? Because they have baptism in the same way as a deserter has the soldier's mark. Just so these also have baptism. They have it, but to be condemned thereby not crowned. And yet, if the deserter himself, being amended, begin to do duty as a soldier, does any man dare to change his mark? We believe also the resurrection of the flesh, which went before in Christ, that the body too may have hope of that which went before in its head, the head of the church, Christ, the church, the body of Christ. Our head is risen, ascended into heaven, where the head, they are also the members. In what way the resurrection of the flesh, lest any should chance to think it like Lazarus's resurrection, that thou mayest know it to be not so, it is added into life everlasting. God regenerate you, God preserve and keep you, God bring you safe unto him who is the life everlasting. Amen. End of On the Creed, A Sermon to the Catechumens by Augustine of Hippo A Sectional Confession of Faith Attributed to Gregory Thabmaturgus this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Most hostile and alien to the apostolic confession are those who speak of the Son as assumed to himself by the Father out of nothing and from an emanational origin. Uton uion ex uc onton que apostelomenes arges ine epicteton and those who hold the same sentiments with respect to the Holy Spirit, those who say that the Son is constituted divine by gift and grace, and that the Holy Spirit is made holy, those who regard the name of the Son as one common to servants, and assert that thus he is the firstborn of the creature, as becoming like the creature, existent out of non-existence, and as being first made, and who refuse to admit that he is the only begotten Son, the only one that the Father has, and that he has given himself to be reckoned in the number of mortals, and is thus reckoned firstborn. Those who circumscribe the generation of the Son by the Father with a measured interval after the fashion of man, and refuse to acknowledge that the eon of the begetter and that of the begotten are without beginning. Those who introduce three separate and diverse systems of divine worship, akunonetus ke zenas, whereas there is but one form of legitimate service which we have received of old from the law and the prophets and which has been confirmed by the Lord and preached by the apostles. Nor less alienated from the true confession are those who hold not the doctrine of the Trinity according to truth as a relation consisting of three persons but impiously conceive it as implying a triple being in a unity, monad, formed in the way of synthesis, en monadi to triplun acevos kata synthesin, and think that the Son is the wisdom in God, in the same manner as the human wisdom subsists in man, whereby the man is wise, and represent the word as being simply like the word which we utter or conceive, without any hypostasis whatever. But the Church's confession and the creed that brings salvation to the world is that which deals with the incarnation of the Word, and bears that he gave himself over to the flesh of man, which he acquired of Mary, 
while yet he conserved his own identity and sustained no divine transposition or mutation, but was brought into conjunction with the flesh after the similitude of man, so that the flesh was made one with the divinity, the divinity having assumed the capacity of receiving the flesh in the fulfilling of the mystery. And after the dissolution of death, there remained to the holy flesh a perpetual impassibility and a changeless immortality. Man's original glory, being taken up into it again by the power of the divinity, and being ministered then to all men by the appropriation of faith, en de des bisteos ukiosi. If then there are any here, too, who falsify the holy faith, either by attributing to the divinity as its own what belongs to the humanity, progressions, prokopas, and passions, and a glory coming with accession, doxan ten epigenomenen, or by separating from the divinity the progressive and passable body, as if it subsisted of itself apart, these persons also are outside the confession of the church and of salvation. No one, therefore, can know God unless he apprehends the Son, for the Son is the wisdom by whose instrumentality all things have been created. And these created objects declare this wisdom, and God is recognized in the wisdom. But the wisdom of God is not anything similar to the wisdom which man possesses, but it is the perfect wisdom which proceeds from the perfect God, and abides forever, not like the thought of man which passes from him in the word that is spoken and straightway ceases to be. Wherefore, it is not wisdom only, but also God, nor is it word only, but also Son. And whether, then, one discerns God through creation, or is taught to know him by the Holy Scriptures, it is impossible either to apprehend him, or to learn of him apart from his wisdom. And he who calls upon God rightly, calls on him through the Son, and he who approaches him in a true fellowship, comes to him through Christ. Moreover, the Son himself cannot be approached apart from the Spirit, for the Spirit is both the life and the holy formation of all things, morphosis don olon. And God sending forth this Spirit through the Son makes the creature, then ktisin, like himself. One, therefore, is God the Father, one the Word, one the Spirit, the life, the sanctification of all. And neither is there another God as Father, ute theos eteros os pater, nor is there another Son as Word of God, nor is there another Spirit as quickening and sanctifying. Further, although the saints are called both gods and sons and spirits, they are neither filled with the Spirit, nor are made like the Son and God. And if then anyone makes this affirmation that the Son is God, simply as being himself filled with divinity, and not as being generated of divinity, he has belied the word, he has belied the wisdom, he has lost the knowledge of God, he has fallen away into the worship of the creature, he has taken up the impiety of the Greeks, to that he has gone back, and he has become a follower of the unbelief of the Jews, who, supposing the word of God to be but a human son, have refused to accept him as God, and have declined to acknowledge him as the Son of God. But it is impious to think of the word of God as merely human, and to think of the works which are done by him as abiding, while he abides not himself. And if anyone says that the Christ works all things only as commanded by the word, he will make both the word of God idle, Argon, and will change the Lord's order into servitude. For the slave is one altogether under command, and the created is not competent to create, for to suppose that what is itself created may in like manner create other things would imply that it has ceased to be like the creature. Again, when one speaks of the Holy Spirit as an object made holy, puema, he will no longer be able to apprehend all things as being sanctified in the Spirit. For he who has sanctified one sanctifies all things. That man consequently belies the fountain of sanctification, the Holy Spirit, who denudes him of the power of sanctifying, and he will thus be precluded from numbering him with the Father and the Son. He makes naught, too, of the holy ordinance of baptism, and will no more be able to acknowledge the holy and august trinity. Trias. For either we must apprehend the perfect trinity in its natural and genuine glory, or we shall be under the necessity of speaking no more of a trinity, but only of a unity, monas, or else not numbering, sun arithmin, created objects with the creator, 
nor the creatures with the Lord of all. We must also not number what is sanctified with what sanctifies, even as no object that is made can be numbered with the Trinity, but in the name of the Holy Trinity, baptism and invocation and worship are administered. For if there are three several glories, there must also be three several forms of cultus with those who impiously worship the creature. For if there is a distinction in the nature of the objects worshipped, there ought to be also with these men a distinction in the nature of the worship offered. What is recent, the prosvata, surely is not to be worshipped along with what is eternal, for the recent comprehends all that has had a beginning, while mighty and measureless is he who is before the ages. He therefore who supposes some beginning of times in the life of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, therewith also cuts off any possibility of numbering the Son and the Spirit with the Father. For as we acknowledge the glory to be one, so ought we also to acknowledge the substance in the Godhead to be one, and one also the eternity of the Trinity. Moreover, the capital element of our salvation is the incarnation of the Word. We believe, therefore, that it was without any change in the divinity that the incarnation of the Word took place with a view to the renewal of humanity. For there took place neither mutation nor transposition nor any circumscription in will, periklismos en nefmati, as regards the holy energy, dynamin, of God. But while that remained in itself the same, it also affected the work of the incarnation with a view to the salvation of the world, and the word of God, living, polytef saminos, on earth after man's fashion, maintained likewise in all the divine presence, fulfilling all things and being united, such kek ramenos, properly and individually with flesh. And while the sensibilities proper to the flesh were there, the divine energy maintained the impassibility proper to itself. Impious, therefore, is the man who introduces the passibility, the pathos, into the energy. For the Lord of glory appeared in fashion as a man when he undertook the economy upon the earth, and he fulfilled the law for men by his deeds, and by his sufferings he did away with man's sufferings, and by his death he abolished death, and by his resurrection he brought life to light. And now we look for his appearing from heaven in glory, for the life and judgment of all, when the resurrection of the dead shall take place, to the end that recompense may be made to all according to their desert. But some treat the Holy Trinity, Therias, in an awful manner, when they confidently assert that there are not three persons, and introduce the idea of a person devoid of subsistence, an upostaton. Wherefore, we clear ourselves of Sibelius, who says that the Father and the Son are the same. For he holds that the Father is he who speaks, and that the Son is the word that abides in the Father, and becomes manifest at the time of the creation, the muriath, and thereafter reverts to God on the fulfilling of all things. The same affirmation he makes also of the Spirit. We forswear this because we believe that three persons, namely Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are declared to possess the one Godhead, for the one divinity showing itself forth according to nature in the Trinity, Physikos in Teriadi Marturumene, establishes the oneness of the nature, and thus there is a divinity that is the property of the Father, according to the word, there is one God the Father, and there is a divinity hereditary, Patroon in the Son, as it is written, the word was God, and there is a divinity present according to nature in the spirit, to wit what subsists as the spirit of God. According to Paul's statement, ye are the temple of God, and the spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now the person in each declares the independent being and subsistence, to ine afto ke ufestane delu, but divinity is the property of the Father, and whenever the divinity of these three is spoken of as one, testimony is borne that the property of the Father belongs also to the Son and the Spirit. Wherefore, if the divinity may be spoken of as one in three persons, the trinity is established, and the unity is not dissevered. And the oneness, which is naturally the Father's, is also acknowledged to be the Son's and the Spirit's. If one, however, speaks of one person as he may speak of one divinity, it cannot be that the two in the one are as one. Uk estin os en ta duo en to eni. 
For Paul addresses the Father as one in respect of divinity and speaks of the Son as one in respect of lordship. There is one God the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Wherefore, if there is one God and one Lord, and at the same time one person, as one divinity in one lordship, theotes mias curiotetos, how can credit be given to this distinction in the words of whom and by whom, as has been said before? We speak accordingly not as if we separated the lordship from the divinity, nor as estranging the one from the other, but as unifying them in the way warranted by actual fact and truth, and we call the Son God with the property of the Father, to idiomati to patros, as being his image and offspring, and we call the Father Lord, addressing him by the name of the one Lord as being his origin and begetter. The same position we hold respecting the Spirit, who has that unity with the Son, which the Son has with the Father. Wherefore, let the hypostasis of the Father be discriminated by the appellation of God, but let not the Son be cut off from this appellation, for he is of God. Again, let the person of the Son also be discriminated by the appellation of Lord. Only let not God be dissociated from that, for he is Lord as being the Father of the Lord. And as it is proper to the Son to exercise Lordship, for he it is that made all things by himself, and now rules the things that were made, while at the same time the Father has a prior possession of that property, inasmuch as he is the Father of him who is Lord. So we speak of the Trinity as one God, and yet not as if we made the one by a synthesis of three. For the subsistence that is constituted by synthesis is something altogether partitive and imperfect. Meros gar apan ateles to syntheosios, but just as the designation father is the expression of originality and generation, so the designation son is the expression of the image and offspring of the father. Hence, if one were to ask how there is but one God, if there is also a God of God, we would reply that there is a term proper to the idea of original causation, arches, so far as the father is the one first cause, arche. And if one were also to put the question how there is but one Lord, if the Father also is Lord, we might answer that again by saying that he is so, in so far as he is the Father of the Lord, and this difficulty shall meet us no longer. And again, if the impious say, how will there not be three gods and three persons, on the supposition that they have one and the same divinity, we shall reply, just because God is the cause and Father of the Son, and this Son is the image and offspring of the Father and not his brother, and the Spirit, in like manner, is the Spirit of God, as it is written, God is a Spirit. And in earlier times we have this declaration from the prophet David, By the word of the Lord were the heavens established, and all the power of them by the breath, Spirit of his mouth. And in the beginning of the book of the creation, Cosmopuias, it is written thus, And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And Paul, in his epistle to the Romans, says, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. And again he says, But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. And again, As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the Spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the Spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And again, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. And again, now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that ye may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Ghost. And again, writing to those same Romans, he says, But I have written them all boldly unto you in some sort, as putting you in mind, because of the grace that is given to me of God, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. I have, therefore, whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God, for I dare not speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me, to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed, through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Holy Spirit. And again, now I beseech you, brethren, for our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and by the love of the Spirit." And these things indeed are written in the epistle to the Romans. 
Again, in the epistle to the Corinthians, he says, For my speech and my preaching was not in the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And again, he says, As it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. And again he says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Seest thou that all through Scripture the Spirit is preached, and yet nowhere named a creature? And what can the impious have to say if the Lord sends forth his disciples to baptize in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit? Without contradiction, that implies a communion and unity between them, according to which there are neither three divinities nor three lordships, but while there remain truly and certainly the three persons, the real unity of the three must be acknowledged. And in this way proper credit will be given to the sending and the being sent in the Godhead, according to which the Father hath sent forth the Son, and the Son in like manner sends forth the Spirit. For one of the persons surely could not be said to send himself, and one could not speak of the Father as incarnate. For the articles of our faith will not concur with the vicious tenets of the heresies, and it is right that our conceptions should follow the inspired and apostolic doctrines, and not that our impotent fancies should coerce the articles of our divine faith. But if they say, how can there be three persons, and how but one divinity, we shall make this reply, that there are indeed three persons, inasmuch as there is one person of God the Father, and one of the Lord the Son, and one of the Holy Spirit, and yet that there is but one divinity, inasmuch as the Son is the image of God the Father, who is one, that is, he is God of God, and in like manner the Spirit is called the Spirit of God, and that too of nature according to the very substance, physikos kat aften ten usian, and not according to simple participation of God. And there is one substance, usia, in the Trinity, which does not subsist also in the case of objects that are made, For there is not one substance in God and in the things that are made, because none of these is in substance God. Nor indeed is the Lord one of these according to substance, but there is one Lord, the Son, and one Holy Spirit, and we speak also of one divinity, and one lordship, and one sanctity in the Trinity, because the Father is the cause, arche, of the Lord, having begotten him eternally, and the Lord is the prototype, prototypos, of the Spirit. For thus the Father is Lord, and the Son also is God, and of God it is said that God is a Spirit. We therefore acknowledge one true God, the one first cause, and one Son, very God of very God, possessing of nature the Father's divinity, that is to say, being the same in substance with the Father, and one Holy Spirit, who by nature and in truth sanctifies all, and makes divine as being of the substance of God. Those who speak either of the Son or of the Holy Spirit as a creature, we anathematize. All other things we hold to be objects made and in subjection, lula, created by God through the Son and sanctified in the Holy Spirit. Further, we acknowledge that the Son of God was made a Son of Man, having taken to himself the flesh from the Virgin Mary, not in name but in reality, and that he is both the perfect Son of God and the perfect Son of Man, that the person is but one, and that there is one worship, proskunesin, for the word and the flesh that he assumed. And we anathematize those who constitute different worships, one for the divine and another for the human, and who worship the man born of Mary as though he were another than the God of God. For we know that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And we worship him who was made man on account of our salvation, not indeed as made perfectly like in the like body. Ison in iso but as the Lord who has taken to himself the form of the servant. We acknowledge the passion of the Lord in the flesh, the resurrection in the power of his divinity, the ascension to heaven and his glorious appearing when he comes for the judgment of the living and the dead, and for the eternal life of the saints. And since some have given us trouble by attempting to subvert our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, and by affirming of him that he was not God incarnated, but a man linked with God, 
For this reason, we present our confession on the subject of the aforementioned matters of faith and reject the faithless dogmas opposed thereto. For God, having been incarnated in the flesh of man, retains also his proper energy, pure, possessing a mind unsubjected by the natural, physikon, and fleshly affections, and holding the flesh and the fleshly motions divinely and sinlessly, and not only unmastered by the power of death, but even destroying death. And it is the true God unincarnate that has appeared incarnate, the perfect one with the genuine and divine perfection, and in him there are not two persons. Nor do we affirm that there are four to worship, viz. God and the Son of God and man and the Holy Spirit. Wherefore we also anathematize those who show their impiety in this, and who thus give the man a place in the divine doxology. For we hold that the word of God was made man on account of our salvation, in order that we might receive the likeness of the heavenly and be made divine, Theopuethomen, after the likeness of him who is the true Son of God by nature and the Son of Man according to the flesh, our Lord Jesus Christ. We believe therefore in one God, that is, in one first cause, the God of the law and of the gospel, the just and good, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, true God, that is, image of the true God, maker of all things, seen and unseen, Son of God and only begotten offspring and eternal word, living and self-subsistent and active, and their hon, always being with the Father, and in one Holy Spirit, and in the glorious advent of the Son of God, who of the Virgin Mary took flesh and endured sufferings and death in our stead, and came to resurrection on the third day, and was taken up to heaven, and in his glorious appearing yet to come, and in one holy church, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the flesh, and life eternal. We acknowledge that the Son and the Spirit are consubstantial with the Father, and that the substance of the Trinity is one, that is, that there is one divinity according to nature, the Father remaining unbegotten, and the Son being begotten of the Father in a true generation, and not in a formation by will, puesi ec vulesios, and the Spirit being sent forth eternally from the substance of the Father through the Son, with power to sanctify the whole creation. And we further acknowledge that the Word was made flesh and was manifested in the flesh movement, kinesi, received of a virgin and did not simply energize in a man. And those who have fellowship with men that reject the consubstantiality as a doctrine foreign to the Scriptures and speak of any of the persons in the Trinity as created and separate that person from the one natural divinity, we hold as aliens and have fellowship with none such. There is one God the Father, and there is only one divinity. But the Son also is God, as being the true image of the one and only divinity, according to generation and the nature which he has from the Father. There is one Lord the Son, but in like manner there is the Spirit, who bears over the apempton, the Son's lordship, to the creature that is sanctified. The Son sojourned in the world, having of the Virgin received flesh, which he filled with the Holy Spirit for the sanctification of us all, Having given up the flesh to death, he destroyed death through the resurrection that had in view the resurrection of us all, and he ascended to heaven, exalting and glorifying men in himself, and he comes the second time to bring us again eternal life. One is the Son, both before the Incarnation and after the Incarnation. The same Son is both man and God, both these together as though one, and the God, the Word, is not one person, and the man Jesus another person, but the same who subsisted as Son, before was made one with flesh by Mary, so constituting himself a perfect and holy and sinless man, and using that economical position for the renewal of mankind and the salvation of all the world. God the Father, being himself the perfect person, has thus the perfect word begotten of him truly, not as a word that is spoken, nor yet again as a son by adoption, in the sense in which angels and men are called sons of God, but as a son who is in nature God. And there is also the perfect Holy Spirit supplied, Chorichumenon, of God through the Son to the sons of adoption, living and life-giving, holy and imparting holiness to those who partake of him, not like an unsubstantial breath, Pnoen, breathed into them by man, but as the living breath proceeding from God. Wherefore the Trinity is to be adored, to be glorified, to be honoured, and to be reverenced, the Father being apprehended in the Son, even as the Son is of Him, 
and the Son being glorified in the Father inasmuch as he is of the Father, and being manifested in the Holy Spirit to the sanctified. And that the Holy Trinity is to be worshipped without either separation or alienation is taught us by Paul, who says in his second epistle to the Corinthians, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. And again in that epistle he makes this explanation, Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. And still more clearly he writes thus in the same epistle, When Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And again Paul says, That mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. And again he says, Approving ourselves as ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, and so forth. Then he adds these words, By kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God. Behold here, again, the saint has defined the Holy Trinity, naming God and the Word and the Holy Ghost. And again he says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. And again, But ye are washed, but ye are justified in the name of our Lord Jesus, and by the Spirit of our God. And again, What? Know ye not that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God? And I think also that I have the Spirit of God. And again, speaking also of the children of Israel, as baptized in the cloud and in the sea, he says, And they all drank of the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And again he says, Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord, and there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. And again he says, For if he who comes preaches another Christ, whom we have not preached, or ye receive another Spirit, that ye have received not, or another Gospel, which ye have not obtained, ye will rightly be kept back. Kalos an ijeste. Seest thou that the Spirit is inseparable from the divinity? And no one with pious apprehensions could fancy that he is a creature. Moreover, in the epistle to the Hebrews he writes again thus, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost? And again he says in the same epistle, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart. For, Beothi, they have not known my ways, as I swore in my wrath, that they should not enter into my rest. And there too they ought to give ear to Paul, for he by no means separates the Holy Spirit from the divinity of the Father and the Son, but clearly sets forth the discourse of the Holy Ghost as one from the person of the Father, and thus as given expression to, ere menen by God, just as it has been represented in the before-mentioned sayings. Wherefore, the Holy Trinity is believed to be one God, 
in accordance with these testimonies of Holy Scripture, albeit all through the inspired Scriptures, numberless announcements are supplied us, all confirmatory of the apostolic and ecclesiastical faith. End of A Sectional Confession of Faith Attributed to Gregory Thaumaturgus A fragment of the same declaration of faith attributed to Gregory Thaumaturgus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. To maintain two natures, Fusis, in the one Christ makes a tetrad of the Trinity, says he, for he expressed himself thus, Quote, and it is the true God, the unincarnate, that was manifested in the flesh, perfect with the true and divine perfection, not with two natures, nor do we speak of worshipping four persons, viz. God and the Son of God, and man and the Holy Spirit. End quote. First, however, this passage is misapprehended and is of very doubtful import. Nevertheless, it bears that we should not speak of two persons in Christ, lest by thus acknowledging him as God and as in the perfect divinity, and yet speaking of two persons, we should make a tetrad of the divine persons, counting that of God the Father as one, and that of the Son of God as one, and that of the man as one, and that of the Holy Spirit as one. But again, it bears also against recognizing two divine natures, fusis, or rather for acknowledging him to be perfect to God in one natural divine perfection, and not in two, for his object is to show that he became incarnate without change, and that he retains the divinity without duplication. Adi plasiastos. Accordingly, he says shortly, quote, And while the affections of the flesh spring, the energy, lunamis, retains the impassibility proper to it. He, therefore, who introduces the idea of passion into the energy is impious, for it was the Lord of glory that appeared in human form, having taken to himself the human economy. End quote. End of a fragment of the same declaration of faith attributed to Gregory Thaumaturgus. Twelve Topics on the Faith by Gregory Thaumaturgus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Topic 1. If anyone says that the body of Christ is uncreated and refuses to acknowledge that he, being the uncreated word, God of God, took the flesh of created humanity and appeared incarnate, even as it is written, let him be anathema. Explication How could the body be said to be uncreated? For the uncreated is the passionless, invulnerable, intangible. But Christ, on rising from the dead, showed his disciples the print of the nails and the wound made by the spear, and a body that could be handled, although he also had entered among them when the doors were shut, with the view of showing them at once the energy of the divinity and the reality of the body. Yet, while being God, he was recognized as man in a natural manner, and while subsisting truly as man, he was also manifested as God by his works. Topic 2 if anyone affirms that the flesh of Christ is consubstantial with the divinity and refuses to acknowledge that he, subsisting himself in the form of God as God before all ages, emptied himself and took the form of a servant, even as it is written, let him be anathema. Explication How could the flesh, which is conditioned by time, be said to be consubstantial, homoousios, with the timeless divinity? For that is designated consubstantial, which is the same in nature and in eternal duration without variableness. Topic 3. If anyone affirms that Christ, just like one of the prophets, assumed the perfect man, and refuses to acknowledge that, being begotten in the flesh of the virgin, he became man and was born in Bethlehem, and was brought up in Nazareth, and advanced in age, and on completing the set number of years, appeared in public and was baptized in the Jordan, and received this testimony from the Father, This is my beloved Son, even as it is written, Let him be anathema. Explication How could it be said that Christ, the Lord, assumed the perfect man just like one of the prophets, when he, being the Lord himself, became man by the incarnation effected through the Virgin? Wherefore it is written that the first man was of the earth earthy, but whereas he that was formed of the earth returned to the earth, he that became the second man returned to heaven, and so we read of the first Adam and the last Adam.
and as it is admitted that the second came by the first according to the flesh, for which reason also Christ is called man and the son of man, so is the witness given that the second is the saviour of the first, for whose sake he came down from heaven. And as the word came down from heaven and was made man and ascended again to heaven, he is on that account said to be the second Adam from heaven. Topic 4. If anyone affirms that Christ was born of the seed of man by the virgin in the same manner as all men are born, and refuses to acknowledge that he was made flesh by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Virgin Mary, and became man of the seed of David, even as it is written, let him be anathema. Explication How could one say that Christ was born of the seed of man by the virgin when the Holy Gospel and the angel, in proclaiming the good tidings, testify of Mary the virgin, that she said, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Wherefore, he says, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of the Highest. And to Joseph, he says, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Topic 5. If any one affirms that the Son of God, who is before the ages, is one, and he who has appeared in these last times is another, and refuses to acknowledge that he who is before the ages is the same with him who appeared in these last times, even as it is written, let him be anathema. Explication How could it be said that the Son of God, who is before the ages, and he who has appeared in these last times, are different, when the Lord himself says, Before Abraham was, I am, and I came forth from God, and I come, and again I go to my Father. Topic 6. If anyone affirms that he who suffered is one, and that he who suffered not is another, and refuses to acknowledge that the Word, who is himself the impassible and unchangeable God, suffered in the flesh which he had assumed really, yet without mutation, even as it is written, let him be anathema. Explication. How could it be said that he who suffered is one, and he who suffered not another, when the Lord himself says, The Son of Man must suffer many things, and be killed, and be raised again the third day from the dead? And again, when ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the Father, and again, when the Son of Man cometh in the glory of his Father. Topic 7. If anyone affirms that Christ is saved, and refuses to acknowledge that he is the Saviour of the world, and the light of the world, even as it is written, let him be anathema. Explication. How could one say that Christ is saved when the Lord himself says, I am the life, and I am come that they might have life, and he that believeth on me shall not see death, but shall behold the life eternal? Topic 8. If anyone affirms that Christ is perfect man and also God the Word, in the way of separation, the eretos, and refuses to acknowledge the one Lord Jesus Christ, even as it is written, let him be anathema. Explication. How could one say that Christ is perfect man and also God the Word in the way of separation, when the Lord himself says, Why seek ye to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth which I have heard of God? For God the Word did not give a man for us, but he gave himself for us, having been made man for our sake. Wherefore he says, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. But he spake of the temple of his body. Topic 9. If anyone says that Christ suffers change or alteration and refuses to acknowledge that he is unchangeable in the spirit, though corruptible or and incorruptible in the flesh, let him be anathema. Explication. How could one say that Christ suffers change or alteration when the Lord himself says, I am and I change not? And again, his soul shall not be left in Hades, neither shall his flesh see corruption. Topic 10. If anyone affirms that Christ assumed the man only in part, and refuses to acknowledge that he was made in all things like us, apart from sin, let him be anathema. Explication. How could one say that Christ assumed the man only in part, when the Lord himself says, I lay down my life, that I might take it up again for the sheep, and my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed, and he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life? Topic 11. If anyone affirms that the body of Christ is void of soul and understanding, apsuchon ke anoeton, and refuses to acknowledge that he is perfect man and one and the same in all things with us, let him be anathema. 
How could one say that the body of the Lord, Christ, is void of soul and understanding? For perturbation and grief and distress are not the properties either of a flesh void of soul or of a soul void of understanding, nor are they the sign of the immutable divinity, nor the index of a mere phantasm, nor do they mark the defect of human weakness, but the word exhibited in himself the exercise of the affections and susceptibilities proper to us, having endued himself with our passibility, even as it is written that he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. For perturbation and grief and distress are disorders of soul, and toil and sleep and the body's liability to wounding are infirmities of the flesh. Topic 12. If anyone says that Christ was manifested in the world only in semblance and refuses to acknowledge that he came actually in the flesh, let him be anathema. Explication. How could one say that Christ was manifested only in semblance in the world, born as he was in Bethlehem and made to submit to the circumcising of the flesh, and lifted up by Simeon and brought up on to his twelfth year at home and made subject to his parents, and baptized in Jordan, and nailed to the cross, and raised again from the dead. Wherefore, when it is said that he was troubled in spirit, that he was sorrowful in soul, that he was wounded in the body, he places before us designations of susceptibilities proper to our constitution, in order to show that he was made man in the world, and had his conversation with men, yet without sin. For he was born in Bethlehem according to the flesh, in a manner meet for deity, the angels of heaven recognizing him as their Lord, and hymning as their God, him who was then wrapped in swaddling clothes in a manger, and exclaiming, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill among men. He was brought up in Nazareth, but in divine fashion he sat among the doctors, and astonished them by a wisdom beyond his years, in respect of the capacities of his bodily life, as is recorded in the gospel narrative. He was baptized in Jordan not as receiving any sanctification for himself, but as gifting a participation in sanctification to others. He was tempted in the wilderness, not as giving way, however, to temptation, but as putting our temptations before himself on the challenge of the tempter in order to show the powerlessness of the tempter. Wherefore he says, Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And this he said not as holding before us any contest proper only to a God, but as showing our own flesh in its capacity to overcome suffering and death and corruption, in order that, as sin entered into the world by flesh, and death came to reign by sin over all men, the sin in the flesh might also be condemned through the self-same flesh in the likeness thereof, and that the overseer of sin, the tempter, might be overcome, and death be cast down from its sovereignty, and the corruption in the burying of the body be done away, and the firstfruits of the resurrection be shown, and the principle of righteousness begin its course in the world through faith, and the kingdom of heaven be preached to men, and fellowship be established between God and men. In behalf of this grace, let us glorify the Father, who has given his only begotten Son for the life of the world. Let us glorify the Holy Spirit that worketh in us and quickeneth us and furnisheth the gifts meet for the fellowship of God, and let us not intermeddle with the word of the gospel by lifeless disputations, scattering about endless questionings and logomachies and making a hard thing of the gentle and simple word of faith, but rather let us work the work of faith, let us love peace, let us exhibit concord, let us preserve unity, let us cultivate love, with which God is well pleased." As it is not for us to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but only to believe that there will come an end to time, and that there will be a manifestation of a future world, and a revelation of judgment, and an advent of the Son of God, and a recompense of works, and an inheritance of the kingdom of heaven. So it is not for us to know how the Son of God became man, for this is a great mystery, as it is written, Who shall declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth? But it is for us to believe that the Son of God became man according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen on the earth and had his conversation with men according to the Scriptures in their likeness, yet without sin, and that he died for us and rose again from the dead as it is written, and that he was taken up to heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father, whence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead as it is written, lest while we war against each other with words any should be led to blaspheme the word of faith, and that should come to pass which is written, By reason of you is my name, or the name of God, continually blasphemed among the nations. End of Twelve Topics on the Faith by Gregory Thavmaturgis
Discourse on the Holy Theophany by Hippolytus of Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Good, yea, very good, are all the works of our God and Saviour, all of them that eye seeth and mind perceiveth, all that reason interprets and hand handles, all that intellect comprehends and human nature understands. For what richer beauty can there be than that of the circle, visku, of heaven? And what form of more blooming fairness than that of the earth's surface? And what is there swifter in the course than the chariot of the sun? And what more graceful car than the lunar orb, selenia ku stuchio? And what work more wonderful than the compact mosaic of the stars? And what more productive of supplies than the seasonable winds? And what more spotless mirror than the light of day? And what creature more excellent than man? Very good, then, are all the works of our God and Saviour. And what more requisite gift, again, is there than the element, Phuseos, of water? For with water all things are washed and nourished and cleansed and bedewed. Water bears the earth, water produces the dew, water exhilarates the vine, water matures the corn in the ear, water ripens the grape cluster, water softens the olive, water sweetens the palm date, water reddens the rose and decks the violet, water makes the lily bloom with its brilliant cups. And why should I speak at length? Without the element of water, none of the present order of things can subsist. So necessary is the element of water for the other elements, to hear took their places beneath the highest vault of the heavens, but the nature of water obtained a seat also above the heavens. And to this the prophet himself is a witness when he exclaims, Praise the Lord, ye heavens of heavens, and the water that is above the heavens. Nor is this the only thing that proves the dignity, axiopistian, of the water. But there is also that which is more honourable than all, the fact that Christ, the maker of all, came down as the rain, and was known as a spring, and diffused himself as a river, and was baptised in the Jordan. For you have just heard how Jesus came to John, and was baptised by him in the Jordan. O oh, things strange beyond compare, how should the boundless river that makes glad the city of God have been dipped in a little water? The illimitable spring that bears life to all men and has no end was covered by poor and temporary waters. He who is present everywhere and absent nowhere, who is incomprehensible to angels and invisible to men, comes to the baptism according to his own good pleasure. When you hear these things, beloved, take them not as if spoken literally, but accept them as presented in a figure, economically. Whence also the Lord was not unnoticed by the watery element, in what he did in secret, in the kindness of his condescension to man. For the waters saw him and were afraid. They well nigh broke from their place and burst away from their boundary. Hence the prophet, having this in his view many generations ago, puts the question, What aileth thee, O sea, that thou fleddest, and thou, Jordan, that thou wast driven back? And they in reply said, we have seen the creator of all things in the form of a servant, and being ignorant of the mystery of the economy, we were lashed with fear. But we who know the economy adore his mercy, because he hath come to save and not judge the world. Wherefore John, the forerunner of the Lord, who knew not this mystery before, on learning that he is Lord in truth, cried out and spake to those who came to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, why look ye so earnestly at me? I am not the Christ." I am the servant and not the Lord, I am the subject and not the king, I am the sheep and not the shepherd, I am a man and not God. By my birth I loosed the barrenness of my mother, I did not make virginity barren. I was brought up from beneath, I did not come down from above. I bound the tongue of my father, I did not unfold divine grace. I was known by my mother, and I was not announced by a star." I am worthless and the least, but after me there comes one who is before me, after me, indeed, in time, but before me by reason of the inaccessible and unutterable light of divinity. There comes one mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. I am subject to authority, but he has authority in himself. I am bound by sins, but he is the remover of sins. I apply... Barapto, the law, but he bringeth grace to light. 
I teach as a slave, but he judgeth as the master. I have the earth as my couch, but he possesses heaven. I baptize with the baptism of repentance, but he confers the gift of adoption. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Why give ye attention to me? I am not the Christ. As John says these things to the multitude, and as the people watch in eager expectation of seeing some strange spectacle with their bodily eyes, and the devil is struck with amazement at such a testimony from John, lo, the Lord appears, plain, solitary, uncovered, whom not, without escort, aprostateftos, having on him the body of man like a garment, and hiding the dignity of the divinity, that he may elude the snares of the dragon. And not only did he approach John as Lord without royal retinue, but even like a mere man, and one involved in sin, he bent his head to be baptized by John. Wherefore John, on seeing so great a humbling of himself, was struck with astonishment at the affair, and began to prevent him, saying, as ye have just heard, I have need to be baptized of thee, and thou comest to me. What dost thou, O Lord? Thou teachest things not according to rule. I have preached one thing regarding thee, and thou performest another. The devil has heard one thing, and perceives another. Baptize me with the fire of divinity. Why waitest thou for water? Enlighten me with the spirit. Why dost thou attend upon a creature? Baptize me, the Baptist, that thy preeminence may be known. I, O Lord, baptize with the baptism of repentance, and I cannot baptize those who come to me unless they first fully confess their sins. Be it so, then, that I baptize thee, what hast thou to confess? Thou art the remover of sins, and thou wilt be baptized with the baptism of repentance. Though I should venture to baptize thee, the Jordan dares not to come near thee. I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And what saith the Lord to him? Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Suffer it to be so now. John, thou art not wiser than I. Thou seest as man, I foreknow as God. It becomes me to do this first, and thus to teach. I engage in nothing unbecoming, for I am invested with honor. Dost thou marvel, O John, that I am not come in my dignity? The purple robe of kings suits not one in private station, but military splendor suits a king. Am I come to a prince, and not to a friend? Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. I am the fulfiller of the law, I seek to leave nothing wanting to its whole fulfillment, that so after me Paul may exclaim, Christ is the fulfilling of the law, for righteousness to every one that believeth. Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Baptize me, John, in order that no one may despise baptism. I am baptized by thee, the servant, that no one among kings or dignitaries may scorn to be baptized by the hand of a poor priest. Suffer me to go down into the Jordan, in order that they may hear my father's testimony, and recognize the power of the Son. Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then at length John suffers him, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and the heavens were opened unto him, and lo, the Spirit of God descended like a dove, and rested upon him, and a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Do you see, beloved, how many and how great blessings we would have lost if the Lord had yielded to the exhortation of John, and declined baptism? For the heavens were shut before this, the region above was inaccessible. We would, in that case, descend to the lower parts, but we would not ascend to the upper. But was it only that the Lord was baptized? He also renewed the old man and committed to him again the scepter of adoption, for straightway the heavens were opened to him. A reconciliation took place of the visible with the invisible. The celestial orders were filled with joy. The diseases of earth were healed. Secret things were made known. Those at enmity were restored to amity. For you have heard the word of the evangelist, saying, The heavens were opened to him on account of three wonders. For when Christ the bridegroom was baptized, it was meet that the bridal chamber of heaven should open its brilliant gates. And in like manner also, when the Holy Spirit descended in the form of a dove, and the Father's voice spread everywhere, it was meet that the gates of heaven should be lifted up. And lo, the heavens were opened to him, and a voice was heard, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The beloved generates love, and the light immaterial, the light inaccessible. 
This is my beloved Son, he who being manifested on earth and yet unseparated from the Father's bosom was manifested and yet did not appear. For the appearing is a different thing, since in appearance the baptizer here is superior to the baptized. For this reason did the Father send down the Holy Spirit from heaven upon him who was baptized. For as in the ark of Noah the love of God towards man is signified by the dove, so also now the Spirit, descending in the form of a dove, bearing as it were the fruit of the olive, rested on him to whom the witness was born. For what reason? That the faithfulness of the Father's voice might be made known, and that the prophetic utterance of a long time past might be ratified. And what utterance is this? The voice of the Lord is on the waters, the glory of God thundered, the Lord is upon many waters. And what voice? This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This is he who is named the Son of Joseph, and who is, according to the divine essence, my only begotten. This is my beloved Son, he who is hungry, and yet maintains myriads, who is weary, and yet gives rest to the weary, who has not where to lay his head, and yet bears up all things in his hand, who suffers, and yet heals sufferings, who is smitten, and yet confers liberty on the world, who is pierced in his side, and yet repairs the side of Adam. But give me now your best attention, I pray you, for I wish to go back to the fountain of life, and view the fountain that gushes with healing. The Father of immortality sent the immortal Son and Word into the world, who came to man in order to wash him with water and the Spirit, and he, begetting us again to incorruption of soul and body, breathed into us the breath, Spirit of life, and endued us with an incorruptible panoply. If, therefore, man has become immortal, he will also be God. And if he is made God by water and the Holy Spirit after the regeneration of the lava, Colum Vetharas, he is found to be also joint heir with Christ after the resurrection from the dead. Wherefore I preach to this effect, Come, all ye kindreds of the nations, to the immortality of the baptism. I bring good tidings of life to you who tarry in the darkness of ignorance. Come into liberty from slavery, into a kingdom from tyranny, into incorruption from corruption. And how, saith one, shall we come? How? By water and the Holy Ghost. This is the water in conjunction with the Spirit by which paradise is watered, by which the earth is enriched, by which plants grow, by which animals multiply, and to sum up the whole in a single word, by which man is begotten again and endued with life, in which also Christ was baptized, and in which the Spirit descended in the form of a dove. This is the Spirit that at the beginning moved upon the face of the waters, by whom the world moves, by whom creation consists, and all things have life, who also wrought mightily in the prophets and descended in flight upon Christ. This is the Spirit that was given to the apostles in the form of fiery tongues. This is the Spirit that David sought when he said, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Of this Spirit, Gabriel also spoke to the Virgin, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the Highest shall overshadow thee. By this Spirit Peter spake that blessed word, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. By this Spirit the rock of the church was established. This is the Spirit, the Comforter, that is sent because of thee, that he may show thee to be the Son, Teknon, of God. Come then, be begotten again, O man, into the adoption of God. And how, says one, if thou practisest adultery no more, and committest no murder, and servest not idols, if thou art not overmastered by pleasure, if thou dost not suffer the feeling of pride to rule thee, if thou cleansest off the filthiness of impurity, and puttest off the burden of sin, if thou castest off the armour of the devil, and puttest on the breastplate of faith, even as Isaiah saith, wash you, and seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, and plead for the widow, and come, and let us reason together, saith the Lord, Though your sins be as scarlet, I shall make them white as snow, and though they be like crimson, I shall make them white as wool, and if ye be willing, and hear my voice, ye shall eat the good of the land. Do ye see, beloved, how the prophet spake before time of the purifying power of baptism? For he who comes down in faith to the laver of regeneration, and renounces the devil, and joins himself to Christ, who denies the enemy and makes the confession that Christ is God, who puts off the bondage and puts on the adoption, he comes up from the baptism, brilliant as the sun, flashing forth the beams of righteousness, and, which is indeed the chief thing, he returns a son of God, and joint heir with Christ. 
To him be the glory and the power, together with his most holy and good and quickening spirit, now and ever, and to all the ages of the ages. Amen. End of the Discourse on the Holy Theophany by Hippolytus of Rome Canons of the Church of Alexandria Ascribed to Hippolytus of Rome This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Those are the canons of the church ordinances which Hippolytus wrote, by whom the church speaketh, and the number of them is thirty-eight canons. Greetings from the Lord. Canon first of the Catholic faith. Before all things, should we speak of the faith, holy and right, regarding our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, and we have consequently placed that canon in the faith, the symbol. And we agree in this with all reasonable certitude that the Trinity is equal, perfectly in honor, and equal in glory, and has neither beginning nor end. The Word is the Son of God, and is himself the creator of every creature, of things visible and invisible. This we lay down with one accord in opposition to those who have said boldly that it is not right to speak of the word of God as our Lord Jesus Christ spake. We come together chiefly to bring out the holy truth, ad proferendum sancte, regarding God, and we have separated them because they do not agree with the church in theology, nor with us, the sons of the scriptures. On this account we have sundered them from the church and have left what concerns them to God, who will judge his creatures with justice. To those, moreover, who are not cognizant of them, we make this known without ill will, in order that they may not rush into an evil death like heretics, but may gain eternal life and teach their sons and their posterity this one true faith. Canon second of bishops. A bishop should be elected by all the people, and he should be unimpeachable, as it is written of him in the Apostle. In the week in which he is ordained, the whole people should also say, We desire him, and there should be silence in the whole hall, and they should all pray in his behalf and say, O God, establish him whom thou hast prepared for us, etc. Canon third, Prayer in behalf of him who is made bishop, and the ordinance of the Mass, Ordinatio Missei. O God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all consolation, etc. Canon fourth of the ordination of a presbyter, canon fifth of the constituting a deacon, canon sixth of those who have suffered for the faith, canon seventh of him who is elected reader and subdeacon, canon eighth of the gift of healings, canon ninth that a presbyter should not dwell in unbefitting places and the honor of widows, canon tenth of those who wish to become Nazarenes, Christians, canon eleventh of him who makes idols and images or the artificer, Canon twelfth of the prohibition of those works, the authors of which are not to be received but on the exhibition of repentance. Canon thirteenth of a prince or a soldier, that they be not received indiscriminately. Canon fourteenth that a Nazarene may not become a soldier unless by order. Canon fifteenth enumeration of works which are unlawful. Canon sixteenth of him who has a lawful wife and takes another beside her. Canon seventeenth of a freeborn woman and her duties, of midwives and of the separation of men from women, of virgins that they should cover their faces and their heads. Canon 18th, of women in childbed and of midwives again. Canon 19th, of catechumens and the ordinance of baptism and the mass. Canon 20th, of the fast, the six days, and of that of Lent. Canon 21st, of the daily assembling of priests and people in the church. Canon 22nd, of the week of the Jews' Passover, wherein joy shall be put away, and of what is eaten therein, and of him who, being brought up abroad, is ignorant of the connection, textum, calendar. Canon 23rd, of doctrine, that it should be continuous, greater than the sea, and that its words ought to be fulfilled by deeds. Canon 24th, of the bishop's visitation of the sick, and that if an infirm man has prayed in the church and has a house, he should go to him. Canon 25th, of the procurator appointed for the sick, and of the bishop, and the times of prayer. Canon 26th, of the hearing of the word in church, and of praying in it. 
Canon 27th, of him who does not come to church daily, let him read books, and of prayer at midnight and cock-crowing, and of the washing of hands at the time of any prayer. Canon 28th, that none of the believers should taste anything, but after he has taken the sacred mysteries, especially in the days of fasting. Canon 29th, of the keeping of oblations which are laid upon the altar. That nothing fall into the sacred chalice, and that nothing fall from the priests, nor from the boys when they take communion that an evil spirit rule them not, and that no one speak in the protection, sanctuary, except in prayer, and when the oblations of the people cease, let psalms be read with all attention, even to the signal of the bell, and of the sign of the cross, and the casting of the dust of the altar into the pool. Canon 30th of Catechumens and the like. Canon 31st of the bishop and presbyter bidding the deacons present the communion. Canon 32nd of virgins and widows that they should pray and fast in the church. Let those who are given to the clerical order pray according to their judgment. Let not a bishop be bound to fasting, but with the clergy. And on account of a feast or supper, let him prepare for the poor, and of the preparing a table for the poor. Canon 33rd of the Atamsas, the Oblation, which they shall present for those who are dead, that it be not done on the Lord's Day. Canon 34th, that no one speak much, nor make a clamor, and of the entrance of the saints into the mansions of the faithful. Canon 35th, of a deacon present at a feast, at which there is a presbyter present, let him do his part in prayer and the breaking of bread for a blessing and not for the body, and of the discharge of widows. Canon 36, of the first fruits of the earth and the first dedication of them, and of presses, oil, honey, milk, wool, and the like, which may be offered to the bishop for his blessing. Canon 37th, as often as a bishop takes of these sacred mysteries, let the deacons and presbyters be gathered together, clothed in white robes, brilliant in the view of all the people, and, in like manner, with a reader. Canon 38th, of the night on which our Lord Jesus Christ rose, that no one shall sleep on that night and wash himself with water, and a declaration concerning such a one, and a declaration concerning him who sins after baptism, and of things lawful and unlawful. The sacred canons of the holy patriarch Hippolytus, the first patriarch of the great city of Rome, which he composed, are ended, and the number of them is thirty-eight canons. May the Lord help us to keep them. And to God be the glory for ever and ever, and on us be his mercy for ever. Amen. End of Canons of the Church of Alexandria, ascribed to Hippolytus of Rome. Topical Discourse on the Subject of the Soul by Gregory Thaumaturgus This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org A Topical Discourse by Our Holy Father Gregory, surnamed Thaumaturgus, Bishop of Neo-Caesarea in Pontus, addressed to Tatian on the subject of the soul. You have instructed us, most excellent Tatian, to forward for your use a discourse upon the soul, laying it out in effective demonstrations, and this you have asked us to do without making use of the testimonies of Scripture, a method which is open to us, and which, to those who seek the pious mind, proves a manner of setting forth doctrine more convincing than any reasoning of man. You have said, however, that you desire this, not with a view to your own full assurance— taught, as you already have been, to hold by the holy scriptures and traditions, and to avoid being shaken in your convictions by any subtlety of man's disputations, but with a view to the confuting of men who have different sentiments, and who do not admit that such credit is to be given to the scriptures, and who endeavour, by a kind of cleverness of speech, to gain over those who are unversed in such discussions. Wherefore we were led to comply readily with this commission of yours, not shrinking from the task on account of inexperience in this method of disputation, but taking encouragement from the knowledge of your good will towards us. For your kind and friendly disposition towards us will make you understand how to put forward publicly whatever you may approve of as rightly expressed by us, and to pass by and conceal whatever statement of ours you may judge to have come short of what is proper. Knowing this, therefore, I have betaken myself with all confidence to the exposition, and in my discourse I shall use a certain order and consecution, such as those who are very expert in these matters employ towards those who desire to investigate any subject intelligently. First of all, then, I shall propose to inquire by what criterion the soul can, according to its nature, be apprehended, then by what means it can be proved to exist, 
Thereafter, whether it is a substance or an accident, then consequently on these points, whether it is a body or is incorporeal, then whether it is simple or compound, next whether it is mortal or immortal, and finally whether it is rational or irrational. For these are the questions which are wont above all to be discussed in any inquiry about the soul, as most important and as best calculated to mark out its distinctive nature. And as demonstrations for the establishing of these matters of investigation, we shall employ those common modes of consideration, enues, by which the credibility of matters under hand is naturally attested. But for the purpose of brevity and utility, we shall at present make use only of those modes of argumentation which are most cogently demonstrative on the subject of our inquiry, in order that clear and intelligible ev paradecta notions may impart to us some readiness for meeting the gainsayers. With this, therefore, we shall commence our discussion. 1. Wherein is the criterion for the apprehension of the soul? All things that exist are either known by sense, esthesi, or apprehended by thought, noesi, and what falls under sense has its adequate demonstration in sense itself, for at once, with the application it creates in us the impression, fantasian, of what underlies it. But what is apprehended by thought is known not by itself, but by its operations, energion. The soul, consequently, being unknown by itself, shall be known properly by its effects. 2. Whether the soul exists. Our body, when it is put in action, is put in action either from without or from within. And that it is not put in action from without is manifest from the circumstance that it is put in action neither by impulsion, or thormenon, nor by traction, Ercomenon, like soulless things, and again, if it is put in action from within, it is not put in action according to nature, like fire, for fire never loses its action as long as there is fire, whereas the body, when it has become dead, is a body void of action. Hence, if it is put in action neither from without, like soulless things, nor according to nature after the fashion of fire, it is evident that it is put in action by the soul, which also furnishes life to it. If then the soul is shown to furnish the life to our body, the soul will also be known for itself by its operations. 3. Whether the soul is a substance. That the soul is a substance, or seer, is proved by the following manner. In the first place, because the definition given to the term substance suits it very well, and that definition is to the effect that substance is that which, being ever identical and ever one in point of numeration with itself, is yet capable of taking on contraries in succession, don enantion para menos ine dektikon, and that this soul, without passing the limit of its own proper nature, takes on contraries in succession, is, I fancy, clear to everybody. For righteousness and unrighteousness, courage and cowardice, temperance and intemperance are seen in it successively, and these are contraries. If then it is the property of a substance to be capable of taking on contraries in succession, and if the soul is shown to sustain the definition in these terms, it follows that the soul is a substance. And in the second place, because if the body is a substance, the soul must also be a substance, for it cannot be that what only has life imparted should be a substance, and that what imparts the life should be no substance, unless one should assert that the non-existent is the cause of the existent, or unless, again, one were insane enough to allege that the dependent object is itself the cause of that very thing in which it has its being, and without which it could not subsist. 4. Whether the soul is incorporeal. That the soul is in our body has been shown above. We ought now, therefore, to ascertain in what manner it is in the body. Now, if it is in juxtaposition with it, as one pebble with another, it follows that the soul will be a body, and also that the whole body will not be animated with soul, em psuchon, inasmuch as with a certain part it will only be in juxtaposition. But if, again, it is mingled or fused with the body, the soul will become multiplex, volumeres, and not simple, and will thus be despoiled of the rationale proper to a soul. For what is multiplex is also divisible and dissoluble, and what is dissoluble, on the other hand, is compound, sundeton, and what is compound is separable in a threefold manner. Moreover, body attached to body makes weight, ochkon, but the soul subsisting in the body does not make weight, but rather imparts life. The soul, therefore, cannot be a body, but is incorporeal. Again, if the soul is a body, it is put in action either from without or from within, but... 
It is not put in action from without, for it is moved neither by impulsion nor by traction, like soulless things. Nor is it put in action from within, like objects animated with soul, for it is absurd to talk of a soul of the soul. It cannot therefore be a body, but it is incorporeal. And besides, if the soul is a body, it has sensible qualities and is maintained by nurture. But it is not thus nurtured, for if it is nurtured, it is not nurtured corporeally, like the body, but incorporeally, for it is nurtured by reason. It has not therefore sensible qualities, for neither is righteousness, nor courage, nor any one of these things, something that is seen, yet these are the qualities of the soul. It cannot therefore be a body, but is incorporeal. Still further, as all corporeal substance is divided into animate and inanimate, let those who hold that the soul is a body tell us whether we are to call it animate or inanimate. Finally, if every body has color and quantity and figure, and if there is not one of these qualities perceptible in the soul, it follows that the soul is not a body. 5. Whether the soul is simple or compound. We prove then that the soul is simple best of all by those arguments by which its incorporeality has been demonstrated. For if it is not a body while every body is compound and what is composite is made up of parts and is consequently multiplex, the soul, on the other hand, being incorporeal, is simple, since thus it is both uncompounded and indivisible into parts. 6. Whether our soul is immortal. It follows, in my opinion, as a necessary consequence that what is simple is immortal. And as to how that follows, hear my explanation. Nothing that exists is its own corrupter, phthar tikon, else it could never have had any thorough consistency even from the beginning. For things that are subject to corruption are corrupted by contraries, wherefore everything that is corrupted is subject to dissolution, and what is subject to dissolution is compound, and what is compound is of many parts, and what is made up of parts manifestly is made up of diverse parts, and the diverse is not the identical. Consequently, the soul being simple and not being made up of diverse parts, but being uncompound and indissoluble, must be, in virtue of that, incorruptible and immortal. Besides, everything that is put in action by something else does not possess the principle of life in itself, but gets it from that which puts it in action, endures just so long as it is held by the power that operates in it, and whenever the operative power ceases, that also comes to a stand which has its capacity of action from it. But the soul, being self-acting, has no cessation of its being, but it follows that what is self-acting is ever-acting, and what is ever-acting is unceasing, and what is unceasing is without end, and what is without end is incorruptible, and what is incorruptible is immortal. Consequently, if the soul is self-acting, as has been shown above, it follows that it is incorruptible and immortal in accordance with the mode of reasoning already expressed. And further, everything that is not corrupted by the evil proper to itself is incorruptible, and the evil is opposed to the good and is consequently its corrupter. For the evil of the body is nothing else than suffering and disease and death, just as, on the other hand, its excellency is beauty, life, health and vigor. If then the soul is not corrupted by the evil proper to itself, and the evil of the soul is cowardice, intemperance, envy and the like, and all these things do not despoil it of its powers of life and action, it follows that it is immortal. 7. Whether our soul is rational. That our soul is rational one might demonstrate by many arguments, and first of all from the fact that it has discovered the arts that are for the service of our life. For no one could say that these arts were introduced casually and accidentally, as no one could prove them to be idle and of no utility for our life. If then these arts contribute to what is profitable for our life, and if the profitable is commendable, and if the commendable is constituted by reason, and if these things are the discovery of the soul, it follows that our soul is rational. Again, that our soul is rational is also proved by the fact that our senses are not sufficient for the apprehension of things. For we are not competent for the knowledge of things by the simple application of the faculty of sensation. But as we do not choose to rest in these without inquiry, that proves that the senses apart from reason are felt to be incapable of discriminating between things which are identical in form and similar in color, though quite distinct in their natures. If therefore the senses apart from reason give us a false conception of things, we have to consider whether things that are can be apprehended in reality or not, 
and if they can be apprehended, then the power which enables us to get at them is one different from and superior to the senses. And if they are not apprehended, it will not be possible for us at all to apprehend things which are different in their appearance from the reality. But that objects are apprehensible by us is clear from the fact that we employ each in a way adaptable to utility, and again turn them to what we please. Consequently, if it has been shown that things which are can be apprehended by us, and if the senses apart from reason are an erroneous test of objects, it follows that the intellect, nous, is what distinguishes all things in reason and discerns things as they are in their actuality. But the intellect is just the rational portion of the soul, and consequently the soul is rational. Finally, because we do nothing without having first marked it out for ourselves, and as there is nothing else than just the high prerogative, axioma, of the soul, for its knowledge of things does not come to it from without, but it rather sets out these things, as it were, with the adornment of its own thoughts, and thus first pictures forth the object in itself, and only thereafter carries it out to actual fact. And because the high prerogative of the soul is nothing else than the doing of all things with reason, in which respect it also differs from the senses, the soul has thereby been demonstrated to be rational. End of Topical Discourse on the Subject of the Soul by Gregory Thaumaturgus From the two books on the promises in opposition to Noetus, a bishop in Egypt, by Dionysius of Alexandria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Footnote Eusebius introduces this extract in the following terms, quote, There are also two books of his on the subject of the promises. The occasion of writing these was furnished him by a certain Nepos, a bishop in Egypt, who taught that the promises which were given to holy men in the sacred scriptures were to be understood according to the Jewish sense of the same, and affirmed that there would be some kind of millennial period plenished with corporeal delights upon this earth. And... As he thought that he could establish this opinion of his by the revelation of John, he had composed a book on this question entitled Refutation of the Allegorists. This, therefore, is sharply attacked by Dionysius in his books on the promises, and in the first of these books he states his own opinion on the subject, while in the second he gives us a discussion on the revelation of John, in the introduction to which he makes mention of Nepos in these words, quote, but as they produce, end quote, etc. End footnote but as they produce a certain composition by Nepos, in which they insist very strongly, as if it demonstrated incontestably that there will be a temporal reign of Christ upon the earth, I have to say that in many other respects I accept the opinion of Nepos and love him at once for his faith and his laboriousness and his patient study in the scriptures, as also for his great efforts in psalmody, by which even now many of the brethren are delighted, I hold the man, too, in deep respect still more, inasmuch as he has gone to his rest before us. Nevertheless, the truth is to be prized and reverenced above all things else, and, while it is indeed proper to praise and approve ungrudgingly anything that is said aright, it is no less proper to examine and correct anything which may appear to have been written unsoundly. If he had been present then himself and had been stating his opinions orally, it would have been sufficient to discuss the question together without the use of writing, and to endeavour to convince the opponents and carry them along by interrogation and reply. But the work is published and is, as it seems to some, of a very persuasive character, and there are unquestionably some teachers who hold that the law and the prophets are of no importance, and who decline to follow the Gospels, and who depreciate the epistles of the Apostles, and who have also made large promises regarding the doctrine of this composition, as though it were some great and hidden mystery, and who at the same time do not allow that our simpler brethren have any sublime and elevated conceptions, either of our Lord's appearing in his glory and his true divinity, or of our own resurrection from the dead, and of our being gathered together to him and assimilated to him, but, on the contrary, endeavour to lead them to hope for things which are trivial and corruptible, and only such as what we find at present in the kingdom of God. And since this is the case, it becomes necessary for us to discuss this subject with our brother Nepos, just as if he were present. After certain other matters, he adds the following statement. Being then in the Arsenoitic prefecture, where, as you are aware, this doctrine was current long ago, and caused such division that schisms and apostasies took place in whole churches, 
I called together the presbyters and the teachers among the brethren in the villages, and those of the brethren also who wished to attend were present. I exhorted them to make an investigation into that dogma in public. Accordingly, when they had brought this book before us, as though it were a kind of weapon or impregnable battlement, I sat with them for three days in succession, from morning till evening, and attempted to set them right on the subjects propounded in the composition. Then, too, I was greatly gratified by observing the constancy of the brethren and their love of the truth and their docility and intelligence as we proceeded in an orderly method and in a spirit of moderation to deal with questions and difficulties and concessions. For we took care not to press in every way and with jealous urgency opinions which had been once adopted even though they might appear to be correct. Neither did we evade objections alleged by others, but we endeavoured, as far as possible, to keep by the subject in hand and to establish the positions pertinent to it. Nor again were we ashamed to change our opinions if reason convinced us and to acknowledge the fact, but rather with a good conscience and in all sincerity and with open hearts before God, we accepted all that could be established by the demonstrations and teachings of the Holy Scriptures, and at last the author and introducer of this doctrine, whose name was Corassian, in the hearing of all the brethren present, made acknowledgment of his position and engaged to us that he would no longer hold by his opinion, nor discuss it, nor mention it, nor teach it, as he had been completely convinced by the arguments of those opposed to it. The rest of the brethren also who were present were delighted with the conference and with the conciliatory spirit and the harmony exhibited by all. Then, a little further on, he speaks of the revelation of John as follows. Now, some before our time have set aside this book and repudiated it entirely, criticizing it chapter by chapter and endeavoring to show it to be without either sense or reason. They have alleged also that its title is false, for they deny that John is the author. Nay, further, they hold that it can be no sort of revelation because it is covered with so gross and dense a veil of ignorance they affirm, therefore, that none of the apostles, nor indeed any of the saints, nor any person belonging to the church could be its author, but that Corinthus and the heretical sect founded by him and named after him the Corinthian sect, being desirous of attaching the authority of a great name to the fiction propounded by him, prefixed that title to the book. For the doctrine inculcated by Corinthus is this, that there will be an earthly reign of Christ, and as he was himself a man devoted to the pleasures of the body, and altogether carnal in his dispositions, he fancied that that kingdom would consist in those kinds of gratifications on which his own heart was set, to wit, in the delights of the belly and what comes beneath the belly, that is to say, in eating and drinking and marrying, and in other things under the guise of which he thought he could indulge his appetites with a better grace, such as festivals and sacrifices and the slaying of victims." But I, for my part, could not venture to set this book aside, for there are many brethren who value it highly. Yet having formed an idea of it as a composition exceeding my capacity of understanding, I regard it as containing a kind of hidden and wonderful intelligence on the several subjects which come under it. For though I cannot comprehend it, I still suspect that there is some deeper sense underlying the words. I do not measure and judge its expressions by the standard of my own reason, but making more allowance for faith, I have simply regarded them as too lofty for my comprehension, and I do not forthwith reject what I do not understand, but I am only the more filled with wonder at it, in that I have not been able to discern its import. After this he examines the whole book of the Revelation, and having proved that it cannot possibly be understood according to the bold literal sense, he proceeds thus. When the prophet now has completed, so to speak, the whole prophecy, he pronounces those blessed who should observe it, and names himself too in the number of the same. For blessed, says he, is he that keepeth the words of the prophecy of this book, and I, John, who saw and heard these things. That this person was called John, therefore, and that this was the writing of a John, I do not deny. And I admit further that it was also the work of some holy and inspired man, but I could not so easily admit that this was the Apostle, the son of Zebedee, the brother of James, and the same person with him who wrote the Gospel which bears the title according to John and the Catholic Epistle. But from the character of both and the forms of expression and the whole disposition and execution of the book, I draw the conclusion that the authorship is not his. For the evangelist nowhere else subjoins his name, and he never proclaims himself either in the Gospel or in the Epistle. And a little further on he adds... 
John, moreover, nowhere gives us the name, whether as of himself directly in the first person or as of another in the third person. But the writer of the Revelation puts himself forward at once in the very beginning, for he says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which he gave to him to show to his servants quickly, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of his testimony and of all the things that he saw. And then he writes also an epistle in which he says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace. The evangelist, on the other hand, has not prefixed his name even to the Catholic epistle, but without any circumlocution, he has commenced at once with the mystery of the divine revelation itself in these terms, that which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes. And on the ground of such a revelation as that, the Lord pronounced Peter blessed when he said, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And again in the second epistle, which is ascribed to John the Apostle, and in the third, though they are indeed brief, John is not set before us by name, but we find simply the anonymous writing, the elder. This other author, on the contrary, does not even deem it sufficient to name himself once, and then to proceed with his narrative, but he takes up his name again and says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And likewise, toward the end, he speaks thus, Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book, and I, John, who saw these things and heard them. That it is a John, then, that writes these things we must believe, for he himself tells us. What John this is, however, is uncertain, for he has not said, as he often does in the gospel, that he is the disciple beloved by the Lord, or the one that leaned on his bosom, or the brother of James, or one that was privileged to see and hear the Lord. And surely he would have given us some of these indications if it had been his purpose to make himself clearly known. But of all this he offers us nothing, and he only calls himself our brother and companion and the witness of Jesus, and one blessed with the seeing and hearing of these revelations. I am also of opinion that there were many persons of the same name with John the Apostle who by their love for him and their admiration and emulation of him and their desire to be loved by the Lord as he was loved were induced to embrace also the same designation just as we find many of the children of the faithful called by the names of Paul and Peter. There is besides another John mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles with the surname Mark whom Barnabas and Paul attached to themselves as companion, and of whom, again, it is said, and they had also John to their minister. But whether this is the one who wrote the revelation I could not say, for it is not written that he came with them into Asia. But the writer says, Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. I think, therefore, that it was some other one of those who were in Asia. For it is said that there were two monuments in Ephesus, and that each of these bears the name of John. And from the ideas and the expressions and the collocation of the same, it may be very reasonably conjectured that this one is distinct from that. For the gospel and the epistle agree with each other, and both commence in the same way. For the one opens thus, in the beginning was the word, while the other opens thus, that which was from the beginning. The one says, And the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. The other says the same things, with a slight alteration, that which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, of the word of life, and the life was manifested. For these things are introduced by way of prelude, and in opposition, as he has shown in the subsequent parts, to those who deny that the Lord is come in the flesh, for which reason he has also been careful to add these words, And that which we have seen we testify and show unto you, that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. Thus he keeps to himself and does not diverge inconsistently from his subjects, but goes through them all under the same heads and in the same phraseologies, some of which we shall briefly mention. Thus the attentive reader will find the phrases the life, the light, occurring often in both, and also such expressions as fleeing from darkness, holding the truth, grace, joy, the flesh and blood of the Lord, the judgment, the remission of sins, the love of God towards us, the commandment of love on our side towards each other, and also that we ought to keep all the commandments, 
the conviction of the world, of the devil, of Antichrist, the promise of the Holy Spirit, the adoption of God, the faith, required of us in all things, the Father and the Son named as such everywhere. And altogether, through their whole course, it will be evident that the Gospel and the Epistle are distinguished by one and the same character of writing. But the revelation is totally different and altogether distinct from this, and I might almost say that it does not even come near it or border upon it. Neither does it contain a syllable in common with these other books. Nay more, the epistle, for I say nothing of the gospel, does not make any mention or evince any notion of the revelation, and the revelation in like manner gives no note of the epistle. Whereas Paul gives some indication of his revelations in his epistles, which revelations, however, he has not recorded in writing by themselves. And furthermore, on the ground of difference in diction, it is possible to prove a distinction between the gospel and the epistle on the one hand, and the revelation on the other. For the former are written not only without actual error as regards the Greek language, but also with the greatest elegance, both in their expressions and in their reasonings, and in the whole structure of their style. They are very far, indeed, from betraying any barbarism or solecism, or any sort of vulgarism in their diction. For, as might be presumed, the writer possessed the gift of both kinds of discourse, the Lord having bestowed both these capacities upon him, viz. that of knowledge and that of expression. That the author of the latter, however, saw a revelation and received knowledge and prophecy, I do not deny. Only I perceive that his dialect and language are not of the exact Greek type, and that he employs barbarous idioms and in some places also solecisms. These, however... We are under no necessity of seeking out at present. And I would not have any one suppose that I have said these things in the spirit of ridicule, for I have only done so with the purpose of setting right this matter of the dissimilarity subsisting between these writings. End of From the Two Books on the Promises in Opposition to Noetus, a Bishop in Egypt, by Dionysius of Alexandria. Encyclical of Alexander Excommunicating Arius by Alexander of Alexandria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Encyclical Letter of Alexander, Archbishop of Alexandria, upon his deposition and excommunication of Arius. Whereas the Catholic Church is one body, and we are bidden in Holy Scripture to preserve the bond of concord and peace, it is fitting that we should write and signify to each other what is happening in our own parts, so that, whether one member suffers or rejoice, we all may suffer or rejoice with it. Now in this our diocese, at this time, there have gone forth rebellious men and enemies of Christ, teaching an apostasy which may reasonably be accounted and called a forerunner of Antichrist. On a matter such as this I could wish to be silent in the hope that the evil might spend itself in the persons of the apostates without spreading to other places and contaminating the ears of the simple. But inasmuch as Eusebius, at this time of Nicomedia, having escaped all punishment for his covetous seizure of that sea, to the abandonment of Beratus, has now proceeded, as if with him lay all matters of the church, to place himself at the head of these apostates, and has taken upon himself to write letters all round in their favour, with the hope by some means of drawing men aside unawares to this last and most unchristian heresy. I have felt it a duty, knowing what is written in the law, no longer to hold my peace but to give you full information, in order that you may all know who they are that have apostatized and what their miserable tenants, and may pay no attention to Eusebius, should he write to you. For with the purpose of reviving by means of these men that old bad spirit which of late had not shown itself, he pretends to defend them but really for the furtherance of his own interests. Those who have apostatized are Arius, Archelaus, Aethales, and Carponis, another Arius, Samartes, sometime Presbyters, Eusoius, Lucius, Julian, Minus, Heladius, and Gaius, sometime Deacons, and with them, Secundus and Theonus, sometime of the rank of bishops. And their unscriptural novelties are these, quote, God was not always a father, but once was not a father. The word of God was not always existing, but came into being out of nothing. For God, who is, did make out of nothing him who was not. 
Therefore, once he was not, for the Son is a creature and work, he is neither in like substance to the Father, nor the Father's true and natural word, nor is he his true wisdom, but he is one of those things which were made and brought to be, and only by an abuse of words, word and wisdom. Having come into existence himself by God's own word and God's intrinsic wisdom, by which God made all things and him in their number. Accordingly, he, the word of God, is by nature mutable and variable, as are all rational beings and foreign and alien and separated off from the substance of God. And to the Son the Father is an ineffable God, for not properly and accurately does the Son know the Father, nor can he perfectly see him. For neither does the Son know his own substance as it really is, for... He was made for our sake in order that by him, as by an instrument, God might create us, and he would not have subsisted unless God had wished to create us. End quote. Accordingly, when they were asked whether the word of God could change as the devil had changed, they were not afraid to answer, quote, Yes, he can, for having come into being by creation, he is of a mutable nature. End quote. These were the avowals of Arius and his followers, and when they boldly persisted in them, we, together with the bishops of Egypt and Libya, nearly a hundred in number, in council assembled and anathematized them and their adherents. On this, Eusebius and his party received them, having it at heart to confuse together falsehood with truth and impiety with piety, but in vain, for truth ever conquers, nor is there any communion of light with darkness, any agreement of Christ with Belial. Whoever yet heard such language... And who that hears it now, but is shocked and stops his ears, that its foulness should not enter into them? Who that hears John saying, In the beginning was the word, does not denounce the tenant, once he was not? Who that hears in the gospel, the only begotten Son, and by him all things were made, will not hate men who pronounce that, quote, the Son is one of God's works, end quote? How can he be on a level with his own creations? How can he be only begotten who as they say, is to be numbered with all other creatures. How can he be out of nothing when the Father says, My heart has burst out a good word, and out of the womb before the morning star have I borne thee? Or how, quote, unlike the Father in substance, end quote, if he be the perfect image and radiance of the Father, saying of himself, Whoso hath seen me hath seen the Father? And how, if the Son be God's word and wisdom, was he once not in being? For this is as much as to say that once God was without mind, without wisdom. How too is he mutable or variable, who says by his own mouth, I am in the Father and the Father in me, and I and the Father are one, and by the mouth of his prophet, behold me, for I am and very not. For though these words belong also to the Father, yet here they may be more appositely said of the Son, that in his becoming man he was not changed, but as the Apostle says, is Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what has persuaded them to say that, quote, for our sakes he was made, end quote, though Paul writes, for whom are all things and by whom are all things. After so extreme a step, we need not wonder to hear their blasphemy that the Son has not perfect knowledge of the Father. For, having once made up their minds to war against Christ, they even put aside his own words. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. If then the Father knows the Son imperfectly, then indeed it is plain that the Son too has but an imperfect knowledge of the Father. But if to say this is a sin, and the Father knows the Son perfectly, then too as the Father knows his own word, so it is plain does the Son know his own Father, whose word he is. By such arguments and explanations of divine scripture we have oftentimes refuted them, but still, like chameleons, they changed their colors, as if ambitious of fixing upon themselves the scriptures, the wicked man, when he has come into the depth of sins, contemneth. Certainly many heresies have existed before them, which, venturing where they ought not, have become foolishness, but these men, scheming in all they have laid down to destroy the word's divinity, have made those others white by the contrast of themselves, being so much more like Antichrist. Therefore it is that they have been proscribed and anathematized by the church, Grieve, however, as we do, over their ruin, and especially because, after their early grounding in the doctrines of the church, they have now fallen away. Nevertheless, we are not much surprised, for a fate like this befell Hymenaeus and Philetus, and before them Judas, who, once a follower of the Saviour, was afterwards a traitor and apostate. 
nor have we been without lessons concerning these very persons, for the Lord foretold, Take heed, lest any man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time draweth near, and they shall deceive many. Go ye not after them. And Paul, who was taught these things by the Saviour, has written that, in the last times, some shall apostatize from the sound faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and teachings of demons who turn away from the truth. Seeing then that our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ doth both by his own mouth charge us, and by the Apostle warn us concerning such men, it was fitting that we, the personal witnesses of their impiety, should anathematize them as aforesaid, declaring them aliens from the Catholic Church and faith, and we have further also made this known to your piety, our most beloved and honoured colleagues, in order that you may be on your guard against receiving any of them who may have the insolence to come to you, or giving ear to Eusebius or any other writing in their behalf. For it becomes us as Christians to turn away from all who by word and intention blaspheme Christ as being God's foes and destroyers of souls, nor even to say, God speed you to such men, lest, as blessed John has charged us, we become partakers of their sins. Salute the brethren who are with you. Those with me give you greeting. End of Encyclical of Alexander Excommunicating Arius by Alexander of Alexandria Against Baron and Helix by Hippolytus of Rome this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fragments of a discourse alphabetically divided on the divine nature and the incarnation against the heretics Beron and Helix, the beginning of which was in these words, Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabaoth, with voice never silent, the seraphim exclaim and glorify God. Fragment 1 by the omnipotent will of God, all things are made, and the things that are made are also preserved, being maintained according to their several principles in perfect harmony by him who is in his nature the omnipotent God and maker of all things, his divine will remaining unalterable, by which he has made and moves all things, sustained as they severally are by their own natural laws. For the infinite cannot in any manner or by any account be susceptible of movement, inasmuch as it has nothing towards which and nothing around which it shall be moved. For, in the case of that which is in its nature infinite, and so incapable of being moved, movement would be conversion. Wherefore also the word of God, being made truly man in our manner, yet without sin, and acting and enduring in man's ways such sinless things as are proper to our nature, and assuming the circumscription of the flesh of our nature on our behalf, sustained no conversion in that aspect in which he is one with the Father, being made in no respect one with the flesh, through the exinonition. But as he was without flesh, he remained without any circumscription, and through the flesh he wrought divinely, thikos, those things which are proper to divinity, showing himself to have both these natures, in both of which he wrought, I mean the divine and the human, according to that veritable and real and natural subsistence, showing himself thus as both being in reality and as being understood to be at one and the same time infinite God and finite man, having the nature, usian, of each in perfection, with the same activity, energias, that is to say the same natural properties, physikes ideotetos. Whence we know that their distinction abides always according to the nature of each and without conversion. But it is not i.e. the distinction between deity and humanity, as some say, a merely comparative or relative matter, kata sukrisin, that we may not speak in an unwarrantable manner of a greater and a lesser in one who is ever the same in himself. For comparisons can be instituted only between objects of like nature and not between objects of unlike nature, but between God, the maker of all things, and that which is made, between the infinite and the finite, between infinitude and finitude, there can be no kind of comparison, since these differ from each other not in mere comparison or relatively, but absolutely in essence. And yet at the same time there has been effected a certain inexpressible and irrefragable union of the two into one subsistence, upostasin, which entirely passes the understanding of anything that is made. For the divine is just the same after the incarnation, 
that it was before the Incarnation, in its essence infinite, illimitable, impassable, incomparable, unchangeable, inconvertible, self-potent, of Dostenes, and in short, subsisting in essence alone the infinitely worthy good. Fragment 2 The God of all things, therefore, became truly, according to the Scriptures, without conversion, sinless man, and that in a manner known to himself alone, as he is the natural artificer of things which are above our comprehension, and by that same saving act of the Incarnation, Soterion Sarkosin, he introduced into the flesh the activity of his proper divinity, yet without having it, that activity, either circumscribed by the flesh, through the exinanition, or growing naturally out of the flesh as it grew out of his divinity, but manifested through it in the things which he wrought in a divine manner in his incarnate state. For the flesh did not become divinity in nature by a transmutation of nature, as though it became essentially flesh of divinity, but what it was before that also it continued to be in nature and activity when united with divinity, even as the Saviour said, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And working and enduring in the flesh things which were proper to sinless flesh, he proved the evacuation of divinity to be for our sakes, confirmed as it was by wonders and by sufferings of the flesh naturally. For with this purpose did the God of all things become man, viz. in order that by suffering in the flesh, which is susceptible of suffering, he might redeem our whole race, which was sold to death, and that by working wondrous things by his divinity, which is unsusceptible of suffering, through the medium of the flesh he might restore it to that incorruptible and blessed life from which it fell away by yielding to the devil, and that he might establish the holy orders of intelligent existences in the heavens in immutability by the mystery of his incarnation. Somatoseos the doing of which is the recapitulation of all things in himself. He remained therefore also after his incarnation, according to nature, God infinite, and more, uperapiros, having the activity proper and suitable to himself, an activity growing out of his divinity essentially and manifested through his perfectly holy flesh by wondrous acts economically to the intent that he might be believed in as God while working out of himself, afturkon, by the flesh, which by nature is weak, the salvation of the universe. Fragment 3 Now, with the view of explaining by means of an illustration what has been said concerning the Saviour, I may say that the power of thought, logos, which I have by nature is proper and suitable to me, as being possessed of a rational and intelligent soul, and to this soul there pertains, according to nature, a self-moved energy and first power, ever moving to it, the thought that streams from it naturally. This thought I utter when there is occasion by fitting it to words and expressing it rightly in signs, using the tongue as an organ or artificial characters, showing that it is heard, though it comes into actuality by means of objects foreign to itself, and yet is not changed itself by those foreign objects. For my natural thought does not belong to the tongue or the letters, although I affect its utterance by means of these but it belongs to me who speak according to my nature, and by means of both these express it as my own, streaming as it always does from my intelligent soul according to its nature. And uttered by means of my bodily tongue organically, as I have said, when there is occasion. Now to institute a comparison with that which is utterly beyond comparison, just as in us the power of thought that belongs by nature to the soul is brought to utterance by means of our bodily tongue without any change in itself, so too, in the wondrous incarnation, somatoseos, of God, is the omnipotent and all-creating energy of the entire deity, des oles theotetos, manifested without mutation in itself by means of his perfectly holy flesh, and in the works which he wrought after a divine manner, that energy of the deity remaining in its essence free from all circumscription, although it shone through the flesh, which is itself essentially limited, for that which is in its nature unoriginated cannot be circumscribed by an originated nature, although this latter may have grown into one with it, sunerfu, by a conception which circumscribes all understanding. Nor can this ever be brought into the same nature and natural activity with that, so long as they remain each within its own proper and inconvertible nature. 
for it is only in objects of the same nature that there is the motion that works the same works, showing that the being, Wusian, whose power is natural, is incapable in any manner of being or becoming the possession of a being of a different nature without mutation. Fragment 4 For in the view of apostles and prophets and teachers, the mystery of the divine incarnation has been distinguished as having two points of contemplation natural to it, distinct in all things inasmuch as, on the one hand, it is the subsistence of perfect deity, and on the other, is demonstrative of full humanity. As long, therefore, as the word is acknowledged to be in substance one, of one energy, there shall never in any way be known a movement, change, kinesis, in the two. For while God, who is essentially ever-existent, became by his infinite power, according to his will, sinless man, he is what he was, in all wherein God is known, and what he became, he is in all wherein man is known, and can be recognized. In both aspects of himself he never falls out of himself, meni anekdotos, in his divine activities and in his human alike, preserving in both relations his own essentially unchangeable perfection. Fragment 5 For lately a certain person, Baron, along with some others, forsook the delusion of Valentinus only to involve themselves in deeper error, affirming that the flesh assumed to himself by the word became capable of working like works with the deity, by virtue of its assumption, and that the deity became susceptible of suffering in the same way with the flesh, by virtue of the exinanition, genosin and thus they assert the doctrine that there was, at the same time, a conversion and a mixing and a fusing of the two aspects, one with the other. For if the flesh that was assumed became capable of working like works with the deity, it is evident that it also became God in essence in all wherein God is essentially known. And if the deity, by the exonination, became susceptible of the same sufferings with the flesh, it is evident that, it also became in essence flesh, in all wherein flesh essentially can be known. For objects that act in like manner, homo erge, and work like works are altogether of like kind, and are susceptible of like suffering with each other, admit of no difference in nature, and if the natures are fused together, such kechumenon, Christ will be a duality, zuas, and if the persons, prosopon, are separated, there will be a quaternity, the tras, a thing which is altogether to be avoided. And how will they conceive of the one and the same Christ, who is at once God and man by nature? And what manner of existence will he have according to them, if he has become man by a conversion of the deity, and if he has become God by a change of the flesh? For the mutation, metaptosis, of these, the one into the other is a complete subversion of both. Let the discussion then be considered by us again in a different way. Fragment 6 Among Christians it is settled as the doctrine of piety that according to nature itself and to the activity and to whatever else pertains thereunto, God is equal and the same with himself, ison efto ke tafton, having nothing that is his unequal to himself at all, and heterogeneous a katalelon. If then, according to Baron, the flesh that he assumed to himself became possessed of the like natural energy with them, it is evident that it also became possessed of the like nature with him in all wherein that nature consists, to it non-origination, non-generation, infinitude, eternity, incomprehensibility, and whatever else in the way of the transcendent the theological mind discerns in deity, and thus they both underwent conversion, neither the one nor the other preserving any more the substantial relation of its own proper nature. Des idias fusios usidothe lohon. For he who recognizes an identical operation, tafturhian, in things of unlike nature, introduces at the same time a fusion of natures and a separation of persons. They are iresin prosopiken, their natural existence, uparxeos, being made entirely undistinguishable by the transference of properties, idiomaton. Fragment 7. But if it, the flesh, did not become of like nature with that, the deity, 
neither shall it ever become of like natural energy with that, that he may not be shown to have energy unequal with his nature, and heterogeneous, and through all that pertains to himself to have entered on an existence outside of his natural equality and identity. Physikes exohiagonos isotetos ke daftotetos, which is an impious supposition. Fragment 8. Into this error, then, have they been carried by believing, unhappily, that that divine energy was made the property of the flesh, which was only manifested through the flesh in his miraculous actions, by which energy Christ, in so far as he is apprehended as God, gave existence to the universe and now maintains and governs it. For they did not perceive that it is impossible for the energy of the divine nature to become the property, idioma, of a being of a different nature, eterophanus usias, apart from conversion, nor did they understand that that is not by any means the property of the flesh, which is only manifested through it, and does not spring out of it according to nature, and yet the proof thereof was clear and evident to them. For I, by speaking with the tongue and writing with the hand, reveal through both these one and the same thought of my intelligent soul, its energy or operation being natural, in no way showing it as springing naturally out of the tongue or hand, nor yet showing even the spoken thought as made to belong to them in virtue of its revelation by their means. For no intelligent person ever recognized tongue or hand as capable of thought, just as also no one ever recognized the perfectly holy flesh of God in virtue of its assumption and in virtue of the revelation of the divine energy through its medium, as becoming in nature creative. But the pious confession of that believer is, with a view to our salvation, and in order to connect the universe with unchangeableness, the creator of all things incorporated with himself, enusiosus, a rational soul and a sensible, or sensitive, aestheticu, body, from the all-holy Mary, ever-virgin, by an undefiled conception, without conversion, and was made man in nature, but separate from wickedness. The same was perfect God, and the same was perfect man, the same was in nature at once perfect God and man. In his deity he wrought divine things through his all-holy flesh, such things, namely, as did not pertain to the flesh by nature, and in his humanity he suffered human things, such things, namely, as did not pertain to deity by nature, by the upbearing of the deity. Anoche paschon theotetos. He wrought nothing divine without the body, whom non somatos nor did the same do anything human without the participation of deity. Amuron drasas theotetos. Thus he preserved for himself a new and fitting method, genoprepe tropon, by which he wrought according to the manner of both, while that which was natural to both remained unchanged, tocat amphor physikos analuoton, to the accrediting, is pistosin, of his perfect incarnation, an anthropesias, which is really genuine and has nothing lacking in it, meden ejuses falotetos. Baron, therefore, since the case stands with him, as I have already stated, confounding together in nature the deity and humanity of Christ in a single energy, energias monadi, and again separating them in person, subverts the life, not knowing that identical operation, tavturhian, is indicative of the connatural identity only of connatural persons, mones, des, ton, omphuon, prosopon, omphuus, daftotetos. End of Against Beron and Helix by Hippolytus of Rome. A Commentary on the Beginning of Ecclesiastes by Dionysius of Alexandria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 1 Verse 1 The words of the Son of David, King of Israel in Jerusalem. In like manner also Matthew calls the Lord the Son of David. Verse 3 What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? For what man is there who although he may have become rich by toiling after the objects of this earth, has been able to make himself three cubits in stature, if he is naturally only of two cubits in stature, or who, if blind, has by these means recovered his sight. 
Therefore we ought to direct our toils to a goal beyond the sun, for thither too do the exertions of the virtues reach. Verse 4. One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth for ever, unto the age. Yes, unto the age, is don eona, but not unto the ages, is dus eonas. Verse 16. I communed with mine own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate, and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. Verse 17. I knew parables and science, that this indeed is also the Spirit's choice. Pro eresis. Verse 18. For in multitude of wisdom is multitude of knowledge, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth grief. I was vainly puffed up, and increased wisdom, not the wisdom which God has given, but that wisdom of which Paul says, the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For in this Solomon had also an experience surpassing prudence, and above the measure of all the ancients. Consequently, he shows the vanity of it, as what follows in like manner demonstrates. And my heart uttered many things, I knew wisdom and knowledge and parables and sciences. But this was not the genuine wisdom or knowledge, but that which, as Paul says, puffeth up. He spake, moreover, as it is written, three thousand parables, but these were not parables of a spiritual kind, but only such as fit the common polity of men, as, for instance, utterances about animals or medicines. For which reason, he has added in a tone of raillery, I knew that this also is the Spirit's choice. He speaks also of the multitude of knowledge, not the knowledge of the Holy Spirit, but that which the prince of this world works, and which he conveys to men in order to overreach their souls with officious questions as to the measures of heaven, the position of earth, the bounds of the sea. But he says also, he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. For they search even into things deeper than these, inquiring, for example, what necessity there is for fire to go upward and for water to go downward, and when they have learnt that it is because the one is light and the other heavy, they do but increase sorrow, for the question still remains, why might it not be the very reverse? Chapter 2, verse 1. I said in mine heart, Go to now, make trial, as in mirth, and behold in good. And this too is vanity. For it was for the sake of trial, and in accordance with what comes by the loftier and the severe life, that he entered into pleasure. And he makes mention of the mirth, which men call so, And he says, in good, referring to what men call good things, which are not capable of giving life to their possessor, and which make the man who engages in them vain like themselves. Verse 2, I said of laughter, it is mad, bari foran, and of mirth, what dost thou? Laughter has a twofold madness, because madness begets laughter, and does not allow the sorrowing for sins, and also because a man of that sort is possessed with madness, bari ferete in the confusing of seasons and places and persons, for he flees from those who sorrow. And to mirth, what dost thou? Why dost thou repair to those who are not at liberty to be merry? Why to the drunken and the avaricious and the rapacious? And why this phrase, as wine, os unon? Because wine makes the heart merry and it acts upon the poor in spirit. The flesh, however, also makes the heart merry when it acts in a regular and moderate fashion. Verse 3. And my heart directed me in wisdom and to overcome in mirth until I should know what is that good thing to the sons of men which they shall do under the sun for the number of the days of their life. Being directed, he says, by wisdom I overcame pleasures in mirth. Moreover, for me, the aim of knowledge was to occupy myself with nothing vain but to find the good, for if a person finds that, he does not miss the discernment also of the profitable. The sufficient is also the opportune, or temporary, and is commensurate with the length of life. Verse 4. I made me great works, I builded me houses, I planted me vineyards. Verse 5. I made me gardens and orchards. Verse 6. I made me pools of water that by these I might rear woods producing trees. Verse 7, I got me servants and maidens, and had servants born in my house. Also I had large possessions of great and small cattle, above all that were in Jerusalem before me. Verse 8, 
I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I get me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as cups and the cupbearer. Verse 9, And I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. Verse 10, That whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any pleasure. You see how he reckons up a multitude of houses and fields and other things which he mentions, and then finds nothing profitable in them. For neither was he any better in soul by reason of these things, nor by their means did he gain friendship with God. Necessarily he is led to speak also of the true riches and the abiding property. Being minded, therefore, to show what kinds of possessions remain with the possessor, and continue steadily, and maintain themselves for him, he adds, also my wisdom remained with me. For this alone remains, and all these other things, which he has already reckoned up, flee away and depart. Wisdom, therefore, remained with me, and I remained in virtue of it. For those other things fall, and also cause the fall of the very persons who run after them. But with the intention of instituting a comparison between wisdom and those things which are held to be good among men, he adds these words, And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them and so forth, whereby he describes an evil, not only those toils which they endure who toil in gratifying themselves with pleasures, but those too which by necessity and constraint men have to sustain for their maintenance day by day, laboring at their different occupations in the sweat of their faces. For the labor, he says, is great, but the art, dechnen, by the labor is temporary, adding nothing serviceable among things that please. Wherefore there is no profit, for where there is no excellence, there is no profit. With reason, therefore, are the objects of such solicitude but vanity, and the spirit's choice. Now this name of spirit he gives to the soul, for choice is a quality, not a motion, puon or kinesis. And David says, Into thy hands I commit my spirit, and in good truth did my wisdom remain with me, for it made me know and understand, so as to enable me to speak of all that is not advantageous, Perisia, under the sun. If therefore we desire the righteously profitable, if we seek the truly advantageous, if it is our aim to be incorruptible, let us engage in those labors which reach beyond the sun. For in these there is no vanity, and there is not the choice of a spirit at once inane and hurried hither and thither to no purpose. Verse 12. And I turned myself to behold wisdom and madness and folly, for what man is there that shall come after counsel in all those things which it has done? Os elevsete opisotes vules sumpanta osa epuesin afte. He means the wisdom which comes from God and which also remained with him. And by madness and folly he designates all the labors of men and the vain and silly pleasure they have in them. Distinguishing these, therefore, and their measure, and blessing the true wisdom, he has added, For what man is there that shall come after counsel? For this counsel instructs us in the wisdom that is such indeed, and gifts us with deliverance from madness and folly. Verse 13. Then I saw that wisdom excelleth folly as much as light excelleth darkness. He does not say this in the way of comparison, for things which are contrary to each other and mutually destructive cannot be compared but his decision was that the one is to be chosen and the other avoided. To like effect is the saying, men loved darkness rather than light. For the term rather in that passage expresses the choice of the person loving and not the comparison of the objects themselves. Verse 14. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. That man always inclines earthward, he means, and has the ruling faculty, to hegemonikon, darkened. It is true indeed that we men have all of us our eyes in our heads if we speak of the mere disposition of the body, but he speaks here of the eyes of the mind. For as the eyes of the swine do not turn naturally up towards heaven just because it is made by nature to have an inclination towards the belly, so the mind of the man, who has once been enervated by pleasures, is not so easily diverted from the tendency thus assumed, because he has not respect unto all the commandments of the Lord. Again, Christ is the head of the church, and they, therefore, are the wise who walk in his way, for he himself has said, I am the way. On this account, then, it becomes the wise man always to keep the eyes of his mind directed towards Christ himself, in order that he may do nothing out of measure, 
neither being lifted up in heart in the time of prosperity, nor becoming negligent in the day of adversity, for his judgments are a great deep, as you will learn more exactly from what is to follow. Verse 14. And I perceived myself also that one event happeneth to them all. Verse 15. Then said I in my heart, as it happeneth to the fool, so it happeneth even to me, and why was I then more wise? The run of the discourse in what follows deals with those who are of a mean spirit as regards this present life, and in whose judgment the article of death and all the anomalous pains of the body are a kind of dreaded evil, and who on this account hold that there is no profit in a life of virtue, because there is no difference made in ills like these between the wise man and the fool. He speaks consequently of these as the words of a madness inclining to utter senselessness, whence he also adds this sentence, for the fool talks over much, ek perisevmatos, and by the fool here he means himself, and every one who reasons in that way. Accordingly he condemns this absurd way of thinking, and for the same reason he has given utterance to such sentiments in the fears of his heart, and dreading the righteous condemnation of those who are to be heard, he solves the difficulties in its pressure by his own reflections. For this word, why was I then wise, was the word of a man in doubt and difficulty whether what is expended on wisdom is done well or to no purpose, and whether there is no difference between the wise man and the fool in point of advantage, seeing that the former is involved equally with the latter in the same sufferings which happen in this present world. And for this reason, he says, I spake over largely, peri son, in my heart, in thinking that there is no difference between the wise man and the fool. Verse 16, for there is no remembrance of the wise equally with the fool forever. For the events that happen in this life are all transitory, be they even the painful incidents of which he says, as all things now are consigned to oblivion. For after a short space has passed by, all the things that befall men in this life perish in forgetfulness. Yea, the very persons to whom these things have happened are not remembered all in like manner, even although they may have gone through like chances in life. For they are not remembered for these, but only for what they may have evinced of wisdom or folly, virtue or vice. The memories of such are not extinguished equally among men in consequence of the changes of lot befalling them. Wherefore, he has added this, And how shall the wise man die along with the fool? The death of sinners indeed is evil, yet the memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked is extinguished. Verse 22, For that falls to man in all his labor. In truth, to those who occupy their minds with the distractions of life, life becomes a painful thing, which, as it were, wounds the heart with its goads, that is, with the lustful desires of increase. And sorrowful also is the solicitude connected with covetousness. It does not so much gratify those who are successful in it, as it pains those who are unsuccessful, while the day is spent in laborious anxieties, and the night puts sleep to flight from the eyes with the cares of making gain. Vain, therefore, is the zeal of the man who looks to these things. Verse 24. And there is nothing good for a man but what he eats and drinks, and what will show to his soul good in his labor. This also I saw, that it is from the hand of God. Verse 25. For who eats and drinks from his own resources? Paraftu. That the discourse does not deal now with material meats, he will show by what follows, namely, it is better to go to the house of mourning, than to go to the house of feasting. And so, in the present passage, he proceeds to add, and what will show to his soul good in its labor. And surely mere material meats and drinks are not the soul's good. For the flesh, when luxuriously nurtured, wars against the soul and rises in revolt against the spirit. And how should not intemperate eatings and drinkings also be contrary to God? He speaks, therefore, of things mystical. For no one shall partake of the spiritual table but one who is called by him, and who has listened to the wisdom which says, Take and eat. Chapter 3 Verse 3 There is a time to kill and a time to heal. To kill in the case of him who perpetrates unpardonable transgression, and to heal in the case of him who can show a wound that will bear remedy. Verse 4 A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to weep when it is the time of suffering, 
as when the Lord also says, Verily I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but to laugh as concerning the resurrection, for your sorrow, he says, shall be turned into joy. Verse 4, A time to mourn and a time to dance. When one thinks of the death which the transgression of Adam brought on us, it is a time to mourn, but it is a time to hold festal gatherings when we call to mind the resurrection from the dead which we expect through the new Adam. Verse 6, A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to keep the scripture against the unworthy and a time to put it forth for the worthy. Or again, before the incarnation it was a time to keep the letter of the law, but it was a time to cast it away when the truth came in its flower. Verse 7, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to speak when there are hearers who receive the word, but a time to keep silence when the hearers pervert the word. As Paul says, a man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject. Verse 10, I have seen then the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. Verse 11, everything that he hath made is beautiful in its time, and he hath set the whole world in their heart, so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. And this is true, for no one is able to comprehend the works of God altogether. Moreover, the world is the work of God. No one then can find out as to this world what is its space from the beginning and unto the end, that is to say, the period appointed for it, and the limits before determined unto it, forasmuch as God has set the whole world as a realm of ignorance in our hearts. And thus one says, Declare to me the shortness of my days. In this manner, and for our profit, the end of this world, age, that is to say, this present life, is a thing of which we are ignorant. End of a commentary on the beginning of Ecclesiastes by Dionysius of Alexandria. An Interpretation of the Gospel According to Luke by Dionysius of Alexandria This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 22, verses 42 to 48 Verse 42 Father, if thou be willing to remove par enekin this cup from me, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. But let these things be enough to say on the subject of the will. This word, however, let the cup pass, does not mean, let it not come near me or approach me. For what can pass from him certainly must first come nigh him, and what does pass thus from him must be by him. For if it does not reach him, it cannot pass from him. For he takes to himself the person of man as having been made man, Wherefore also on this occasion he deprecates the doing of the inferior which is his own, and begs that the superior should be done which is his father's, to wit, the divine will. Which again, however, in respect of the divinity is one and the same will in himself and in the father. For it was the father's will that he should pass through every trial, temptation, and the father himself in a marvellous manner brought him on this course, not indeed with the trial itself as his goal, nor in order simply that he might enter into that, but in order that he might prove himself to be above the trial, and also beyond it. And surely it is the fact that the Saviour asks neither what is impossible, nor what is impracticable, nor what is contrary to the will of the Father. It is something possible, for Mark makes mention of his saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. And they are possible if he wills them, for Luke tells us that he said, Father, if thou be willing, remove parenechke, this cup, from me. The Holy Spirit, therefore, apportioned among the evangelists, makes up the full account of our Saviour's whole disposition by the expressions of these several narrators together. He does not then ask of the Father what the Father wills not, for the words, if thou be willing, were demonstrative of subjection and docility, epiikias not of ignorance or hesitancy. For this reason the other scripture says, All things are possible unto thee. And Matthew again admirably describes the submission and the humility when he says, If it be possible. For unless I adapt the sense in this way, some will perhaps assign an impious signification to this expression, If it be possible. As if there were anything impossible for God to do except that only which he does not will to do. 
Bart being straightway strengthened in his humanity by his ancestral, but that a case, divinity, he urges the safer petition, and desires no longer that that should be the case, but that it might be accomplished in accordance with the Father's good pleasure, in glory, in constancy, and in fullness. For John, who has given us the record of the sublimest and divinest of the Saviour's words and deeds, heard him speak thus, And the cup which my Father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Now, to drink the cup was to discharge the ministry and the whole economy of trial with fortitude, to follow and fulfill the Father's determination, and to surmount all apprehensions. And the exclamation, Why hast thou forsaken me, was in due accordance with the requests he had previously made. Why is it that death has been in conjunction with me all along up till now, and that I bear not yet the cup? This I judge to have been the Saviour's meaning in this concise utterance. And he certainly spake truth then. Nevertheless he was not forsaken, but he drank out of the cup at once, as his plea had implied, and then passed away. Paralleluthe. And the vinegar, which was handed to him, seems to me to have been a symbolical thing, for the turned wine, ectropias unos, indicated very well the quick turning, tropein, and change which he sustained when he passed from his passion to impassibility, and from death to deathlessness, and from the position of one judged to that of one judging, and from subjection under the despot's power to the exercise of kingly dominion. And the sponge, as I think, signified the complete transfusion, anakrasin, of the Holy Spirit that was realized in him. And the reed symbolized the royal scepter and the divine law. And the hyssop expressed that quickening and saving resurrection of his by which he has also brought health to us. Verse 43, And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Verse 44, And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. The phrase, a sweat of blood, is a current parabolic expression used of persons in intense pain and distress, as also of one in bitter grief people say that the man weeps tears of blood. For in using the expression, as it were, great drops of blood, he does not declare the drops of sweat to have been actually drops of blood, for he would not then have said that these drops of sweat were like blood, for such is the force of the expression, as it were, great drops, but rather, with the object of making it plain that the Lord's body was not bedewed with any kind of subtle moisture, which had only the show and appearance of actuality, but that it was really suffused all over with sweat, in the shape of large, thick drops, he has taken the great drops of blood as an illustration of what was the case with him. And accordingly, as by the intensity of the supplication and the severe agony, so also by the dense and excessive sweat, he made the facts patent that the Saviour was man by nature and in reality, and not in mere semblance and appearance, and that he was subject to all the innocent sensibilities natural to men. Nevertheless, the words, I have power to lay down my life and I have power to take it again, show that his passion was a voluntary thing, and besides that, they indicate that the life which is laid down and taken again is one thing, and the divinity which lays that down and takes it again is another. He says, one thing and another, not as making a partition into two persons, but as showing the distinction between the two natures. And as, by voluntarily enduring the death of the flesh, he implanted incorruptibility in it, so also by taking to himself of his own free will the passion of our servitude, he set in it the seeds of constancy and courage, whereby he has nerved those who believe on him for the mighty conflicts belonging to their witness-bearing. Thus also those drops of sweat flowed from him in a marvellous way like great drops of blood, in order that he might, as it were, drain off anaxerane, and empty the fountain of the fear which is proper to our nature. For unless this had been done with a mystical import, he certainly would not, even had he been the most timorous and ignoble of men, have been bedewed in this unnatural way with drops of sweat like drops of blood under the mere force of his agony. Of like import is also the sentence in the narrative which tells us that an angel stood by the Saviour and strengthened him, for this too bore also on the economy entered into on our behalf, 
for those who are appointed to engage in the sacred exertions of conflicts on account of piety have the angels from heaven to assist them. And the prayer, Father, remove the cup, he uttered probably not as if he feared the death itself, but with the view of challenging the devil by these words to erect the cross for him. With words of deceit, that personality deluded Adam. With the words of divinity, then, let the deceiver himself now be deluded. Howbeit, assuredly, the will of the Son is not one thing, and the will of the Father another. For he who wills what the Father wills is found to have the Father's will. It is in a figure, therefore, that he says, Not my will, but thine. For it is not that he wishes the cup to be removed, but that he refers to the Father's will, the right issue of his passion, and honors thereby the Father as the first, Archein, for if the Father's style one's disposition, Chnome, and if such disposition relates also to what is in consideration hidden as if by settled purpose, how say some that the Lord, who is above all these things, bears a gnomic will, Thelema, Gnomicon. Manifestly, that can be only by defect of reason. Verse 45, And when he rose from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. Verse 46, And said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. For in the most general sense it holds good that it is apparently not possible for any man, malista isos panti anthropo, to remain altogether without experience of ill. For, as one says, the whole world lieth in wickedness, and again, the most of the days of man are labor and trouble. But you will perhaps say, what difference is there between being tempted and falling or entering into temptation? Well, if one is overcome of evil, and he will be overcome unless he struggles against it himself, and unless God protects him with his shield, that man has entered into temptation and is in it and is brought under it like one that is led captive. But if one withstands and endures, that man is indeed tempted, but he has not entered into temptation or fallen into it. Thus Jesus was led up of the Spirit, not indeed to enter into temptation, but to be tempted of the devil. And Abraham again did not enter into temptation, neither did God lead him into temptation, but he tempted tried him. Yet he did not drive him into temptation. The Lord himself, moreover, tempted, tried the disciples. Thus the wicked one, when he tempts us, draws us into the temptation as dealing himself with the temptations of evil. But God, when he tempts, tries, adduces the temptations, trials, as one untempted of evil. For God, it is said, cannot be tempted of evil. The devil therefore drives us on by violence, drawing us to destruction, but God leads us by the hand, training us for our salvation. Verse 47. But while he yet spake, behold a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them, and drew near unto Jesus, and kissed him. Verse 48. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? How wonderful this endurance of evil by the Lord, who even kissed the traitor and spake words softer even than the kiss. For he did not say, O thou abominable, yea, utterly abominable traitor, is this the return you make to us for so great kindness? But somehow he says simply Judas, using the proper name, which was the address that would be used by one who commiserated a person or who wished to call him back, rather than of one in anger. And he did not say, thy master, the Lord, thy benefactor, but he said simply, the son of man, that is, the tender and meek one, as if he meant to say, even supposing that I was not your master or Lord or benefactor, dost thou still betray one so guilelessly and so tenderly affected towards thee, as even to kiss thee in the hour of thy treachery, and that too when the kiss was the signal for thy treachery. Blessed art thou, O Lord, how great is this example of the endurance of evil that thou hast shown us in thine own person! How great, too, the pattern of lowliness! Albeit the Lord has given us this example to show us that we ought not to give up offering our good counsel to our brethren, even should nothing remarkable be affected by our words. For as incurable wounds are wounds which cannot be remedied either by severe applications or by those which may act more pleasantly upon them, 
so the soul, when it is once carried captive and gives itself up to any kind of wickedness and refuses to consider what is really profitable for it, although a myriad counsels should echo in it, takes no good to itself, but just as if the sense of hearing were dead within it, it receives no benefit from exhortations addressed to it, not because it cannot, but only because it will not. This was what happened in the case of Judas, and yet Christ, although he knew all these things beforehand, did not at any time, from the beginning on to the end, omit to do all in the way of counsel that depended on him. And, inasmuch as we know that such was his practice, we ought also unceasingly to endeavor to set those right, Ruth Mizin, who prove careless, even although no actual good may seem to be affected by that counsel that the son is not different from the father in nature, but con-natural and consubstantial with him. The plant that springs from the root is something distinct from that whence it grows up, and yet it is of one nature with it, and the river which flows from the fountain is something distinct from the fountain, for we cannot call either the river a fountain or the fountain a river. Nevertheless, we allow that they are both one according to nature and also one in substance, and we admit that the fountain may be conceived of as father, and that the river is what is begotten of the fountain. End of an interpretation of the Gospel according to Luke by Dionysius of Alexandria. Another fragment on Luke 22:46 and following by Dionysius of Alexandria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Connected with the proceeding on Christ's prayer in Gethsemane. This prayer he also offered up himself, falling repeatedly on his face, and on both occasions he urged his request for not entering into temptation, both when he prayed, If it be possible, let this cup pass from me, and when he said, Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. For he spoke not of entering into temptation, and he made that his prayer, but he did not ask that he should have no trial whatsoever in these circumstances, or that no manner of hardship should ever befall him. For in the most general application it holds good that it does not appear to be possible for any man to remain altogether without experience of ill. For, as one says, the whole world lieth in wickedness, and again, the most of the days of man are labor and trouble, as men themselves also admit. Short is our life and full of sorrow. Howbeit it was not meet that he should bid them pray directly that that curse might not be fulfilled which is expressed thus, Cursed is the ground in thy works, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Or thus, earth thou art, and unto earth shalt thou return. For which reason the holy scriptures, that indicate in many various ways the dire distressfulness of life, designate it as a valley of weeping. And most of all indeed is this world a scene of pain to the saints to whom he addresses this word, and he cannot lie in uttering it. In the world ye shall have tribulation." And to the same effect also, he says by the prophet, many are the afflictions of the righteous. But I suppose that he refers to this entering not into temptation when he speaks in the prophet's words of being delivered out of the afflictions. For he adds, the Lord will deliver him out of them all. And this is just in accordance with the Saviour's word whereby he promises that they will overcome their afflictions and that they will participate in that victory which he has won for them. For after saying, In the world ye shall have tribulation, he added, But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And again he taught them to pray that they might not fall into temptation, when he says, And lead us not into temptation, which means, Suffer us not to fall into temptation. And to show that this did not imply that they should not be tempted, but really that they should be delivered from the evil, he added, But deliver us from evil. But perhaps you will say, what difference is there between being tempted and falling or entering into temptation? Well, if one is overcome with evil, and he will be overcome unless he struggles against it himself, and unless God protects him with his shield, that man has entered into temptation, and is in it, and is brought under it, like one that is led captive. But if one withstands and endures, that man is indeed tempted, but he has not entered into temptation, or fallen under it. Thus Jesus was led up of the Spirit, not indeed to enter into temptation, but to be tempted of the devil. 
And Abraham again did not enter into temptation, neither did God lead him into temptation, but he tempted, tried him. Yet he did not drive him into temptation. The Lord himself, moreover, tempted, tried the disciples. And thus the wicked one, when he tempts us, draws us into the temptations as dealing himself with the temptations of evil. But God, when he tempts, tries, adduces the temptations as one untempted of evil. For God, it is said, cannot be tempted of evil. The devil, therefore, drives us on by violence, drawing us to destruction. But God leads us by the hand, training us for our salvation. End of Another fragment on Luke 22:46 and following by Dionysus of Alexandria. Fragments of the Lost Work of Justin on the Resurrection by Justin Martyr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 1. The Self-Evidencing Power of Truth The word of truth is free and carries its own authority, disdaining to fall under any skillful argument or to endure the logical scrutiny of its hearers. But it would be believed for its own nobility and for the confidence due to him who sends it. Now the word of truth is sent from God, wherefore the freedom claimed by the truth is not arrogant. For being sent with authority, it were not fit that it should be required to produce proof of what is said, since neither is there any proof beyond itself which is God. For every proof is more powerful and trustworthy than that which it proves, since what is disbelieved, until proof is produced, gets credit when such proof is produced and is recognized as being what it was stated to be. But nothing is more powerful or more trustworthy than the truth, so that he who requires proof of this is like one who wishes it demonstrated why the things that appear to the senses do appear. For the test of those things which are received through the reason is sense, but of sense itself there is no test beyond itself. As then we bring those things which reason hunts after to sense, and by it judge what kinds of things they are, whether the things spoken be true or false, and then sit in judgment no longer, giving full credit to its decision, so also we refer all that is said regarding men and the world to the truth, and by it judge whether it be worthless or no. But the utterance of truth we judge by no separate test, giving full credit to itself. And God, the Father of the universe, who is the perfect intelligence, is the truth. And the Word, being his Son, came to us, having put on flesh, revealing both himself and the Father, giving to us in himself resurrection from the dead and eternal life afterwards. And this is Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord. He, therefore, is himself both the faith and the proof of himself and of all things. Wherefore, those who follow him and know him, having faith in him as their proof, shall rest in him. But since the adversary does not cease to resist many and uses many and diverse arts to ensnare them, that he may seduce the faithful from their faith, and that he may prevent the faithless from believing, it seems to me necessary that we also, being armed with the invulnerable doctrines of the faith, do battle against him in behalf of the weak. Chapter 2. Objections to the Resurrection of the Flesh They who maintain the wrong opinion say that there is no resurrection of the flesh, giving as their reason that it is impossible that what is corrupted and dissolved should be restored to the same as it had been, and besides the impossibility, they say that the salvation of the flesh is disadvantageous, and they abuse the flesh, adducing its infirmities, and declare that it only is the cause of our sins, so that, if the flesh, say they, rise again, our infirmities also rise with it. And such sophistical reasons as the following they elaborate. If the flesh rise, it must rise either entire and possessed of all its parts, or imperfect. But its rising imperfect argues a want of power on God's part, if some parts could be saved and others not. But if all the parts are saved, then the body will manifestly have all its members. But is it not absurd to say that these members will exist after the resurrection from the dead? Since the Saviour said, They neither marry nor are given in marriage, but shall be as the angels in heaven. And the angels say they have neither flesh, nor do they eat, nor have sexual intercourse, therefore there shall be no resurrection of the flesh. By these and such like arguments they attempt to distract men from the faith, 
and there are some who maintain that even Jesus himself appeared only as spiritual and not in flesh, but presented merely the appearance of flesh. These persons seek to rob the flesh of the promise. First then, let us solve those things which seem to them to be insoluble. Then we will introduce in an orderly manner the demonstration concerning the flesh, proving that it partakes of salvation. Chapter 3. If the members rise, must they discharge the same functions as now? They say then, if the body shall rise entire and in possession of all its members, it necessarily follows that the functions of the members shall also be in existence, that the womb shall become pregnant and the male also discharge his function of generation and the rest of the members in like manner. Now let this argument stand or fall by this one assertion, for this being proved false, their whole objection will be removed. Now it is indeed evident that the members which discharge functions discharge those functions which in the present life we see, but it does not follow that they necessarily discharge the same functions from the beginning. And that this may be more easily seen, let us consider it thus. The function of the womb is to become pregnant, and of the member of the male to impregnate. But as, though these members are destined to discharge such functions, it is not therefore necessary that they from the beginning discharge them, since we see many women who do not become pregnant as those that are barren, even though they have wombs. So pregnancy is not the immediate and necessary consequence of having a womb. But those even who are not barren abstain from sexual intercourse, some being virgins from the first and others from a certain time. And we see men also keeping themselves virgin, some from the first and some from a certain time, so that by their means marriage, made lawless through lust, is destroyed. And we find that some even of the lower animals, though possessed of wombs, do not bear, such as the mule, and the male mules do not beget their kind. So that both in the case of men and the irrational animals we can see sexual intercourse abolished, and this too before the future world. And our Lord Jesus Christ was born of a virgin for no other reason than that he might destroy the begetting by lawless desire and might show to the ruler that the formation of man was possible to God without human intervention. And when he had been born and had submitted to the other conditions of the flesh, I mean food, drink, and clothing, this one condition only of discharging the sexual function he did not submit to, for regarding the desires of the flesh, he accepted some as necessary, while others, which were unnecessary, he did not submit to. For if the flesh were deprived of food, drink, and clothing, it would be destroyed, but being deprived of lawless desire, it suffers no harm. And at the same time he foretold that in the future world sexual intercourse should be done away with, as he says, the children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but the children of the world to come neither marry nor are given in marriage, but shall be like the angels in heaven. Let not then those that are unbelieving marvel, if in the world to come he do away with those acts of our fleshly members, which even in the present life are abolished. Chapter 4. Must the deformed rise deformed? Well, they say, if then the flesh rise, it must rise the same as it falls, so that if it die with one eye, it must rise one-eyed, if lame, lame. If defective in any part of the body, in this part the man must rise deficient. How truly blinded are they in the eyes of their hearts, for they have not seen on the earth blind men seeing again, and the lame walking by his word. All things which the Saviour did, he did in the first place in order that what was spoken concerning him in the prophets might be fulfilled, that the blind should receive sight and the deaf hear, and so on but also to induce the belief that in the resurrection the flesh shall rise entire. For if on earth he healed the sicknesses of the flesh and made the body whole, much more will he do this in the resurrection, so that the flesh shall rise perfect and entire. In this manner, then, shall those dreaded difficulties of theirs be healed. Chapter 5. The Resurrection of the Flesh is Not Impossible But again, of those who maintain that the flesh has no resurrection, some assert that it is impossible, others that, considering how vile and despicable the flesh is, it is not fit that God should raise it, and others that it did not at the first receive the promise. First then, in respect of those who say that it is impossible for God to raise it, 
It seems to me that I should show that they are ignorant, professing as they do in word that they are believers, yet by their works proving themselves to be unbelieving, even more unbelieving than the unbelievers. For seeing that all the heathen believe in their idols and are persuaded that to them all things are possible, as even their poet Homer says, the gods can do all things and that easily, and he added the word easily that he might bring out the greatness of the power of the gods. Many do seem to be more unbelieving than they, for if the heathen believe in their gods which are idols, which have ears and they hear not, they have eyes and they see not, that they can do all things, though they be but devils, as saith the scripture, the gods of the nations are devils, much more ought we, who hold the right, excellent, and true faith, to believe in our God, since also we have proofs of his power, first in the creation of the first man, for he was made from the earth by God, and this is sufficient evidence of God's power. And then they who observe things can see how men are generated one by another, and can marvel in a still greater degree that from a little drop of moisture so grand a living creature is formed. And certainly, if this were only recorded in a promise and not seen accomplished, this too would be much more incredible than the other, but it is rendered more credible by accomplishment. But even in the case of the resurrection, the Saviour has shown us accomplishments of which we will in the little speak. But now we are demonstrating that the resurrection of the flesh is possible, asking pardon of the children of the church if we adduce arguments which seem to be secular and physical, first because to God nothing is secular, not even the world itself, for it is his workmanship, and secondly because we are conducting our argument so as to meet unbelievers. For if we argued with believers it were enough to say that we believe, but now we must proceed by demonstrations. The foregoing proofs are indeed quite sufficient to evince the possibility of the resurrection of the flesh, but since these men are exceedingly unbelieving, we will further adduce a more convincing argument still, an argument drawn not from faith, for they are not within its scope, but from their own mother unbelief, I mean, of course, from physical reasons. For if by such arguments we prove to them that the resurrection of the flesh is possible, they are certainly worthy of great contempt, if they can be persuaded neither by the deliverances of faith nor by the arguments of the world. Chapter 6. The Resurrection Consistent with the Opinions of the Philosophers Those then who are called natural philosophers say, some of them as Plato, that the universe is matter and God, others as Epicurus, that it is atoms and the void, others like the Stoics, that it is these four, fire, water, air, earth, for it is sufficient to mention the most prevalent opinions. And Plato says that all things are made from matter by God, and according to his design, but Epicurus and his followers say that all things are made from the atom, and the void by some kind of self-regulating action of the natural movement of the bodies, and the Stoics that all are made of the four elements, God pervading them. But while there is such discrepancy among them, there are some doctrines acknowledged by them all in common, one of which is that neither can anything be produced from what is not in being, nor anything be destroyed or dissolved into what has not any being, and that the elements exist indestructible out of which all things are generated. And this being so, the regeneration of the flesh will, according to all these philosophers, appear to be possible. For if, according to Plato, it is matter and God, both these are indestructible and God. And God indeed occupies the position of an artificer, to wit a potter, and matter occupies the place of clay or wax, or some such thing. That then which is formed of matter, be it an image or a statue, is destructible, but the matter itself is indestructible, such as clay or wax, or any other such kind of matter. Thus the artist designs in the clay or wax, and makes the form of a living animal, and again, if his handiwork be destroyed, it is not impossible for him to make the same form by working up the same material and fashioning it anew. So that, according to Plato, neither will it be impossible for God, who is himself indestructible and has also indestructible material, even after that which has been first formed of it has been destroyed, to make it anew again and to make the same form just as it was before. But according to the Stoics even, the body being produced by the mixture of the four elementary substances, when this body has been dissolved into the four elements, these remaining indestructible, 
It is possible that they receive a second time the same fusion and composition from God pervading them, and so remake the body which they formerly made. Like as if a man shall make a composition of gold and silver and brass and tin, and then shall wish to dissolve it again, so that each element exist separately, having again mixed them, he may, if he pleases, make the very same composition as he had formerly made. Again, according to Epicurus, the atoms and the void being indestructible, it is by a definite arrangement and adjustment of the atoms as they come together that both all other formations are produced, and the body itself, and it being of course of time dissolved, is dissolved again into those atoms from which it was also produced. And as these remain indestructible, it is not at all impossible that, by coming together again and receiving the same arrangement and position, they should make a body of like nature to what was formerly produced by them. As if a jeweler should make in mosaic the form of an animal, and the stones should be scattered by time, or by the man himself who made them, he having still in his possession the scattered stones may gather them together again, and having gathered may dispose them in the same way, and make the same form of an animal." And shall not God be able to collect again the decomposed members of the flesh and make the same body as was formerly produced by him? Chapter 7. The Body Valuable in God's Sight But the proof of the possibility of the resurrection of the flesh I have sufficiently demonstrated in answer to men of the world. And if the resurrection of the flesh is not found impossible on the principles even of unbelievers, how much more will it be found in accordance with the mind of believers? But following our order, we must now speak with respect to those who think meanly of the flesh and say that it is not worthy of the resurrection nor of the heavenly economy, because first its substance is earth, and besides because it is full of all wickedness, so that it forces the soul to sin along with it. But these persons seem to be ignorant of the whole work of God, both of the genesis and formation of man at the first, and why the things in the world were made. For does not the word say, Let us make man in our image and after our likeness? What kind of man? Manifestly he means fleshly man. For the word says, And God took dust of the earth and made man. It is evident, therefore, that man made in the image of God was of flesh. Is it not then absurd to say that the flesh made by God in his own image is contemptible and worth nothing? but that the flesh is with God a precious possession is manifest first from its being formed by him, if at least the image is valuable to the former and artist, and besides its value can be gathered from the creation of the rest of the world, for that on account of which the rest is made is the most precious of all to the maker. Chapter 8. Does the body cause the soul to sin? Quite true, say they. Yet the flesh is a sinner, so much so that it forces the soul to sin along with it, and thus they vainly accuse it, and lay to its charge alone the sins of both. But in what instance can the flesh possibly sin by itself, if it have not the soul going before it and inciting it? For as in the case of a yoke of oxen, if one or other is loosed from the yoke, neither of them can plough alone, so neither can soul or body alone affect anything if they be unyoked from their communion. And if it is the flesh that is the sinner, then on its account alone did the Saviour come, as he says, I am not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Since then the flesh has been proved to be valuable in the sight of God and glorious above all his works, it would very justly be saved by him. We must meet, therefore, those who say that even though it be the special handiwork of God and beyond all else valued by him, it would not immediately follow that it has the promise of the resurrection. Yet is it not absurd that that which has been produced with such circumstance and which is beyond all else valuable should be so neglected by its maker as to pass to non-entity? Then the sculptor and painter, if they wish the works they have made to endure, that they may win glory by them, renew them when they begin to decay, but God would so neglect his own possession and work that it becomes annihilated and no longer exists. Should we not call this labor in vain, as if a man who has built a house should forthwith destroy it or should neglect it, though he sees it falling into decay and is able to repair it? We would blame him for laboring in vain, and should we not so blame God? But not such an one is the incorruptible. Not senseless is the intelligence of the universe. 
Let the unbelieving be silent even though they themselves do not believe. But in truth he has even called the flesh to the resurrection and promises to it everlasting life. For where he promises to save man, there he gives the promise to the flesh. For what is man but the reasonable animal composed of body and soul? Is the soul by itself man? No, but the soul of man. Would the body be called man? No, but it is called the body of man. If then neither of these is by itself man, but that which is made up of the two together is called man, and God has called man to life and resurrection, he has called not a part but the whole, which is the soul and the body. Since would it not be unquestionably absurd if, while these two are in the same being and according to the same law, the one were saved and the other not? And if it be not impossible, as has already been proved, that the flesh be regenerated, what is the distinction on the ground of which the soul is saved and the body not? Do they make God a grudging God? But he is good, and will have all to be saved. And by God and his proclamation, not only has your soul heard and believed on Jesus Christ, and with it the flesh, but both were washed, and both wrought righteousness. They make God then ungrateful and unjust, if, while both believe on him, he desires to save one and not the other. Well, they say, but the soul is incorruptible, being a part of God and inspired by him, and therefore he desires to save what is peculiarly his own and akin to himself. But the flesh is corruptible and not from him, as the soul is. Then what thanks are due to him, and what manifestation of his power and goodness is it, if he purposed to save what is by nature saved and exists as a part of himself? For it had its salvation from itself, so that in saving the soul God does no great thing. For to be saved is its natural destiny, because it is a part of himself, being his inspiration. But no thanks are due to one who saves what is his own, for this is to save himself. For he who saves a part of himself, saves himself by his own means, lest he become defective in that part, and this is not the act of a good man. For not even when a man does good to his children and offspring does one call him a good man, for even the most savage of the wild beasts do so, and indeed willingly endure death, if need be, for the sake of their cubs. But if a man were to perform the same acts in behalf of his slaves, that man would justly be called good. Wherefore the Saviour also taught us to love our enemies, since, says he, what thank have ye? So that he has shown us that it is a good work not only to love those that are begotten of him, but also those that are without and what he enjoins upon us, he himself first of all does. Footnote. It is supposed that a part of the treatise has been here dropped out. End footnote. Chapter 9. The resurrection of Christ proves that the body rises. If he had no need of the flesh, why did he heal it? And what is most forcible of all, he raised the dead. Why? Was it not to show what the resurrection should be? How then did he raise the dead, their souls or their bodies? Manifestly both. If the resurrection were only spiritual, it was requisite that he, in raising the dead, should show the body lying apart by itself and the soul living apart by itself. But now he did not do so but raise the body, confirming in it the promise of life. Why did he rise in the flesh in which he suffered unless to show the resurrection of the flesh? And wishing to confirm this, when his disciples did not know whether to believe he had truly risen in the body, and were looking upon him and doubting, he said to them, Ye have not yet faith, see that it is I. And he let them handle him, and showed them the prints of the nails in his hands. And when they were by every kind of proof persuaded that it was himself, and in the body, they asked him to eat with them, that they might thus still more accurately ascertain that he had in verity risen bodily, and he did eat honeycomb and fish. And when he had thus shown them that there is truly a resurrection of the flesh, wishing to show them this also, that it is not impossible for flesh to ascend into heaven, as he had said that our dwelling place is in heaven, he was taken up into heaven while they beheld, as he was in the flesh. If therefore, after all that has been said, any one demand demonstration of the resurrection, he is in no respect different from the Sadducees, since the resurrection of the flesh is the power of God, and being above all reasoning is established by faith and seen in works. 
Chapter 10. The body saved and will therefore rise. The resurrection is a resurrection of the flesh which died, for the spirit dies not. The soul is in the body, and without a soul it cannot live. The body, when the soul forsakes it, is not, for the body is the house of the soul, and the soul the house of the spirit. These three, in all those who cherish a sincere hope and unquestioning faith in God, will be saved. Considering, therefore, even such arguments as are suited to this world, and finding that, even according to them, it is not impossible that the flesh be regenerated, and seeing that, besides all these proofs, the Saviour in the whole gospel shows that there is salvation for the flesh, why do we any longer endure those unbelieving and dangerous arguments, and fail to see that we are retrograding when we listen to such an argument as this, that the soul is immortal but the body mortal and incapable of being revived? For this we used to hear from Pythagoras and Plato even before we learned the truth. If then the Saviour said this, and proclaimed salvation to the soul alone, what new thing beyond what we heard from Pythagoras and Plato and all their band did he bring us? But now he has come proclaiming the glad tidings of a new and strange hope to men, for indeed it was a strange and new thing for God to promise that he would not keep incorruption in incorruption, but would make corruption in corruption. But because the prince of wickedness could in no other way corrupt the truth, he sent forth his apostles, evil men who introduced pestilent doctrines, choosing them from among those who crucified our Saviour, and these men bore the names of the Saviour, but did the works of him that sent them, through whom the name itself has been evilly spoken against. But if the flesh do not rise, why is it also guarded, and why do we not rather suffer it to indulge its desires? Why do we not imitate physicians who, it is said, when they get a patient that is despaired of and incurable, allow him to indulge his desires? For they know that he is dying, and this indeed those who hate the flesh surely do, casting it out of its inheritance, so far as they can. For on this account they also despise it, because it is shortly to become a corpse. But if our physician Christ, God, having rescued us from our desires, regulates our flesh with his own wise and temperate rule, it is evident that he guards it from sins because it possesses a hope of salvation, as physicians do not suffer men whom they hope to save to indulge in what pleasures they please. End of Fragments of the Lost Work of Justin on the Resurrection by Justin Martyr Discourse on All the Saints by Gregory Thavmaturgis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Grant thy blessing, Lord. It was my desire to be silent and not to make a public display of the rustic rudeness of my tongue, for silence is a matter of great consequence when one's speech is mean and to refrain from utterance is indeed an admirable thing, where there is lack of training, and verily he is the highest philosopher who knows how to cover his ignorance by abstinence from public address. Knowing therefore the feebleness of tongue proper to me, I should have preferred such a course. Nevertheless the spectacle of the onlookers impels me to speak. Since then this solemnity is a glorious one among our festivals, and the spectators form a crowded gathering, and our assembly is one of elevated fervour in the faith, I shall face the task of commencing an address with confidence. And this I may attempt all the more boldly, since the Father requests me, and the Church is with me, and the sainted martyrs with this object strengthen what is weak in me. For these have inspired aged men to accomplish with much love a long course, and constrain them to support their failing steps by the staff of the word, or the word, and they have stimulated women to finish their course like the young men, and have brought to this too those of tender years, yea, even creeping children. In this wise have the martyrs shown their power, leaping with joy in the presence of death, laughing at the sword, making sport of the wrath of princes, grasping at death as the producer of deathlessness, making victory their own by their fall, through the body taking their leap to heaven, suffering their members to be scattered abroad in order that they might hold sixthly, their souls and burst the bars of life, that they might open the gates or keys of heaven, 
And if anyone believes not that death is abolished, that Hades is trodden underfoot, that the chains thereof are broken, that the tyrant is bound, let him look on the martyrs disporting themselves, cuvis tontes, in the presence of death, and taking up the jubilant strain of the victory of Christ. Oh, the marvel! Since the hour when Christ despoiled Hades, men have danced in triumph over death. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Hades and the devil have been despoiled and stripped of their ancient armour, and cast out of their peculiar power. And even as Goliath had his head cut off with his own sword, so also is the devil, who had been the father of death, put to rout through death, and he finds that the self-same thing which he was wont to use as the ready weapon of his deceit has become the mighty instrument of his own destruction. Yea, if we may so speak, casting his hook at the Godhead, and seizing the wanted enjoyment of the baited pleasure, he is himself manifestly caught, while he deems himself the captor, and discovers that, in place of the man, he has touched the god. By reason thereafter the martyrs leap upon the head of the dragon, and despise every species of torment. For since the second Adam has brought up the first Adam out of the deeps of Hades, as Jonah was delivered out of the whale, and has set forth him who was deceived as a citizen of heaven, to the shame of the deceiver. The gates of Hades have been shut, and the gates of heaven have been opened, so as to offer an unimpeded entrance to those who rise thither in faith. In olden time Jacob beheld a ladder erected, reaching to heaven, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon it. But now, having been made man for man's sake, he who is the friend of man has crushed with the foot of his divinity him who is the enemy of man, and has borne up the man with the hand of his Christhood, and has made the trackless ether to be trodden by the feet of man. Then the angels were ascending and descending, but now the angel of the great council neither ascendeth nor descendeth. For whence or where shall he change his position who is present everywhere and filleth all things, and holds in his hand the ends of the world? Once indeed he descended and once he ascended, not, however, through any change, metavasi, of nature, but only through the condescension, suchkatavasi, of his philanthropic Christhood, or benignity. And he is seated as the Word with the Father, and as the Word he dwells in the womb, and as the Word he is found everywhere, and is never separated from the God of the universe. Aforetime did the devil deride the nature of man with great laughter, and he has had his joy over the times of our calamity in his festal days. But the laughter is only a three days pleasure, while the wailing is eternal, and his great laughter has prepared for him a greater wailing and ceaseless tears, and inconsolable weeping, and a sword in his heart. This sword did our leader forge against the enemy with fire in the virgin furnace, in such wise and after such fashion as he willed, and gave it its point by the energy of his invincible divinity, and dipped it in the water of an undefiled baptism, and sharpened it by sufferings without passion in them, and made it bright by the mystical resurrection, and herewith by himself he put to death the vengeful adversary together with his whole host. What manner of word, therefore, will express our joy or his misery? For he who is once an archangel is now a devil, he who once lived in heaven is now seen crawling like a serpent upon earth. He who once was jubilant with the cherubim is now shut up in pain in the guardhouse of swine, and him too, in fine, shall we put to rout if we mind those things which are contrary to his choice, by the grace and kindness of our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory and the power unto the ages of the ages. Amen. End of Discourse on All the Saints by Gregory Thaumaturgus. Fragments of Lactantius Firmianus by Lactantius. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 1. Fear, love, joy, sadness, lust, eager desire, anger, pity, emulation, admiration. These motions or affections of the mind exist from the beginning of man's creation by the Lord, and they were usefully and advantageously introduced into human nature, that by governing himself by these with method and in accordance with reason, man may be able, by acting manfully, to exercise those good qualities 
by means of which he would justly have deserved to receive from the Lord eternal life. For these affections of the mind, being restrained within their proper limits, that is, being rightly employed, produce at present good qualities, and in the future eternal rewards. But when they advance beyond their boundaries, that is, when they turn aside to an evil course, then vices and iniquities come forth and produce everlasting punishments. 2. Within our memory also, Lactantius speaks of meters, the pentameter, he says, and the tetrameter. 3. Fermianus, writing to Probus on the meters of comedies, thus speaks. For, as to the question which you proposed concerning the meters of comedies, I also know that many are of opinion that the plays of Terence in particular have not the meter of Greek comedy, that is, of Meander, Philemon, and Dephilius, which consist of trimeter verses, for our ancient writers of comedies in the modulation of their plays preferred to follow Eupolis, Cratinus, and Aristophanes, as has been before said, that there is a measure that is meter in the plays of Terence and Plautus, and of the other comic and tragic writers, let these declare, Cicero, Scaurus, and Fermianus. 4. We bring forward the sentiments of our Lactantius, which he expressed in words in his third volume to Probus on this subject. The Gauls, he says, were from ancient times called Galatians, from the whiteness of their body, and thus the Sibyl terms them. And this is what the poet intended to signify when he said, Gold collars deck their milk-white necks, when he might have used the word white. It is plain that from this the province was called Galatia, in which on their arrival in it the Gauls united themselves with Greeks, from which circumstance that region was called Gallagrecia, and afterwards Galatia. And it is no wonder if he said this concerning the Galatians, and related that a people of the West, having passed over so great a distance in the middle of the earth, settled in a region of the East. End of Fragments of Lactantius Firmianus by Lactantius A fragment on John 8.12 by Dionysius of Alexandria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Now, this word I am expresses his eternal subsistence, for if he is the reflection of the eternal light, he must also be eternal himself, for if the light subsists forever... It is evident that the reflection also subsists forever, and that this light subsists is known only by its shining, neither can there be a light that does not give light. We come back, therefore, to our illustrations. If there is day, there is light, and if there is no such thing, the sun certainly cannot be present. If, therefore, the sun had been eternal, there would also have been endless day. Now, however, as it is not so, the day begins when the sun rises, and it ends when the sun sets. But God is eternal light, having neither beginning nor end, and along with him there is the reflection, also without beginning and everlasting. The Father then being eternal, the Son is also eternal, being light of light. And if God is the light, Christ is the reflection, and if God is also a spirit, as it is written, God is a spirit, Christ, again, is called analogously spirit, atmis. End of a fragment on John 8.12 by Dionysius of Alexandria. Greek and Early Christian Novels, Part 1, by T. R. Glover. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Greek and Early Christian Novels Alare mu tode ipe ke atrekeos katalexon, ope ape larces tekeas dinas ikeo horas. Odyssey 8, 5, 7, 2. No study of the fourth century would be complete, which did not in some degree take account of its fiction. Yet to deal with it all and with precision would be an extremely difficult task. To begin, a good story, and every reader has his own idea of what is a good story, a story then that appeals to a large number of readers will probably be spread abroad not merely in abundance of copies but in various languages. 
It will be translated from one tongue to another, and as it travels it will undergo alterations. Passages will be added and others will be omitted. Eventually, when criticism takes the much-traveled story into consideration, widely differing recensions of it are found, and it is sometimes no easy matter to say which is the original form. Has it been expanded by a Syrian translator or cut down by a Greek? Many of the tales with which we have to deal describe an almost entirely artificial world and offer nothing beyond their style as a guide to the critic who will date them, and in some cases this is hardly any help at all, so that a novel like that of Longus is loosely dated as of the 2nd to the 4th century. Others conceal the date of their creation of set purpose and flaunt a false one, and though the falsehood may be readily detected, the true date can often only be determined by long and tiresome critical processes, with the result that critics come to very different conclusions. If, however, we bear in mind that while the dates of the first appearances of the particular books to which we have to refer are in many cases highly conjectural, these works yet represent the popular taste for long after as well as before the period with which we are dealing, and that their kind, if not themselves, has profoundly influenced actual productions of our period, we may without material error draw some real advantage from our study. We may begin by a short survey of the general lines of development of Greek fiction, for though a literary pedigree may be as hard to prove as a canine, no work of art of any sort can help in some measure betraying the environment in which it was produced, and something of the processes by which that stage has been reached. At the same time, the author's individuality must be recognized. To take a modern example, it is clear that Paul and Virginia owes much to Daphnis and Chloe, and it is also clear that it owes a good deal to Robinson Crusoe, the book which, of all books, most influenced Bernardine de Saint-Pierre from youth to age. Yet Paul is agitated by questions that Daphnis never dreamt of, and which he himself could hardly have dreamt of if he had not been created in the age of Rousseau, to say nothing of his creator's friendship with Rousseau. Again, though the work has been pronounced to be in some degree even anti-Christian in its quiet ignoring of such matters as original sin and any necessity for redemption, and its implication that man is born good, if only society will not corrupt him, yet the difference between Paul and Daphnis between Virginia and Chloe, is not explained without Christianity. We thus see that Longus, Defoe, Rousseau, and the Catholic Church have all contributed to this book, but perhaps, after all, we must recognize that Bernardine de Saint-Pierre contributed to it, or else we may have to pronounce Shakespeare a second-hand dramatist. We need not, however, write the history of literature to interpret Xanthope and Polyxena, or the life of Antony, and their contemporary rivals. I would refer the reader to the admirable work of Chassang, Histoire de Roman, which has been highly praised by Saint Buve, but not too highly, and the more special monograph of Erwin Rode, Der Griechische Roman. At the same time, clearness will be gained by giving a short sketch of the course of development that Greek fiction has followed. We may then classify our material very roughly in some five groups, premising that in many cases it would be difficult to say under which heading this or that work should more properly come, as the same book may share the characteristics of more than one class. Our five classes may then be taken as A. The Tale of Troy and Cognate Legends of Early Greece B. The Literary Offspring of Plato in Two Families The Descendants of Atlantis and of Ur the Armenian C the history degenerating into the romance of Alexander with two great subdivisions, the tale of the hero and the tale of travel, D, the avowed love tale, and E, the fiction with an immediate national or religious purpose. Our first group need not detain us long, important as it is. The tale of Troy and the other tales of early Greece were first worked over by the tragic poets. They were systematized by collectors of mythology and violently rationalized into history by historians of the lower type, who tortured mythology to the detriment of poetry and without profit to history. They were altered and abused by rhetoricians and sophists like Philostratus in his Heroicus and the fabricators of Dares and Dictus. They were turned into pantomimes and danced all over the Roman world, and perhaps even outside it. They recaptured Europe in the Middle Ages, when Achilles and Hector disputed the popularity of Roland and Arthur. And finally, at the revival of learning, they took with new life a still deeper hold on a wider world, which they yet retain. Our second group we associate for convenience with the name of Plato. 
While some took Atlantis for a real country, others saw more clearly that, as Stradbo wittily says, its creator destroyed it, just as the poets did the Wall of the Greeks. Real or imaginary, it was a fruitful example, and the seas of the world, or rather the parts outside the world, were dotted with ideal communities on happy islands, which, alas, fled further and further away with the growth of geography. As might be expected, these lands appeared most often when the existing countries were laboring under unhappy conditions. At a later day, and this is more important for our present purpose, when the center of gravity and philosophy had shifted from the state to the individual, a new type of utopia displaces the old, the utopia of happy thinkers who live an ideal life of contemplation without any government at all, without a state or social questions, and free from all disquieting foreign or domestic policies. The book on the contemplative life attributed, though wrongly, to Philo the Jew is an example of this. It describes the therapeute, who lived an ascetic life together in large numbers a little way out of Alexandria, so successfully avoiding attention that no geographer, traveller or philosopher ever found them except in the novel. The story of Ur the Armenian was much derided by the Epicureans, but it had a great influence. Cicero imitated it in his Dream of Scipio, which in its turn produced Macrobius's commentary, a book much used in the Middle Ages. Plutarch twice copied it in his vision of Timarchus in the De Genio Socrates and his story of the trance of Vespasius, the Sera Nominum Vindicta, the latter, according to Archbishop Trench, being not altogether unworthy to stand beside Plato's Ur. How far these and similar works may have influenced the authors of such Christian apocalypses as those that bear the names of Peter and of Paul, or whether their inspiration is to be found exclusively in the Jewish thought that gave birth to such works as The Secrets of Enoch and The Apocalypse of Baruch, is not for me to determine. Our third group is perhaps more popular. The imagination of the Greek world seized on Alexander and his wars and his travels, embellished the tale with the marvels of mythology and the wonders of India, and in the end left very little of the real Alexander. Travellers' tales confused by faraway memories of the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, by misunderstood monuments of Indian art or worship, by Brahmanical fables of all sorts, attached themselves to Alexander, and the marvellous tale grew with every generation. The false Callisthenes' story of Alexander exists in some twenty manuscripts with corruptions and additions of every age. Now it was the Huns and now the Turks that the hero repelled. The book was done into Latin, into Armenian, into Arabic, and thence into Syriac and Persian, into Hebrew from the Latin, into Turkish, into Ethiopic, from the Arabic version of the Greek, and so forth. Elements were borrowed from it for other tales as freely as they were added to it, and it has recently been pointed out that Scottish history has been enriched from this source, for it seems that Bruce's speech at Bannockburn and his slaying of Bowen are practically identical even in language with portions of an early Scots translation of the old French romance of Alexander the Great. It is comforting that this discovery has been made by a Scotsman. The romance of the hero is of course older than Alexander. Mankind did not wait till his day for tales of adventure, witness the Odyssey, the Aetheste Robinsonade, Again, the Cyropedia is a romance of a hero's education, and it is only in comparatively modern times that it began to pass for history. Romances portraying ideal types of character multiply with time. Cato was hardly dead before his party began to canonize him. Brutus, Cicero, and Fadius Gallus at once wrote Catus, and Caesar had to reply with an anti-Cato and set Hirtius to make another. But it was later, and in philosophy, that most of this work was done. Philostratus's life of Apollonius of Tyrana was undertaken at the command of an empress, Julia Augusta, because the life which she had wanted literary merit. Philostratus sends Apollonius everywhere with some errors of geography, and sets him to perform miracles and expose devils with no regard for sense or fact. Now he catches a satyr asleep, now he shows a young man that his sweetheart is an empusa, intent on sucking his blood. It has been supposed that this work was meant to counteract the Gospels, but it soars away from them into a rarefied atmosphere of new Pythagoreanism, of mystic asceticism. The real contrast is with Socrates, Chasang says, not with Christ. 
Porphyry, in a somewhat similar spirit, wrote A Life of Pythagoras, and even in the life of his own master, Plotinus, sees fit, alongside of lists of his works, to introduce interviews with demons and gods called up by magic. This characteristic introduction of the magical into biography must be remembered when we are dealing with the lives of the saints, for it is not peculiar to them. Indeed, it is often less noticeable there than in pagan works. In some measure we may take Lucian's story of the ingenious false prophet Alexander and his god reincarnated in a snake as a reaction at once against magic and prophet. The romance of travel was pushed beyond all reason till things beyond Thule, a reference to the romance of Antonius Diogenes, was a byword for an impossible story. Ethiopians and Indians, and especially Brahmins, were the stock in trade of this kind of writing, along with big-eared men, dog-headed and one-eyed men, who reappeared in Sir John Mandeville. Lucian, in his True History, parodies this class of fiction, naming as his great models Stesius and Iambulus, and above all Homer's Odysseus, who is their leader and teacher in this nonsense. Anticipating Jules Verne, he goes from the earth to the moon and travels probably 10,000 leagues under the sea, perhaps with more comfort than the Frenchman's heroes, for he finds a large island inside a big fish. Incidentally, he reaches the islands of the blessed and meets Homer, who writes him a poem, and Odysseus, who gives him a message for Calypso. There is not, as in Gulliver, any special satire against society in this piece, except the general satire against the established practice of lying that marks philosophers no doubt a fling at the utopia makers. Our fourth class is the love tale. Road has traced its antecedents to local legends and popular tales, treated and modified by the writers of Alexandria, and preserving much of their style, not without traces of oriental influences. Such tales of Miletus were early popular and early won a bad name. It is notorious how many of them were found in the loot of Crassus's camp by the Parthenians in 53 B.C., they continued to be written anew for many centuries, sometimes in the form of letters. One of them is readily accessible to the English reader in Pericles, Prince of Tyre. This was originally a Greek romance written perhaps in the 3rd century, worked over by a Latin perhaps in the 7th, who confused it, adding the story of King Antiochus, which has singularly little connection with the rest, some more or less Christian reflections and some Latin riddles. It passed into the Gesta Romanorum and was done into English verse by Gower and incurred the censure of Chaucer. But certainly no word nay writeth he of Tilliquick and Sample of Canus that loved her own brother sinfully of switch cursed stories, I say, fie, or else of Tyro Apollonius of switch unkind abominations, nay, I would noon rehearse if that I may. Shakespeare turns Apollonius into Pericles, but holds fairly closely to the old tale's incidents. It is a strange feature about this class of tale that, while the episodes are often extremely indecent, the character of the heroine, sometimes by accident only, but generally of her set design, is kept stainlessly pure. She is invariably a beautiful doll who wakens the most unfortunate passions by her beauty. It may be that this preservation of her chastity survives from older days before the sophists and stylists took the romance in hand, days when it was a tale told among the common people with a preference for bourgeois virtue, which was foreign to the goddesses and princesses of legend. Nonetheless, serious people frowned on this class of books, and Julian forbade his priests to read them. Our fifth class, while still fiction, is of rather a different character. I group here anecdotes which swell into imaginary episodes of history for a purpose. Josephus quotes an old tale of a most friendly interview between Alexander the Great and the Jewish high priest, invented as a document to support national claims. Such devices were not unknown to the Romans, and later on were revived with great effects in the donation of Constantine and the false decretals. Of course, these are forgeries, but there are other productions surely meriting a less severe name. There is a great deal of Jewish apocalyptic writing, every book bearing the name of some great worthy of the past who did not write it. Their object was to justify the ways of God to men and to explain why good and evil fall to men, as it seems without distinction of vice and virtue, and above all, why the nation, God's chosen people, the righteous people, fared so ill. Enoch is made to prophesy and see into things invisible in order to encourage the writer's contemporaries to faith and courage. 
Antiquity was not very severe, as a rule, in the domain of criticism, and saw nothing morally questionable in attributing a document to a great name to secure its reaching its goal. The Book of Enoch had a wide influence not only on other similar literature, but on some of the New Testament writers. Among the heathen, poems reputed to be by Orpheus were circulated at a late date, and abundance of oracles were invented by Jew and Christian for the Sibyl, but as these are in verse, we perhaps need not further consider them. These, then, are our five classes. They are not mutually exclusive, for the Greek romance of love, as we have it today, has elements of the romance of travel and perhaps even of the utopia. Nor are they quite comprehensive enough, for it would be hard to set down in any one of them the Latin golden ass of Apuleius, and still harder the book of Petronius Arbiter. But after all, these are both avowedly medleys, and parts of his work Apuleius drew, he says, from Milesian tales. What of Cupid and Psyche? Where does it come? Myth, parable, or fairy tale? Which is it? Eventually, Greek romance and literature generally fell into the hands of sophists and rhetoricians. We may say this happened under Roman rule, recent discoveries showing that the erotic novel as we know it was already in full bloom in the first century. Rhetoric pervaded everything. Romances, poets, emperors, and fathers of the church are all tinged with it. The sermon of the Christian preacher was called by the same name as the declamation of the rhetorician, homilia, logos, and indeed was modelled after it. East and West, Roman and Greek, felt the effects of the rhetorical school. Synesius was a great admirer of Dio Chrysostom, the prince of rhetorical sophists, but he draws a distinction between his rhetorical and his political declamations. In the former, he says, Dio holds his head high and gives himself airs, like the peacock turning round to look at itself. He seems delighted with the charms of his discourse, as if this were his only aim, as if his end were grace of expression. This attitude of the peacock... Acute self-consciousness tends to spoil every production of the rhetorical schools, including the novels. Style is the first thing, and often the last, style so overdone that in the end it is deplorable. Fine phrases are stolen, pretty words hunted up, scraps of poetry culled from every age of poets, and all are woven together into a patchwork of preciousness. The main thing is to display the author's cleverness, and he tries to do this by descriptions of every kind. Yet while they were pilfering from Homer's vocabulary, the sophists never learnt why he did not describe Helen, for example, though her beauty was the base of his whole story. Physical beauty is the outcome of a combination of a large number of elements, all taking effect at once. The painter can therefore reproduce it, but not the poet. The poet can make a list of some or all of these elements, but he cannot coordinate them, nor can the rhetorician do more. His list can no more produce the effect of beauty than a series of labelled and stoppered bottles full of simple chemical substances ranged along a laboratory shelf can be said to represent some highly complicated compound of them all. If it is not a human being, it is a scene, a landscape that is described, or the picture of one. Thus Achilles Tatius begins his novel with a description of a picture of Europa and the bull. Europa's the picture, the Phoenicians the sea, Sidon's the land, on the land a meadow, and a troop of maidens. In the sea a bull was swimming, and on his back a fair maiden sat, sailing to Crete on the bull. With many flowers bloomed the meadow, and with them was mingled an array, phalanx, of trees and shrubs. Close together the trees intermingled their leaves, the branches joined their leaves, and thus the thickness of the leaves was to the flowers a roof. The artist had painted under the leaves the shade also, and the sun gently strayed over the meadow in patches, so far as the painter opened the overarching of the leafy foliage. The whole meadow and enclosure walled about. The beds of flowers grew in rows under the leaves of the shrubs, narcissus and roses and myrtles. And water ran through the midst of the meadow in the picture, some springing up from the earth below, some poured about the flowers and the shrubs. And a field waterer had been painted with a mattock in his hand, bending over one ditch and opening a way for the water. This figure is borrowed from Homer, Iliad 21-257, as a number of verbal coincidences plainly show, and he adds the one touch of life to the picture. For the rest, it is conventional, and so it always is. The criticism, Bernardine de Saint-Pierre, passed on travellers' descriptions, will do for those of the sophists. They are as barren as a geographical map. Hindustan resembles Europe. There is no character in it. 
Compare Atlanta's cave in the Arcadian bush. There is, of course, ivy about it, and ivy in the trees, crocuses in the soft and deep grass, and hyacinth and many other hues of flowers, not only as a feast for the vision, but their fragrance seized the air around, etc. Laurels there were many, and vines growing before the cave showed the labor of Atlanta. Continuous and never-failing waters, fair to see and cold, to judge by touch and learn by taste, flowed plenteous and ungrudging, convenient for the watering of the trees, and the spot was full of charms, making an austere and modest chamber for the maiden. Compare again a livelier document, Senecius's letter to his brother, Epistle 114, for another scene of flower and tree. Sometimes the novelists will adorn their stories with descriptions of natural marvels. Here is Achilles Tatius on the hippopotamus, a most appropriate animal for a love tale, but it comes in very gracefully. Charmides, a military officer, invites Hero and Heroine, who have just been rescued by him, to inspect the beast newly killed by his men. The horse of the Nile, the Egyptians call it, and it is a horse, as its name implies, in regard to belly and feet, except that it splits the hoof. In size about the biggest ox, its tail short and bare of hair, like the rest of its body also. Its head round, not small, its cheeks like a horse's, its nostril gaping wide and breathing fiery smoke as from a fount of fire, its chin broad as its cheek, its mouth opens back to its eyebrows. Its canine teeth are curved in shape and place like a horse's, but three times the size. 4. 2. The reader should now have no difficulty in recognizing the beast. From the hippopotamus, it is but a step to the elephant, 200, 4, and 5, and not very far to the crocodile, 119. It will be seen that the luckless lovers are in Egypt, an almost inevitable country for lovers. Sometimes the novelist prefers magic to nature. In the love tales, the magic is generally slight, an oracle perhaps at most, but in lives of holy men there is plenty of it, demons, enchantments, transportations, and so forth. How far Apuleius's golden ass begins by being gently satirical only, I cannot say, but it does not so end. The whole basis of the tale is magic, and if in some of the episodes the author is making fun of it, he certainly had to stand his trial on a charge of using magic. The heathen revival of the second and third centuries was in fact largely based on magic, a point not always realized. If comment be needed, Lucian's amusing dialogue called The Lover of Falsehood may be read, a beautiful collection of ghost stories and enchantments. If Lucian scoffed and the devout trembled, the rhetorician was cool and added magic to his other themes for decoration. Descriptions of emotions delight the school. Achilles, in particular, enjoys describing their psychology, explaining tears or the effect of anger on the feelings. Longus is less clever but more successful, if still rhetorical, and traces the gradual growth of love in Daphne and Chloe with great delicacy, according to St. Beauve, but perhaps to say this one must be devoted to Paul and Virginia. Summing up, then, we may say that the rhetorical novelist tries to capture us by his exhibitions of cleverness, his descriptions, his general brilliance, but he does not move us or convince us. The reason is that... After all, he is out of touch with life and reality. His scenes are unreal and conventional, never drawn from nature but from books. His figures are unreal too, dolls, puppets, automata. The hero and the heroine, the gentlemanly brigand, the too susceptible captain, the pirate, are all lifeless, none realized. They have no individuality, no distinctive character. Their only motive is what their creator calls love, which is too good a name for it. With every newcomer to the scene, the heroine is in fresh danger. But even with this one motive or incentive, no legitimate action ever takes place. There are no real consequences of anything. Everything is chance. Sometimes an oracle, sometimes a dream starts things, and then begins a wild series of mechanical adventures. Pirates, storms, robbers, slavery, separation, murder, never real murder, and everything to harass hero, heroine, and reader. One thing is always certain... What will happen next is beyond conjecture, but in the end it will not matter, for nothing ever comes of threatening danger except delay. It should not be so, but the fortuitous interference of providence, to quote Professor Mahaffey's Irish judge, is invariable, and hero and heroine are rescued for the next mishap. Once more, cries Xenophon's heroine, once more, pirates and sea, once more, am I our captive? Of course she is, and she may expect to lose her lover and follow him, or be pursued by him over land and sea, coming within a hair's breadth of meeting him, but never achieving it, till the last book, when, as Rhodes says, 
one is glad to find them accidentally meeting, so that the marionettes can be laid back in the box. End of Greek and Early Christian Novels, Part 1, by T. R. Glover. Greek and Early Christian Novels, Part 2, by T. R. Glover. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. One consequence in literature of this general failure to be true to reality is the decline of history. True, we have in Eusebius, Ammianus, and Socrates three admirable historians, judicious, thoughtful, and truthful, but perhaps the bad name of Rufinus is a better index of the feeling of the day. It is very interesting to see how Socrates, from the first, emphatically disclaims rhetoric. He will give no thought to pomp of diction. First part, one and three, and when, by and by, he finds out that Rufinus, instead of consulting evidence, has been guessing, he goes back over his work and remodels his own first two books to bring them into harmony with truth. Second part, one and three. Jerome himself accuses Rufinus of lying, of saying whatever comes into his mouth, quid quid in bucasem venerit, a much better phrase. This is exactly the mark of rhetorical history, carelessness of everything but effect. The anecdote triumphs over everything but the speech, for every great man in history becomes a declaimer. The great defect of the rhetoricians, says Chasang, is to make their heroes in their own image. Alexander the Great, Apollonius of Tyana, Pythagoras are drawn as the rhetorician thinks they should have been, very like himself. He inserts in their story anything that interests himself, or that he thinks telling. I have already alluded to Porphyry's life of his teacher Plotinus, which shows history degenerating into romance. The effects of this style of writing are far-reaching. That Christian writers should be influenced by their environment is not surprising. They are harshly judged sometimes in our days for faults they shared with heathen contemporaries, rather unjustly so, for the really remarkable thing is that they are on the whole so free comparatively from them, and after all they are known and read because they were so free. Everybody knows Tertullian's faults, and as they are not those of today, they attract attention. How many critics of Tertullian could give as good an account of Philostratus or Porphyry or even Apuleius? There is no comparison between the men. Tertullian has many faults of style which they have, but he is clean, he is serious, and he is truthful. There is no one so terribly in earnest as he, with his seriousness born of penitence, but he flashes with assonance, antithesis, and epigram to match the most flippant. But the writers with whom we are dealing are smaller men and more obscure. Yet they too, while reflecting their age, are marked by the seriousness of the new view of life. In the first place, the Christian novelists, if I may so call them, while they often show the same faults as the heathen, do not show them in such excess. Their pictures of life and society are still very apt to be conventional, and if not conventional, at least unreal. Their characters are often wooden, and their history is sadly to seek. But whether the reader count this for better or for worse, they have less of the rhetorical style, they are less self-conscious in their writing, less clever. They have fewer arts and do not attempt to fly so high. Secondly, they are more alive and more serious. They are conscious of new motives in life, of new inspiration, and it is these that as a rule have led them to write, and their writing reflects the quickened spirit. In almost every kind of literature they challenged the heathen world. They have no new story of Troy, but they have a new tale of truth and Juvencus wrote about 330 his four books of evangelic history, a marvellous feat. He made a harmony of the Gospels in Latin hexameters, in a plain, honest style, wonderfully faithful to the original, yet not without some poetic quality, though the metre is a little monotonous. Apollinaris tried the same in Greek, but his work did not survive. But our theme is fiction. The romance of the hero is represented by a long list of false Gospels, some more or less dependent on the canonical four, but all tending to embellish or decorate them with fanciful incidents and other rhetorical devices. Acts of the Apostles are perhaps even more numerous, and these permit the interweaving of the romance of travel. Not many of them, but some have elements of the love tale. 
I do not know the date of the wondrous and marvelous history of the glorious acts of Philip the Apostle and Evangelist. It is only extant in Syriac and was probably first written in that tongue. It certainly deserves its name. Philip, in answer to his sea captain's despair, prays for a wind that shall take them from Caesarea to Carthage in a day, and it comes and incidentally hangs head downward from the mast a blaspheming Jewish passenger. The ship was flying and going over the water like an eagle in the air, and the Jew hanging by his great toes was very uncomfortable. Philip inquires, Now how dost thou view the matter? And the Jew's confession is so extensive that we feel either he or the historian has read the apologists on the Old Testament. Philip rejoiced at his conversion, and the penitent is released. Arrived at Carthage, Philip proceeds to find Satan, an Indian man, i.e. a black man, on a throne with a belt of two snakes and a garland of vipers, with eyes like coals of fire and belching flame from his mouth. He is overthrown by the sign of the cross, and Philip sets forth to preach. The Acts of Thomas is a very different work, having a clear purpose in its insistence on virginity and asceticism, a Gnostic book also written by a Syrian, and therefore perhaps outside our scope, though it is found in a Greek translation. We shall give more attention to an original composition in Greek on Greek models and of undisputed orthodoxy, the Acts of Xanthope and Polyxena. Another group of Christian romances, while connected with the tale of the hero, is perhaps rather to be classed with the utopias. The romance of hermit life begins perhaps with Antony and goes on with Paul and others, and there is this distinction between it and Alexander the Great, that it exhibits an ideal life which all men may follow. We may all be Antonys, and the writer indicates that we should if we knew what is good for us, but Alexander lies beyond us. Lastly, we may set down the apocalypses with their pictures of the other world in the same class with Ur the Armenian, though, as I have indicated, their descent from him is very doubtful. Here, too, we often find a special purpose besides the general moral drift which marks such works. Now that we have made our survey of pagan and Christian fiction, it will be well to concentrate our attention on one or two examples of each class. The pagans will be represented by Achilles Tatius because he is like most of the pagan novelists and Longus because he is unlike them. The Acts of Xanthope and Polyxena is a clear imitation of these by a Christian hand. The latter part of the Gospel of Nicodemus will illustrate romance attaching itself to the Gospel. The Apocalypse of Paul will show us a link in a great series of visions of hell and give us a hint of a great movement which was not merely pictured in the life of Antony but immensely promoted by it. The story of Clitophon and Leucope is told by Achilles Tatius in eight books. The date of its composition is uncertain. Rode puts it after the beginning of the third century and before the middle of the fourth. The tale is told by the hero to the author whom he meets in front of the picture of Europa and the bull, part of the description of which I have quoted. Clitophon, a young man of Tyre, it was designed by his father, should marry his half-sister, but he did not want to and instead fell in love with his cousin Leucope from Byzantium. He wins her love by sighs and other pretty manoeuvres, and a little chapter is devoted to their drinking from each other's cups, turn about by way of signalling kisses. Ere long, of course, for lovers must have adventures, they fly together and take a ship at Beratus for Alexandria. They meet a storm, a rhetorician's storm, and are shipwrecked, reaching safety at Pelusium, where they see some works of art carefully described in a temple. They are caught by robbers and separated. Clitophon's rescue comes first, and he has to look on helplessly while Leucope is made a human sacrifice, but he finds very soon it was a mere pantomime done with a collapsible dagger from a theatre. Then Charmides, the commander of the soldiers who rescued them, falls in love with Leucope, who resists him, but is rendered dramatically insane by a potion given by another lover. After some fighting between soldiers and natives, Clitophon gets her safely away, cured by another charm. She is kidnapped again, and from the deck of his ship in pursuit, Clitophon sees her head cut off. This time it is not a theatrical dagger, and a head is cut off, though of course not Leucope's, as it turns out afterwards. He now returns to Alexandria, and a rich widow falls in love with him and carries him back to Ephesus. There he finds Leucope a slave, and terrible complications follow. The widow's husband reappears, for he had not, after all, been drowned, and he strongly disapproves of Clitophon. 
Maliti, the lady no longer a widow, finds out about Lukapi, who is assailed first by a fellow slave and then by Maliti's husband, but is saved from both. Prison and process, escapes and entanglements now jostle one another in quick succession for hero and heroine, but all characters are cleared by the ordeal of a miraculous fountain which always drowns the perjurer. Maliti distinctly gets the better of heaven by an ingeniously worded oath. Clitophon and Leucope go to Byzantium and are married, and the half-sister at Tyre is also married to a man who early in the story had kidnapped her under the impression that she was Leucope. What more? Descriptions of nature, as we have seen, and discussions of psychology, excursions into mythology, geography, and antiquarianism, an account of the Nile, a picture of Alexandria, speeches, letters, and all sorts of things embellish the tale, but hardly save it from being tiresome. Achilles does not trouble heaven very much, but trusts to fortune, giving him all the confusion he wants. Yet at one time he has recourse to a dream to stop Clitophon's marriage. And after all, when once the half-sister was kidnapped, everything was clear, and there need have been no elopement. But in that case there would have been no tale. Sudas says this man Achilles became a Christian and was made a bishop, but critics find in this a mere imitation of the similar tale about Heliodorus. Socrates says, people said that Heliodorus, bishop of Trica, was the author of the romance Ethiopica. It was a mere story which he quoted. Heliodorus says of himself that he was a Phoenician of Emesa, a descendant of the sun, and Road rather associates him with the revival of Neo-Pythagoreanism and the Syrian dynasty in the early years of the third century. Neither he nor Achilles is to be credited with a bishopric. The romance of Longus depends for its charm on quiet country life with no foreign adventures. True, there are one or two raids upon the peaceful scene, but heaven interposes some miracles and all is restored to be as it was. I do not know that the story would be affected, except perhaps in length by the complete omission of these episodes. It is a tale of two children, a boy and a girl, exposed as infants by their parents and miraculously preserved. This does not seem a very probable beginning for a tale, but it is more probable than it seems. One of the things that distinguished Christians from pagans was, according to the apologists, that they did not expose their children. Tertullian tells a horrible story of one actual case among the heathens. The reason in Longus's case for using this artifice was to give a conclusion of wealth and splendor to his tale, and to introduce a momentary doubt as to whether Daphnis, recognized as a rich man's son, would still care to marry Chloe. Dio Chrysostom, in his Euboicus, draws a picture of the happy life and contented poverty of two families of hunters in the wild lands of Euboi. But for a romance, one wants a more triumphant ending than for a political or social parable. The chief interest of Longus's novel lies in the idealization of the love of a boy and girl growing up together among goats and sheep in the happy worship of Pan and the nymphs. There are points that strike a modern reader oddly, as, for instance, Chloe's failure to remark the existence of such a thing as an echo till she was about fourteen. They both are too surprisingly innocent to be convincing, and here it is that Longus shows himself unmistakably of the family of Priapus by an exaggerated and impossible naivete. Longus is at last disgusting, where Saint-Pierre is beautiful. But if we take episodes out of the story and concentrate attention on them, as some of its admirers have done, we get a more happy impression. For like the other Greek novels, this one breaks up easily into a series of more or less independent scenes, which could be rearranged, added to, or lessened without material import. These better scenes, then, taken by themselves, are pleasing, but they are not simple, and though nearer nature than anything else in Greek fiction, it is nature drawn by a rhetorician, a man of more taste than his class, but still a rhetorician. Chloe is first to fall in love, as is Virginia in the French novel. She sees Daphnis bathing. Quote, what it was she suffered, she knew not, being but a young maid, bred in the country, and one that had never heard tell of the name of love. Sickness seized her soul, and she was not mistress of her eyes, and much she talked of Daphnis. Her meat she neglected, by night she waked, her flock she despised. Now she would laugh, now she would weep, then she would sleep, then she would start up. Her face was pale, and again it flamed with a blush, nor would a cow stung by a gadfly behave as Chloe did. 
end quote. Daphnis and a shepherd boy called Dorco dispute as to their comparative charms, and Chloe awards the prize, a kiss, to Daphnis, who falls in love with her and does not understand it. Here is his soliloquy. Quote, what can it be that Chloe's kiss does to me, lips softer than roses and a mouth sweeter than honeycombs, but the kiss than the sting of a bee more painful? Oft have I kissed kids, oft have I kissed puppies newly born, and the calf Dorco gave me. But this kiss is strange. My breath leaps, my heart pants, my soul melts, and yet I would kiss again. O oh, evil victory, O oh, strange disease, whose very name I know not. Then did Chloe taste of drugs ere she kissed me. How then did she not die? How do the nightingales sing, and my pipe is silent? How do the kids leap, and I still sit? How do the flowers bloom, and I weave no garlands? But the violets and the hyacinth flower, and Daphnis withers. Then will Dorco seem more comely than I. End quote. All this is artificial in the highest degree, though thoroughly rhetorical in every way. It is literary rather than spontaneous. The writer has read Theocritus and thinks of him, but... His work is not Theocritian, for he has been infected with the arts of the school. Here is the series of little sentences, word by word, exactly balancing, antithesis, apostrophe, and abundance of echoes and false conceits. Let us try something better. Winter came on, and there was no more pasture in the open, but all the country folk were kept about their homes and farm buildings, so Daphnis and Chloe could not meet. Chloe was being taught to dress wool and use the spindle, but Daphnis had no such work to do and devised a plan to see her. Quote, before the farmhouse of Dryas, her foster father, and just under it were two tall myrtles and ivy upon them. The myrtles were near each other, the ivy between them, so that reaching its tendrils to both like a vine, it made an appearance of a cave with the alternating leaves, and clusters of ivy berries, many and big as grapes, hung from the branches. Round about them was a great swarm of winter birds, for food without failed, many a blackbird, many a thrush, and wood pigeons, and starlings, and all other birds that eat ivy berries. On pretense of catching these birds, Daphnis set forth after filling his wallet with honey cakes, and taking bird lime and snares as a pledge of his purpose. The distance was not much more than ten stadies, but the snow not yet melted gave him much trouble. But to love, after all, everything is an open way, fire and water and Scythian snow. He comes then at a run to the farm, and shaking the snow from his legs, he set his snares and the bird lime he smeared on many twigs, and then sat down thinking of the birds and of Chloe. But birds came in large numbers, and were caught in plenty, so that he had no end of trouble in gathering them, killing them, and plucking their feathers. But from the farm no one came out, not man, not woman, not domestic fowl, but all abode lying by the fire within, so that Daphnis was in sore straits, thinking they were not lucky birds that gave him the omen to come. A pun, uc ep asius orinisi, and he tried to gather courage to enter the doors with some excuse and sought in himself what would be most plausible. I came to get fire, but were there not neighbours but a stayed away? I came to ask loaves, but the wallet is full of food. I need wine, but it was yesterday or the day before you gathered the vintage. A wolf was chasing me, but where are the wolf's footprints? I came to catch birds. Why then, when you have caught them, do you not go away? I wish to see Chloe, but who confesses this to the father and mother of a maiden? Every approach is vain, none of these but is suspicious. Better then be silent. I shall see Chloe in the spring, since it is not fated, so it seems... I should see her in the winter. With some such thought in his mind, he gathered up what he had caught and started to go, and, as if love pitied him, this befell. Dryas and his household were sitting at table, meat had been divided, loaves were set before them, wine was being mixed. One of the sheep-dogs, watching for an unguarded moment, snatched a piece of meat and fled through the doors. In vexation, Dryas, for it was his portion, caught up a stick and ran after him, tracking him like another dog, and as he pursued and came to the ivy, he seized Daphnis with his booty on his shoulders and ready to depart. Meat and dog, at once he forgot, and with a great shout, Welcome, my boy, he began to embrace and kiss him, and took him by the hand and led him in. When they saw each other, they all but fell to the earth, 
but making an effort to stand upright, they greeted and kissed each other, and this was, as it were, a prop that they should not fall. So Daphnis, after giving up hope, had a kiss and had Chloe, and sat near the fire and put from his shoulders on to the table his burden of wood pigeons and blackbirds, and told how he grew weary of staying at home and went out to catch them, and how he took some of them with snares and some with bird lime in their greed for the myrtles and the ivy. And they praised his energy and bade him eat of what the dog had left them. And they bade Chloe pour wine to drink, and she in gladness gave to the others and to Daphnis after the others, for she pretended to be angry because he came and was about to go without seeing her. However, before giving it to him, she took a sip and then gave to him. And he, though thirsty, drank slowly to have a longer pleasure by delay. End quote. The author's failure is a moral one. At the end comes the general recognition, and no one seems to attach much blame to the parents who cast out their children because they had too many or were ill off for money. The general ignoring of evil of a gross kind shows how the rhetorician had fallen into that stage where evil results in insensibility. Let us now turn to Xanthropy and Polyxena, a book I incline to attribute to the 4th century, though the first scholar to print it, Dr. M. R. James, says it may belong to the 3rd. The story of the victory by the cross's aid seems to suggest Constantine. It is the insigne lignum of triumph, the careful adhesion to the straight and true faith and the various theological expressions of it, though they do not refer to Arianism and its distinctive doctrines, yet suggest the Great Council. Some of the phrases describing other things also point to the later date. The tale, as Dr. James shows, borrows hints from a number of others, but it hangs together very well, if we once grant that each of the heroines has her own story. We do not hear of Polyxena till chapter 22, and then we hear little more of Xanthropy. There is about both parts a bright air, a spirit of cheerfulness and faith. The author cannot forget the goodness of God, his mercy and his eagerness for the redemption of the sinful, his providence and care for those who serve him. This last quite replaces the fortune of the heathen novelists. At every stage the right man appears, not by accident, but by divine instruction and guidance. The writer is like his heroine's anthropy. I wish to be silent, but I am compelled to speak, for one within me is fire and sweetness to me. And now for a short sketch of the book. Probus is an official in Spain, a friend of Nero, though his name suggests the fourth century, an honourable man very fond of his wife Xanthope, though apt to be irritated by her abstraction and her sometimes rather hysterical piety. His wife, an anima naturalita cristiana, hears of Paul's preaching in Rome and longs for more knowledge of the gospel. She is much disturbed to her husband's alarm, but after uttering some prayers, a little too nearly Christian for a heathen, she sees and hears Paul. The apostle is their guest and is heard joyfully by his hostess, who has already the son of righteousness in her heart. The host, after a while, is worried by the crowds who come to hear Paul, and, indignant at my house being made an inn, turns him out and locks up his wife. She bribes the porter, visits Paul, and is baptized, and on her return home has a vision of Christ preceded by a cross on the east wall of the room. But when she saw his face, she hid her own, crying, Hide thyself, O master, from my bodily eyes, and enlighten my understanding. He vanishes, and overcome by a speechless gratitude, she faints the results of her fasting and watching and the vision. Meanwhile, Probus has had a dream which turns him toward the faith, and he and his wife visit Paul, Probus being greatly impressed by her humility, which was rather a new virtue in her. He is baptized, and after a curious incident in which Xanthope, in a rage, stabs a supposed dancer, really a devil, in the face, their story gives place to that of her sister Polyxena. The story of Polyxena much more closely resembles those of the Greek novels. Probus's house is entered by a man by means of magical arts, and Polyxena is kidnapped. The captor puts her on shipboard to sail to Babylonia. On the way they pass a ship taking St. Peter to Rome to overthrow Simon Magus, a fragment of an old story, and Peter, by divine warning, is bidden pray for a soul in distress on the ship from the west, i.e. Polyxena. They land in Greece and meet Philip the Evangelist, who rescues Polyxena and entrusts her to a disciple. 
The kidnapper gets an army of 8,000 men from a friend of his, a Count Gomez, to recapture her. She flies, and her late host's 30 servants raise the sign of the cross, slay 5,000 of the Count's army, and return hymning God. Polyzena takes refuge in a lioness's den, a hollow tree in a dense forest. The lioness, however, is friendly and guides her to a high road where St. Andrew finds her. She asks for baptism, and at the water they meet a Jewish girl, Rebecca, and both maidens are at once baptized. For the lioness reappears, and in a human voice bids instruct them in the true faith. Andrew leaves them, for it was not revealed to him that he should go with them. A man driving asses, who has sold his property and makes a mission of feeding the poor, of course a Christian, undertakes to bring the two girls to the seashore and aid them to escape to Spain. But they are carried off by a magistrate. The ass driver tells Philip, who trusts that heaven will preserve them. Once more, Rebecca is seized and laments, like Xenophon's heroine, Again am I a captive. The magistrate's son is a Christian, converted by Paul and Thecla at Antioch, and he befriends Polyzena. In a rage, his father exposes him and her to a lioness, who proves to be the old friend. This causes a great sensation, and the magistrate is converted. Onesimus, the teller of the tale, appears and preaches, and everyone there is converted. Polyzena and Rebecca are sent safely back to Spain, where they are welcomed warmly by Xanthope, Probus, and Paul. The kidnapper reappears also, but he too is converted, so all ends happily. It will be recognized that there is much here very like the Greek novel, kidnappings, surprising deliverances, magic, and the wonderful lioness. The last suggests Androcles, but is probably a combination of the beasts that will not destroy Thecla in the Acts of Paul and Thecla, and the speaking ass descended from Balaam's in the Acts of Thomas. There is, however, a clear difference between this Christian work and the heathen models, for the heroine's virginity is the expression of a definite faith and service, and also there is nothing in the tale that could be called foul, as there is in every or nearly every Greek novel. In all probability, the book was designed to supplant such stories. It was not the first Christian novel to borrow a framework from the enemy. The Clementine homilies lie outside our present scope, but a word or two may be given them. They form one of the most interesting books of early Christianity, for they are, in reality, an early attack on Paulinism. And Bauer and his school have tried to find in them a true presentation of Christianity properly so called. Peter is their hero, and Clement is, one may say, his squire, and together they hunt down Simon Magus and other heathen antagonists. To give the story a flavor of life, Clement is represented as in search of his family, who are all scattered by a series of accidents recalling the Greek novel, and who are all found again by the help of Peter and Providence. From Xanthope and Polyzena we pass to a work of more importance, a work of genius, It is now embedded in the so-called Gospel of Nicodemus, a 13th century title for a combination of two much older books, The Acts of Pilate and The Descent into Hell. The former is a rather tiresome expansion of the Gospel narrative of the crucifixion, resulting in the whitewashing of Pilate to some extent, and the latter is attached to it by a very simple device. Two of the dead who were raised from their graves in the commotion following the crucifixion are called on to give an account of what happened. Quote, they said to the chief priests, give us paper and ink and pen. They brought them, and sitting down, one of them wrote as follows, end quote. Here is given the second work, which I will quote in part, taking the Greek text of Philo. This story is dated somewhere about or a little after the year 400. Mori, followed by Renan, placing it between 405 and 420. Tischendorf puts it a good deal earlier. Trasang compares its opening to Virgil's. The quibus imperium est animarum umbraque silentes et chaos et flegeton loca nocte tacentia late sit mihi faus audita loqui sit numine vestro Pandere res alta terra et caligine mersas. Aeneid 6, 264. Quote, 
Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrection and life of the world, give us grace that we may tell of thy resurrection and the marvels thou didst work in Hades. We then were in Hades with all that have slept from the beginning, and in the hour of midnight into that darkness dawned, as it were, the light of the sun and shone, and we were all enlightened and saw one another. End quote. Adam and Isaiah recognize the light as prophesied, and then comes John, quote, an ascetic from the desert, end quote. Once more to be forerunner of Christ, Adam and Seth contribute their testimony, and, quote, the patriarchs and the prophets rejoiced greatly, end quote. Quote, and while they thus rejoiced, came Satan, heir of darkness, and saith to Hades, all devouring and insatiate, hear my words. A certain man of the race of the Jews, called Jesus, naming himself Son of God, he being in fact a man, through my aid the Jews crucified him. And now that he is dead, be thou ready, that we may hold him fast, for I know that he is a man, and I heard him say, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. He did me much evil in the world above when he lived among men, for wherever he found my servants he drove them out, and as many men as I made maimed, blind, lame, leprous, or any such thing, by a word alone he healed them. And when I had made many ready to be buried, these too he brought to life by a word. Then Hades saith, And is he so mighty as to do all this by a word? And how canst thou resist him if he is such? End quote. Hades doubts the wisdom of Satan's bringing him. Quote, and this I say to thee, by the darkness we have, that if thou bring him here, none of the dead will be left me. As thus Satan and Hades talked one with the other, there was a great voice as thunder that said, Open your gates, ye rulers, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting gates, and the king of glory shall come in. And when Hades heard, he saith to Satan, Go forth if thou canst, and withstand him. So Satan went out. Then saith Hades to his demons, Make fast well and strongly the gates of brass and the bars of iron, and hold my barriers, and watch, standing all of you erect, for if he enter here, woe shall overtake us. When they heard this, their forefathers all began to mock him. All devouring and insatiate Hades, open that the king of glory may come in. And when Hades heard the voice the second time, as if he knew not, he answered and said, Who is this king of glory? The angels of the Lord said, a lord strong and mighty, a lord mighty in war. And immediately, at this word, the gates of brass were broken, and the iron bars were shattered, and all the bounden dead were loosed from their bonds, and we with them. And the king of glory came in, as it were a man, and all the dark places of Hades were enlightened. End quote. Hades recognizes in the conqueror the Jesus who was nailed to the cross, and the arch-satrap Satan is bound in iron and delivered to Hades to be kept till the second coming, not without the taunts of Hades himself. Quote, the king of glory stretched forth his right hand and laid hold of our forefather Adam and raised him up. Then he turned, and to the rest he said, Come ye with me, all ye who have been slain by the tree of wood this man touched. For behold, again by the wood of the cross I raise you all up. And with this he put them forth. And our forefather Adam was filled with sweetness, and he said, I give thanks unto thy majesty, O Lord, that thou hast brought me up from the lowest Hades. So did all the prophets and the saints, and said, We give thee thanks, O Christ, the Saviour of the universe, that thou hast brought up our life from destruction. While thus they spake, the Saviour blessed Adam on the brow with the sign of the cross, and this he did to the patriarchs and prophets and martyrs and forefathers, and he took them and leapt forth from Hades. And as he went, the holy fathers followed and sang, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Alleluia! This is the glory of all the saints. And as he entered into paradise, holding our forefather Adam by the hand, he gave him and all the righteous to the archangel Michael. As they entered in at the door of paradise, there met them two old men, to whom the holy father said, Who are ye who saw not death, nor descended into Hades, but in your bodies and souls inhabit paradise? And one of them answered and said, I am Enoch, who pleased God and was translated by him, and this is Elijah the Tishbite, and we shall live till the end of the world, and then shall we be sent of God to resist Antichrist, and be slain by him, and after three days rise and be caught up to the clouds to meet the Lord. 
And as thus they spake, there came another, a mean man, bearing upon his shoulders a cross, to whom the Holy Father said, Who art thou that hast the look of a thief, and what the cross thou bearest on thy shoulders? He answered, I was, as you see, a thief and a robber in the world, and therefore for this the Jews delivered me to the death of the cross with our Lord Jesus Christ. As he hung on the cross, I saw the signs that befell, and I cried to him and said, Lord, when thou art king, forget me not. And immediately he said to me, Verily, verily, today I say unto thee, With me shalt thou be in paradise. So, bearing my cross, I came to paradise, and found the archangel Michael, and said to him, Our Lord Jesus, the crucified, sent me hither. Bring me in at the gate of Eden. And when the fiery sword saw the sign of the cross, it opened to me, and I came in. Then said the archangel to me, Wait a little, for there cometh Adam, the forefather of the race, with the just, that they too may enter in. And when I saw you, I came to meet you. When they heard this, the saints cried with a loud voice, Great is our Lord, and great is his might. All this we two brothers saw and heard. End quote. This story is not the creation of the fourth century, and perhaps even this rendering of it is older, but that it was in the minds of men is shown by the hymns of Ephraim the Syrian, and Prudentius, and of Synesius, if by nothing else. There is a vigor about this piece and an imagination which rise to higher levels than the Greek world dared now to attempt. And yet there is still to be felt in it that quiet happiness which Augustine recognized as the mark of the church. There is no exaggeration, no rhetoric, but the work is as simple as it is sublime. We pass now to a book intrinsically of less interest, but yet one which Dr. James says has left traces of its influence in nearly all the medieval apocalypses and even in Dante's Divina Commedia. Its own account of itself is this, quote, a certain man of repute dwelt in Tarsus in the house of the Holy Paul, in the consulship of the pious king Theodosius and Gratian the Clarissimus. In the Latin he is Synegius. And to him an angel of the Lord appeared, saying, Break down the foundation of this house, and take up what thou shalt find. And he thought it was a dream, but when the angel continued till a third vision, the man of repute was compelled to break down the foundation, and he dug and found a marble chest containing this apocalypse, etc. End quote. The historian Sosamon, 7, 19 and 34, can add to this, quote, The apocalypse of Paul the Apostle, as now circulated, though none of the ancients ever saw it, a great many monks praise. Some maintain this book was found in the present reign, for they say that by divine revelation in Tarsus of Sicilia, at the house of Paul, a marble chest was found under the earth, and the book was in it. When I asked about it, a Sicilian priest of the church in Tarsus said it was a lie. He was an old man, too, as his white hair showed, and he said he knew nothing of the kind occurred among them, and he would be astonished if it were not the invention of heretics. So much about that. End quote. Two things should be noted. A new discovery, especially if led to by some miracle, is a fairly safe index of a forgery. Sosamond's reference to the monks fits in well with the tone of the book. We may therefore conclude it was written in the reign of the younger Theodosius, and one of its objects was to help monarchism. The feigned Paul then tells how sun, moon, and sea appeal for leave to destroy sinful man, but God's patience protects the race for which he is to be praised, and especially at sunset. For then the angels come before God to report the works of mankind, and of them all those are most joyful and most bright, who say, quote, We come from those who have renounced the world and the things of the world for thy holy name's sake, who spend their lives in deserts and mountains and caves and dens of the earth, sleeping on the ground and fasting. Bid us be with them, end quote. Some come with sorrow, quote, from those who are called by thy name and serve sinful matter, end quote. By every man's deathbed stand angels, good and bad, and to the sinner the bad say, quote, Unhappy soul, look at thy flesh. Know whence thou comest, for thou must return to thy flesh on the day of resurrection to receive the reward of thy sins, end quote. An appalling picture of the soul's trial follows, when, after being confronted with the souls it has wronged, it is cast into outer darkness. Paul is now taken to the city of the just, meeting Enoch and other patriarchs and prophets, and seeing rivers of honey, milk, oil, and wine for the just, who in this world abjured the use of them and humbled themselves for God's sake. 
David too is seen, his face shining as the sun, while he holds in his hand psaltery and harp, and sweetly sings Alleluia till his voice fills the city. And what means Alleluia? In Hebrew, it is Thebel Marematha. In the Latin version, Theke Kat Marith Macha. Let us glorify him together. Paul now visits hell and sees the various torments of various sinners. There seems to be no descending scale of misery, but the tortures exist side by side. Let us only notice those who talked in church, and, for the sake of longest, women who destroyed their children, and lastly the priest, quote, who ate and drank and then served God, end quote, the bishop who judged unjustly and pitied neither widow nor orphan, and the deacon, quote, who ate and drank and then ministered to God, end quote. Paul weeps, and then, in response to his entreaty and Gabriel's, Respite on Sundays is granted to the wicked in hell. Now Paul visits paradise and receives the blessing of the Virgin and the lament of Moses for the people of Israel. He meets the three great prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, and Noah, who was a model of asceticism while he was building the ark. Then, with the appearance of Elijah and Enoch, the apocalypse abruptly ends in the middle of Elijah's address to Paul. This apocalypse is modelled in part on the much earlier apocalypse of Peter, with which it shows some close coincidences. It no doubt impressed the minds of some of its readers, for this kind of revelation seems always to be more or less popular, succeeding better in its descriptions of hell than of heaven, and thereby emphasising some obvious morals. Dr. James says, indeed, that we may owe some even of the present-day ideas of heaven and hell to the apocalypse of Peter, and in this case Paul has perhaps contributed to but the book is in any case far inferior to the one we treated before it and to the one that follows. So much about that. It has been demonstrated in recent years that The Life of Antony is a work of fiction. We need not here go over Weingarten's arguments, but when once his result is accepted, the book becomes much more intelligible. Of all books of the fourth century, it had the most immediate and widespread influence, which, though outgrown by now, lasted on to the Renaissance. It was fiction, as Uncle Tom's Cabin was fiction, and just as this American book, though perhaps not a work of the highest art, and certainly denounced in no measured terms by people of the slaveholding states as a fabric of lies, yet swept America and England, and wakened the public conscience, contributed to the freedom of the Negro. So the life of Antony came at the right moment, and roused the hearts of good men and women to a sense of the possibilities of a life surrendered to God, and dependent on His grace." There was, in the fourth century, a great feeling of dissatisfaction with the world and even with the church. Life was difficult, and the churches were not of the greatest possible aid. Then monarchism began to suggest itself in the minds of Christians as a way of escape from an evil world and of approach to God. The movement was immensely helped by this Life of Antony, a book which displays the triumphs which a simple unlettered monk, trusting in the grace of God, wins over evil in every form. It is hardly a work of art, it is in some places a little tedious, it is often very impossible and sometimes even absurd. Yet it succeeded and deserved to succeed. It was constructed with some thought, if not of the finest. More than one Puritan movement had been unfortunately wrecked because its leaders quarrelled with the authorities of the church. Our author is careful to make Anthony most respectful to bishop and presbyter. Chapter 67 yielding precedence to every cleric. Again, he wrote in the thick of the fight with Arianism, and between this heresy and monarchism there was a mutual hatred. So Antony is exhibited to us as going to Alexandria, and there, though an uneducated Copt who could not speak Greek, frustrating an Arian with tremendous effect. And more, the battle was not yet over, and Antony is represented as already dead, yet before he died he prophesied the troubles which the church is even now enduring, and from which he foresaw her triumphant emergence. The book is Puritan. Antony was a mere layman, and for long years he neither went to church nor saw priest, nor took sacrament, and yet lived in close contact with heaven. His ambition was, like that of Francis of Assisi, to follow the Saviour and live a life of evangelic poverty, Matthew 19.21. Indeed, to understand him, one must understand Francis, the real Francis, as Monsieur Saboteur draws him. He had no need of books. To him, as to Francis, it was given 
to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but unto others in parables. Like nearly everyone else, our author believed in devils, but not as they did. For one great part of Antony's work is to prove finally that the devil is the most futile of beings. The troops of hell may play all their pranks as they please, but at the sign of the cross they vanish. Quote, for the Lord worked with him, he who wore flesh for us, and gave to the body the victory over the devil, so that, of those who strive in deed, every one may say, Yet not I, but the grace of God that is in me. End quote. Chapter 5 Once the devils flogged him, but he prayed. Quote, After his prayer he said with a loud voice, Here am I, Antony, I fly not from your blows, for though add ye more also, nothing shall separate me from the love of Christ. And then he sang, Though an host should encamp against me, my heart will not fear. End quote. So the enemy for the time left him. Thus the effect of the book was distinctly to lessen and not to increase the attention paid to devils and demons. Antony is made to deliver a long homily, chapters 16 to 43, about them, explaining what they seem to do on the lines followed long ago by Apuleius and Tertullian and emphasizing their insignificance. Of course he wrought miracles and was generally benevolent and helpful. Not even the notice of the emperor elated him. In fact, every virtue the writer could think of he gave him. To one point I should like to call attention. The author gives Antony that peculiar and happy expression we associate today with a strong and active belief in the doctrine of grace. Quote, From the joy of his soul, his face too was bright. He was never disturbed, for his soul was at peace. He was never gloomy, for his mind rejoiced. End quote. Chapter 67 It should not be hard to understand the influence of this book. It was widely read and imitated. Jerome's Life of Paul is a copy of it, a wretched, rhetorical, soulless imitation of a great book. Very soon it was actually attributed to Athanasius, who had the credit of it till Weingarten reclaimed it for its anonymous author. Of its effect on thoughtful people we have a striking illustration in St. Augustine, he tells us he had reached a more or less satisfactory solution of his doubts, and now, quote, desired to be not more certain about thee, but more stable in thee, end quote, Confessions 8.1.1. And while he hesitated to commit himself to the Christian life as he now saw it should be, he heard the story of Antony for the first time. He was profoundly moved by the contrast between this ignorant man's achievement of holiness and the low level with which he himself, for all his learning, was content. Then, resolving to try a sorus biblica, suggested by the episode of Antony hearing the text, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell all that thou hast, and give to the poor, and come follow me. He opened at the text in Romans, which struck home. The great point to notice here is that the essence of the book is that doctrine which Augustine, by his own experience, was being led to make the center of his faith and teaching the doctrine of grace. Here ends our study of the novels. In their own way, they reflect their age, the over-elaboration and sterility of style, the failure of civic ideals, the growing individualism, and something of the new life still struggling for expression in the church. End of Greek and Early Christian Novels, Part 2, by T. R. Glover. The Phoenix, attributed to Lactantius. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. There is a happy spot retired in the first east, where the great gate of the eternal pole lies open. It is not, however, situated near to his rising in summer or in winter, but where the sun pours the day from his vernal chariot. There a plain spreads its open tracts, nor does any mound rise, nor hollow valley open itself. But through twice six ells that place rises above the mountains, whose tops are thought to be lofty among us. Here is the grove of the sun, a wood stands planted with many a tree, blooming with the honour of perpetual foliage. When the pole had blazed with the fires of Phaethon, that place was uninjured by the flames, and when the deluge had immersed the world in waves, it rose above the waters of Deucalion. No enfeebling diseases, no sickly old age, nor cruel death, nor harsh fear approaches hither, nor a dreadful crime, nor mad desire of riches, 
nor Mars, nor fury burning with the love of slaughter. Bitter grief is absent, and want, clothed in rags, and sleepless cares and violent hunger. No tempest rages there, nor dreadful violence of the wind, nor does the hoar-frost cover the earth with cold dew. No cloud extends its fleecy covering above the plains, nor does the turbid moisture of water fall from on high, but there is a fountain in the middle, which they call by the name of Living. It is clear, gentle, and abounding with sweet waters, which, bursting forth once during the space of each month, twelve times irrigates all the groves with waters. Here a species of tree, rising with lofty stem, bears mellow fruits not about to fall on the ground. This grove, these woods, a single bird, the phoenix, inhabits. Single, but it lives reproduced by its own death. It obeys and submits to Phoebus, a remarkable attendant. Its parent, nature, has given it to possess this office. When, at its first rising, the saffron morn grows red, when it puts to flight the stars with its rosy light, thrice and four times she plunges her body into the sacred waves, thrice and four times she sips water from the living stream. She is raised aloft and takes her seat on the highest top of the lofty tree, which alone looks down upon the whole grove. And, turning herself to the fresh risings of the nascent Phoebus, she awaits his rays and rising beam. And when the sun has thrown back the threshold of the shining gate, and the light gleam of the first light has shone forth, she begins to pour strains of sacred song, and to hail the new light with wondrous voice, which neither the notes of the nightingale nor the flute of the muses can equal with Kyrian strains. But neither is it thought that the dying swan can imitate it, nor the tuneful strings of the lyre of Mercury. After that Phoebus has brought back his horses to the open heaven, and continually advancing has displayed his whole orb, she applauds with thrice repeated flapping of her wings, and having thrice adored, the fire-bearing head is silent. And she also distinguishes the swift hours by sounds not liable to error by day and night, an overseer of the groves, a venerable priestess of the woods, and alone admitted to thy secrets, O Phoebus. And when she has now accomplished the thousand years of her life, and length of days has rendered her burdensome, in order that she may renew the age which has glided by, the fates pressing her, she flees from the beloved couch of the accustomed grove. And when she has left the sacred places through a desire of being born again, then she seeks this world where death reigns. Full of years, she directs her swift flight into Syria, to which Venus herself has given the name of Venus and through trackless deserts she seeks the retired groves in the place where a remote wood lies concealed through the glens. Then she chooses a lofty palm with top reaching to the heavens, which has the pleasing name of Phoenix from the bird, and where no hurtful living creature can break through or slimy serpent or any bird of prey. Then Aeolus shuts in the winds in hanging caverns, lest they should injure the bright air with their blasts, or lest a cloud collected by the south wind through the empty sky should remove the rays of the sun and be a hindrance to the bird. Afterwards she builds for herself either a nest or a tomb, for she perishes that she may live, yet she produces herself. Hence she collects juices and odors which the Assyrian gathers from the rich wood, which the wealthy Arabian gathers, which either the Pygmean nations or India crops, or the Sabaean land produces from its soft bosom. Hence she heaps together cinnamon and the odour of the far-scented amamum and balsams with mixed leaves. Neither the twig of the mild cassia nor of the fragrant acanthus is absent, nor the tears and rich drop of frankincense. To these she adds tender ears of flourishing spikenard and joins the two pleasing pastures of myrrh. Immediately she places her body about to be changed on the strewed nest, and her quiet limbs on such a couch. Then, with her mouth, she scatters juices around and upon her limbs, about to die with her own funeral rites. Then, amidst various odors, she yields up her life, nor fears the faith of so great a deposit. In the meantime, her body, destroyed by death, which proves the source of life, is hot, and the heat itself produces a flame, and it conceives fire afar off from the light of heaven. It blazes and is dissolved into burnt ashes." 
and these ashes, collected in death, it fuses, as it were, into a mass, and has an effect resembling seed. From this an animal is said to arise without limbs, but the worm is said to be of a milky colour. It suddenly increases vastly with an imperfectly formed body, and collects itself into the appearance of a well-rounded egg. After this it is formed again, such as its figure was before, and the phoenix, having burst her shell, shoots forth, even as caterpillars in the fields, when they are fastened by a thread to a stone, are wont to be changed into a butterfly. No food is appointed for her in our world, nor does anyone make it his business to feed her while unfledged. She sips the delicate ambrosial dews of heavenly nectar which have fallen from the star-bearing pole. She gathers these, with these the bird is nourished in the midst of odours until she bears a natural form. But when she begins to flourish with early youth, she flies forth, now about to return to her native abode. Previously, however, she encloses in an ointment of balsam and in myrrh and dissolved frankincense all the remains of her own body and the bones or ashes and relics of herself and with pious mouth brings it into a round form and carries this with her feet, she goes to the rising of the sun, and tarrying at the altar, she draws it forth in the sacred temple. She shows and presents herself an object of admiration to the beholder. Such great beauty is there, such great honour abounds. In the first place, her colour is like that brilliancy of that which the seeds of the pomegranate, when ripe, take under the smooth rind. Such colour as is contained in the leaves which the poppy produces in the fields, when Flora spreads her garments beneath the blushing sky, her shoulders and beautiful breasts shine with this covering. With this her head, with this her neck, and the upper parts of her back shine. And her tail is extended, varied with yellow metal, in the spots of which mingled purple blushes. Between her wings there is a bright mark above, as Triss on high is wont to paint a cloud from above. She gleams resplendent with a mingling of the green emerald, and a shining beak of pure horn opens itself. Her eyes are large, you might believe that they were two jacinths, from the middle of which a bright flame shines. An irradiated crown is fitted to the whole of her head, resembling on high the glory of the head of Phoebus. Scales cover her thighs, spangled with yellow metal, but a rosy colour paints her claws with honour. Her form is seen to blend the figure of the peacock with that of the painted bird of Phasus, the winged creature which is produced in the lands of the Arabians, whether it be beast or bird, can scarcely equal her magnitude. She is not, however, slow, as birds which through the greatness of their body have sluggish motions and a very heavy weight, but she is light and swift, full of royal beauty. Such she always shows herself in the sight of men. Egypt comes hither to such a wondrous sight, and the exulting crowd salutes the rare bird, Immediately they carve her image on the consecrated marble and mark both the occurrence and the day with a new title. Birds of every kind assemble together. None is mindful of prey, none of fear. Attended by a chorus of birds, she flies through the heaven, and a crowd accompanies her, exulting in the pious duty. But when she has arrived at the regions of pure ether, she presently returns. Afterwards she is concealed in her own regions. But, O oh, bird of happy lot and fate, to whom the god himself granted to be born from herself, whether it be female or male, or neither or both, happy she who enters into no compacts of Venus. Death is Venus to her, her only pleasure is in death. That she may be born, she desires previously to die. She is an offspring to herself, her own father and heir, her own nurse, and always a foster child to herself. She is herself indeed, but not the same, since she is herself and not herself, having gained eternal life by the blessing of death. End of the Phoenix, attributed to Lactantius. Fragments of the Epistles of Alexander by Alexander of Jerusalem This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fragments of the Epistles of Alexander, Bishop first of Cappadocia and then of Jerusalem, and Martyr. 
Alexander was at first bishop of a church in Cappadocia, but on his visiting Jerusalem he was appointed to the bishopric of the church there, while the previous bishop Narcissus was alive, in consequence of a vision which was believed to be divine. During the Decian persecution he was thrown into prison at Caesarea, and died there, A.D. 251. The only writings of his which we know are those from which the extracts are made. An Epistle to the People of Antioch Alexander, a servant and prisoner of Jesus Christ, sends greeting in the Lord to the blessed church of Antioch. Easy and light has the Lord made my bonds to me during the time of my imprisonment, since I have learned that in the providence of God, Asclepiades, who in regard to the right faith is most eminently qualified for the office, has undertaken the episcopate of your holy church of Antioch. And this epistle, my brethren and masters, I have sent by the hand of the blessed presbyter Clement, a man virtuous and well tried, whom ye know already and will know yet better, who also, coming here by the providence and supervision of the master, has strengthened and increased the church of the Lord. From an epistle to the Antinoites. Narcissus salutes you, who held the episcopate in this district before me, who is now also my colleague and rival in prayer for you, and who, having now attained to Eleucos, his hundred and tenth year, unites with me in exhorting you to be of one mind. From an epistle to Origen. For this, as thou knowest, was the will of God, that the friendship subsisting between us from our forefathers should be maintained unbroken, yea, rather, that it should increase in fervency and strength. For we are well acquainted with those blessed fathers who have trodden the course before us, and to whom we too shall soon go. Pantinus, namely that man verily blessed my master, and also the holy Clement, who was once my master and my benefactor, and all the rest who may be like them by whose means also I have come to know thee, my Lord and brother, who excellest all. From an epistle to Demetrius, bishop of Alexandria. And he, i.e. Demetrius, has added to his letter that this is a matter that was never heard of before, and has never been done now, namely that laymen should take part in public speaking, or milin, when there are bishops present but in this assertion he has departed evidently far from the truth by some means. For, indeed, wherever there are found persons capable of profiting the brethren, such persons are exhorted by the holy bishops to address the people. Such was the case at Laranda, where Evelpis was thus exhorted by Neon, and at Iconium Paulinus was thus exhorted by Celsus, and at Synada Theodorus also by Atticus, our blessed brethren. And it is probable that this is done in other places also, although we know not the fact. End of Fragments of the Epistles of Alexander by Alexander of Jerusalem Exhortation to Repentance by Cyprian of Carthage This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org that all sins may be forgiven him who has turned to God with his whole heart. In the 88th Psalm, If his children forsake my law, and walk not in my judgments, and keep not my commandments, I will visit their iniquities with a rod, and their sins with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not scatter away from them. Also in Isaiah, Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, When thou shalt turn and mourn, then... Thou shalt be saved, and shalt know where thou wast. Also in the same place, Woe unto you, children of desertion, saith the Lord, ye have made counsel not by me, and my covenant not by my spirit, to add sin to sin. Also in Jeremiah, Withdraw thy foot from a rough way, and thy face from thirst. But she said, I will be comforted, I am willing, for she loved strangers and went after them. Also in Isaiah, be ye converted, because ye devise a deep and wicked counsel. Also in the same place, I am he, I am he that blotteth out thy iniquities, and will not remember them. But do thou remember them, and let us be judged together. Do thou first tell thine unrighteousnesses. Also in the same, seek the Lord, and when ye shall have found him, call upon him. But when he has drawn near to you, let the wicked forsake his ways, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. 
and let him be converted to the Lord, and mercy shall be prepared for him, because he does not much forgive your sins. Also in the same, remember these things, O Jacob and Israel, because thou art my servant. I have called thee my servant, and thou, Israel, forget me not. Lo, I have washed away thy unrighteousnesses as, and thy sins as a rain cloud. Be converted to me, and I will redeem thee. Also in the same, have these things in mind, and groan. Repent, ye that have been seduced. Be converted in heart unto me, and have in mind the former ages, because I am God. Also in the same, for a very little season I have forsaken thee, and with great mercy I will pity thee. In a very little wrath I turned away my face from thee. In everlasting mercy I will pity thee. Also in the same, Thus said the Most High, who dwelleth on high, for ever holy in the holies, his name is the Lord, the Most High, resting in the holy places, and giving calmness of mind to the faint-hearted, and giving life to those that are broken-hearted. I am not angry with you for ever, neither will I be avenged in all things on you, for my spirit shall go forth from me, and I have made all inspiration. And on account of a very little sin I have grieved him, and have turned away my face from him, and he has suffered the vile man, and has gone away sadly in his ways. I have seen his ways, and have healed him, and I have comforted him, and I have given to him the true consolation, and peace upon peace to those that are afar off, and to those that are near. And the Lord said, I have healed them, but the unrighteous, as a troubled sea, are thus tossed about, and cannot rest. There is no joy to the wicked, saith the Lord. Also in Jeremiah, Shall a bride forget her adornment, or a virgin the girdle of her breast? But my people has forgotten my days, whereof there is no number. Also in the same, For a decree I will speak upon the nation, or upon the kingdom, or I will take them away and destroy them. And if the nation should be converted from its evils, I will repent of the ills which I have thought to do unto them, and I will speak the decree upon the nation or the people, that I should rebuild it and plant it, and they will do evil before me, that they should not hearken to my voice, and I will repent of the good things which I spoke of doing to them. Also in the same, Return to me, O dwelling of Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not harden my face upon you, because I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not be angry against you for ever. Also in the same, Be converted, ye children, that have departed, saith the Lord, because I will rule over you, and will take you, one of a city, and two of a family, and I will bring you into Zion, and I will give you shepherds after my heart, and they shall feed you, feeding you with discipline. Also in the same, Be converted, ye children, who are turning, and I will heal your affliction. Also in the same, Wash thine heart for wickedness, O Jerusalem, that thou mayest be healed. How long shall there be in thee thoughts of thy sorrows? Also in the same, Thus saith the Lord, Does not he that falleth arise, Or he that turns away, Shall he not be turned back? Because this people hath turned itself away by a shameless vision, And they have persisted in their presumption, And would not be converted. Also in the same, There is no man that repenteth of his iniquity, Saying, What have I done? The runner has failed from his course as the sweating horse in his neighing. Also in the same, therefore let every one of you turn from his evil way and make your desires better. And they said, we will be comforted because we will go after your inventions and every one of us will do the sins which please his own heart. Also in the same, pour down as a torrent tears, day and night give thyself no rest, let not the pupil of thine eye be silent. Also in the same, let us search out our ways and be turned to the Lord. Let us purge our hearts with our hands, and let us look unto the Lord who dwelleth in the heavens. We have sinned, and we have provoked thee, and thou hast not been propitiated. Also in the same, and the Lord said to me in the days of Josiah the king, Thou hast seen what the dwelling of the house, the house of Israel, has done to me. It has gone away upon every lofty mountain, and has gone under every shady tree, and has committed fornication there. And I said, after she had committed all these fornications, return unto me, and she has not returned. Also in the same, the Lord will not reject forever, and when he has made low, he will have pity according to the multitude of his mercy, because he will not bring low from his whole heart, neither will he reject the children of men. Also in Ezekiel, 
and the righteous shall not be able to be saved in the day of transgression, when I shall say to the righteous, Thou shalt surely live, but he will trust to his own righteousness, and will do iniquity. All his righteousnesses shall not be remembered in his iniquity, which he has done. In that he shall die. And when I shall say to the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and he turns himself from his sin, and doeth righteousness and judgment, and restoreth to the debtor his pledge, and giveth back his robbery, and walketh in the precepts of life, that he may do no iniquity, he shall surely live, and shall not die. None of his sins which he hath sinned shall be stirred up against him, because he hath done justice and judgment, he shall live in them. Also in the same, I am the Lord, because I bring low the high tree, and exalt the low tree, and dry up the green tree, and cause the dry tree to flourish. Also in the same, And thou, son of man, say unto the house of Israel, even as ye have spoken, saying, Our errors and our iniquities are in us, and we waste away in them. And how shall we live? Say unto them, I live, saith the Lord. If I will the death of a sinner, only let him turn from his way, and he shall live. Also in the same, I the Lord have built up the ruined places, and have planted the wasted places. Also in the same, and the wicked man, if he turn himself from all his iniquities that he has done, and keep all my commandments, and do judgment and justice and mercy, shall surely live and shall not die. None of his sins which he has committed shall be in remembrance. In his righteousness which he hath done he shall live. Do I willingly desire the death of the unrighteous man, saith Adonai the Lord, rather than that he should turn away from his evil way, and that he should live? Also in the same, be ye converted, and turn you from all your wickednesses, and they shall not be to you for a punishment. Cast away from you all your iniquities which ye have wickedly committed against me, and make to yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. And why will ye die, O house of Israel? For I desire not the death of him that dieth, saith Adonai the Lord. Also in Daniel, and after the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to heaven, and my sins returned to me, and I praised the Most High, and blessed the King of heaven, and praised him that liveth forever, because his power is eternal, his kingdom is for generations, and all who inhabit the earth are as nothing. Also in Micah, Alas for me, O my soul, because truth has perished from the earth, and among all there is none that correcteth. All judge in blood, every one treadeth down his neighbor with tribulation, they prepare their hands for evil. Also in the same, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy, because I have fallen, but I shall arise, because although I shall sit in darkness, the Lord will give me light. I will bear the Lord's anger, because I have sinned against him, until he justify my cause. Also in Zephaniah, come ye together and pray, O undisciplined people, before ye be made as a flower that passeth away, before the anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's fury come upon you. Seek ye the Lord, all ye humble ones of the earth. Do judgment, and seek justice, and seek for gentleness, and answer ye to him, that ye may be protected in the day of the Lord's anger. Also in Zechariah, be ye converted unto me, and I will be turned unto you. Also in Hosea, Be thou converted, O Israel, to the Lord thy God, because thou art weakened by thine iniquities. Take many with you, and be converted to the Lord your God. Worship him, and say, Thou art mighty to put away our sins, that he may not receive iniquity, but that he may receive good things. Also in Ecclesiasticus, Be thou turned to the Lord, and forsake thy sins, and exceedingly hate cursing, and know righteousness and God's judgments, and stand in the lot of the propitiation of the Most High, and go into the portion of life with the living, and those that make confession, delay not in the error of the wicked. Confession perisheth from the dead man, as if it were nothing. Living and sound, thou shalt confess to the Lord, and thou shalt glory in his mercies, for great is the mercy of the Lord, and his propitiation unto such as turn unto him. Also in the same, how good is it for a true heart to show forth repentance, for thus shalt thou escape voluntary sin. Also in the Acts of the Apostles, but Peter saith unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou thinkest to be able to obtain the grace of God by money, Thou hast no part nor lot in this faith, for thy heart is not right with God. Therefore repent of this thy wickedness, and pray the Lord, if haply the thought of thy heart may be forgiven thee, for I see that thou art in the bond of iniquity and in the bitterness of gall. 
also in the second epistle of the blessed Paul to the Corinthians. For the sorrow which is according to God worketh a steadfast repentance unto salvation, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Also in the same place of this very matter, but if ye have forgiven anything to any one, I also forgive him, for I also forgave what I have forgiven for your sakes in the person of Christ, that we may not be circumvented by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his wiles. Also in the same, but I fear lest perchance when I come to you, God may again humble me among you, and I shall bewail many of those who have sinned before and have not repented, for that they have committed fornication and lasciviousness. Also in the same, I told you before and foretell you as I sit present and absent now from those who before have sinned and to all others, as, if I shall come again, I will not spare. Also in the second to Timothy, but shun profane novelties of words, for they are of much advantage to impiety, and their word creeps as a cancer, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have departed from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened, and have subverted the faith of certain ones. But the foundation of God standeth firm, having this seal, God knoweth them that are his. And every one who nameth the name of the Lord shall depart from all iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of clay, and some indeed for honor, and some for contempt. Therefore, if any one shall amend himself from these things, he shall be a vessel sanctified for honor, and useful for the Lord, prepared for every good work. Moreover, flee youthful lusts, but follow after righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call upon the Lord from a pure heart. But avoid questions that are foolish and without learning, knowing that they beget strifes. And the servant of the Lord ought not to strive, but to be gentle, docile to all men, patient with modesty, correcting those who resist, lest at any time God may give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth, and recover themselves from the snares of the devil, by whom they are held captive at his will. Also in the Apocalypse, remember whence thou hast fallen, and repent, but if not, I will come to thee quickly, and remove thy candlestick out of its place. End of Exhortation to Repentance by Cyprian of Carthage Fragments of a Second Epistle to Dionysius of Rome by Dionysius of Alexandria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Or of the treatise which was inscribed the Elenchus et Apologia. From the first book, there certainly was not a time when God was not the Father. And in what follows, says Athanasius, he professes that Christ is always as being the word and the wisdom and the power. Neither, indeed, as though he had not brought forth these things, did God afterwards beget the Son, but because the Son has existence not from himself, but from the Father. And after a few words he says of the Son himself. Being the brightness of the eternal light, he himself also is absolutely eternal. For since light is always in existence, it is manifest that its brightness also exists because light is perceived to exist from the fact that it shines, and it is impossible that light should not shine. And let us once more come to illustrations. If the sun exists, there is also day. If nothing of this be manifest, it is impossible that the sun should be there. If then the sun were eternal, the day would never end, but now for such is not really the state of the case, the day begins with the beginning of the sun, and ends with its ending. But God is the eternal light, which has neither had a beginning, nor shall ever fail. Therefore the eternal brightness shines forth before him and coexists with him, in that, existing without a beginning and always begotten, he always shines before him. And he is that wisdom which says, I was that wherein he delighted, and I was daily his delight before his face at all times. And a little after, he thus pursues his discourse from the same point. Since therefore the Father is eternal, the Son also is eternal, light of light. For where there is the begetter, there is also the offspring. And if there is no offspring, how and of what can he be the begetter? But both are and always are. Since then God is the light, Christ is the brightness. And since he is a spirit, for, says he, God is a spirit, fittingly again is Christ called breath. For he, still wisdom, saith he, is the breath of God's power. And again, he says, 
moreover the Son alone, always coexisting with the Father, and filled with him who is, himself also is, since he is of the Father. From the same first book. But when I spoke of things created, and certain works to be considered, I hastily put forward illustrations of such things, as were little appropriate, when I said, Neither is the plant the same as the husbandman, nor the boat the same as the boat builder. But then I lingered rather upon things suitable and more adapted to the nature of the thing, and I unfolded, in many words, by various carefully considered arguments, what things were more true, which things, moreover, I have set forth to you in another letter. And in these things I have also proved the falsehood of the charge which they bring against me, to wit, that I do not maintain that Christ is consubstantial with God. For, although I say that I have never either found or read this word in the sacred scriptures, yet other reasonings which I immediately subjoined are in no wise discrepant with this view, because I brought forward as an illustration human offspring, which assuredly is of the same kind as the begetter, and I said that parents are absolutely distinguished from their children by the fact alone that they themselves are not their children, or that it would assuredly be a matter of necessity that there would neither be parents nor children. But, as I said before, I have not the letter in my possession on account of the present condition of affairs, otherwise I would have sent you the very words that I then wrote, yea, and a copy of the whole letter, and I will send it if at any time I shall have the opportunity. I remember further that I added many similitudes from things kindred to one another, for I said that the plant, whether it grows up from seed or from a root, is different from that whence it sprouted, although it is absolutely of the same nature. And similarly, that a river flowing from a spring takes another form and name, for that neither is the spring called the river, nor the river the spring, but that these are two things, and that the spring indeed is as it were the father, while the river is the water from the spring. But they feign that they do not see these things, and the like to them which is written, as if they were blind. But they endeavour to assail me from a distance with expressions too carelessly used, as if they were stones, not observing that on things of which they are ignorant, and which require interpretation to be understood, illustrations that are not only remote but even contrary will often throw light. From the same first book. It was said above that God is the spring of all good things, but the sun was called the river flowing from him, because the word is an emanation of the mind, and, to speak after human fashion, is emitted from the heart by the mouth. But the mind which springs forth by the tongue is different from the word which exists in the heart, for this latter, after it has emitted the former, remains and is what it was before. But the mind sent forth flies away and is carried everywhere around, and thus each is in each, although one is from the other, and they are one, although they are two. And it is thus that the Father and the Son are said to be one, and to be in one another. From the second book. The individual names uttered by me can neither be separated from one another nor parted. I spoke of the Father, and before I made mention of the Son, I already signified him in the Father. I added the Son, and the Father, even although I had not previously named him, had already been absolutely comprehended in the Son. I added the Holy Spirit, but at the same time I conveyed under the name whence and by whom he proceeded. But they are ignorant that neither the Father, in that he is Father, can be separated from the Son, for that name is the evident ground of coherence and conjunction, nor can the Son be separated from the Father, for this word Father indicates association between them. And there is, moreover, evident a spirit who can neither be disjoined from him who sends, nor from him who brings him. How then should I, who use such names, think that these are absolutely divided and separated, the one from the other? After a few words, he adds, Thus, indeed, we expand the indivisible unity into a trinity, and again we contract the trinity which cannot be diminished into a unity. From the same second book. But if any quibbler, from the fact that I said that God is the maker and creator of all things, thinks that I said that he is also creator of Christ, let him observe that I first called him Father, in which word the Son also is at the same time expressed. For after I called the Father the creator, I added, neither is he the Father of those things whereof he is creator, if he who begot is properly understood to be a father. For... We will consider the latitude of this word father in what follows. Nor is a maker a father, 
if it is only a framer who is called a maker. For among the Greeks, they who are wise are said to be makers of their books. The apostle also says a doer, silicet maker of the law. Moreover, of matters of the heart, of which kind are virtue and vice, men are called doers, silicet makers, after which manner God said, I expected that it should make judgment, but it made iniquity. Athanasius adds, 421, that Dionysius gave various replies to those that blamed him for saying that God is the maker of Christ, whereby he cleared himself, saying that neither must this saying be thus blamed, for he says that he used the name of maker on account of the flesh which the word had assumed and which certainly was made. But if any one should suspect that that had been said of the word, even this also was to be heard without contentiousness, for... As I do not think that the word was a thing made, so I do not say that God was its maker, but its father. Yet still, if at any time, discoursing of the Son, I may have casually said that God was his maker, even this mode of speaking would not be without defense. For the wise men among the Greeks call themselves the makers of their books, although the same are fathers of their books. Moreover, divine scripture calls us makers of those motions which proceed from the heart, when it calls us doers of the law of judgment, and of justice, from the same second book. In the beginning was the Word, but that was not the Word which produced the Word, for the Word was with God. The Lord is wisdom, it was not therefore wisdom that produced wisdom, for I was that, says he, wherein he delighted. Christ is truth, but blessed, says he, is the God of truth. From the third book, Life is begotten of life in the same way as the river has flowed forth from the spring and the brilliant light is ignited from the inextinguishable light. From the fourth book, even as our mind emits from itself a word, as says the prophet, my heart hath uttered forth a good word, and each of the two is distinct, the one from the other, and maintaining a peculiar place, and one that is distinguished from the other, since the former indeed abides and is stirred in the heart, while the latter has its place in the tongue and in the mouth and yet they are not apart from one another, nor deprived of one another. Neither is the mind without the word, nor is the word without the mind, but the mind makes the word, and appears in the word, and the word exhibits the mind wherein it was made. And the mind indeed is, as it were, the word imminent, while the word is the mind breaking forth, eminent. The mind passes into the word, and the word transmits the mind to the surrounding hearers, and thus the mind, by means of the word, takes its place in the souls of the hearers, entering in at the same time as the word. And indeed the mind is, as it were, the father of the word, existing in itself, but the word is as the son of the mind, and cannot be made before it, nor without it, but exists with it, whence it has taken its seed and origin. In the same manner also the almighty father and universal mind has before all things the son, the word, and the discourse as the interpreter and messenger of himself. About the middle of the treatise. If, from the fact that there are three hypostases, they say that they are divided, there are three, whether they like it or no, or else let them get rid of the divine trinity altogether. And again, for on this account, after the unity, there is also the most divine trinity. The conclusion of the entire treatise, in accordance with all these things, the form, moreover, and rule being received from the elders, who have lived before us, we also, with a voice in accordance with them, will both acquit ourselves of thanks to you and of the letter which we are now writing. And to God the Father and his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. Of the work itself, Athanasius thus speaks. Finally, Dionysius complains that his accusers do not quote his opinions in their integrity, but mutilated, and that they do not speak out of a good conscience, but for evil inclination, and he says that they are like those who cavilled at the epistles of the blessed apostle. Certainly he meets the individual words of his accusers and gives a solution to all their arguments, and as in those earlier writings of his he confuted Sibelius most evidently, so in these later ones he entirely declares his own pious faith. End of Fragments of a Second Epistle to Dionysius of Rome by Dionysius of Alexandria The Decrees of Fabian by Fabian of Rome This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org 
decrees of Fabian taken from the decretal of Gratian, that the man who refuses to be reconciled to his brother should be reduced by the severest fastings, if any injured person refuses to be reconciled to his brother when he who has injured him offers satisfaction, he should be reduced by the severest fastings even until he accepts the satisfaction offered him with thankful mind. The man is rendered infamous who knowingly presumes to forswear himself. Whosoever has knowingly forsworn himself should be put for forty days on bread and water and do penance also for the seven following years, and he should never be without penance, and he should never be admitted to bear witness. After this, however, he may enjoy communion. A man and a woman subject to madness cannot enter into marriage. Neither can a madman or a mad woman enter into the marriage relation, but if it has been entered, then they shall not be separated. Marriage relations in the fifth generation may unite with each other, and in the fourth generation, if they are found, they should not be separated. Concerning relations who enter affinity by the connection of husband and wife, these, on the decease of wife or husband, may form a union in the fifth generation, and in the fourth, if they are found, they should not be separated. In the third degree of relationship, however, it is not lawful for one to take the wife of another on his death, in an equable manner, a man may be united in marriage after his wife's death with those who are his own kinswomen and with the kinswomen of his wife. To the immediately preceding notice. Those who marry a wife allied by blood and are separated shall not be at liberty as long as both parties are alive to unite other wives with them in marriage unless they can plead the excuse of ignorance. Blood connections alone, or if offspring entirely fails, the old and trustworthy should reckon the matter of propinquity in the synod. No alien should accuse blood connections or reckon the matter of consanguinity in the synod, but relations to whose knowledge it pertains, that is, father and mother, sister and brother, paternal uncle, maternal uncle, paternal aunt, maternal aunt, and their children. If, however, offspring entirely fails, the bishop shall make inquiry canonically of the older and more trustworthy persons to whom the same relationship may be known, and if such relationship is found, the parties should be separated. Every one of the faithful should communicate three times a year. Although they may not do it more frequently, yet at least three times in the year should the laity communicate, unless one happened to be hindered by any more serious offences, to wit at Easter and Pentecost and the Lord's Nativity. A presbyter should not be ordained younger than thirty years of age. If one has not completed thirty years of age, he should in no way be ordained as presbyter, even although he may be extremely worthy, for even the Lord himself was baptized only when he was thirty years of age, and at that period he began to teach. It is not right, therefore, that one who is to be ordained should be consecrated until he has reached this legitimate age. The decrees of the same, from the Codex of Decrees in sixteen books, from the fifth book and the seventh and ninth chapters. That the oblation of the altar should be made each Lord's Day. We decree that on each Lord's Day the oblation of the altar should be made by all men and women in bread and wine, in order that by means of these sacrifices they may be released from the burden of their sins. That an illiterate presbyter may not venture to celebrate Mass. The sacrifice is not to be accepted from the hand of a priest who is not competent to discharge the prayers or actions, actiones, and other observances in the Mass according to religious usage. End of the Decrees of Fabian by Fabian of Rome A Fragment on the Reception of the Lapsed to Penitence Attributed to Dionysius of Alexandria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. But now we are doing the opposite. For whereas Christ, who is the Good Shepherd, goes in quest of one who wanders, lost among the mountains, and calls him back when he flees from him, and is at pains to take him up on his shoulders when he has found him, 
We, on the contrary, harshly spurn such an one even when he approaches us. Yet let us not consult so miserably for ourselves, and let us not in this way be driving the sword against ourselves. For when people set themselves either to do evil or to do good to others, what they do is certainly not confined to the carrying out of their will on those others, but just as they attach themselves to iniquity or to goodness, they will themselves become possessed either by divine virtues or by unbridled passions. And the former will become the followers and comrades of the good angels, and both in this world and in the other, with the enjoyment of perfect peace and immunity from all ills, they will fulfill the most blessed destinies unto all eternity, and in God's fellowship they will be forever in possession of the supremest good. But these latter will fall away at once from the peace of God and from peace with themselves, and both in this world and after death they will abide with the spirits of blood guiltiness. Dus palamnenus de mosi. Wherefore let us not thrust from us those who seek a penitent return, but let us receive them gladly, and number them once more with the steadfast, and make up again what is defective in them. End of a fragment on the reception of the elapsed to penitence, attributed to Dionysius of Alexandria. Of the Discipline and Advantage of Chastity by Cyprian of Carthage this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I do not conceive that I have exceeded any portions of my duty in always striving as much as possible by daily discussions of the Gospels to afford to you from time to time the means of growth by the Lord's help in faith and knowledge. For what else can be effected in the Lord's Church with greater advantage? What can be found more suitable to the office of a bishop? than that, by the teaching of the divine words, recommended and commented on by him, believers should be enabled to attain to the promised kingdom of heaven. This assuredly, as the desired result, day by day, of my work as well as of my office, I endeavour, notwithstanding my absence, to accomplish, and by my letters I try to make myself present to you, addressing you in faith, in my usual manner, by the exhortations that I send you. I call upon you, therefore, to be established in the power of the root of the gospel, and to stand always armed against all the assaults of the devil. I shall not believe myself to be absent from you, if I shall be sure of you. Nevertheless, everything which is advantageously set forth, and which either defines or promises the condition of eternal life to those who are investigating it, is then only profitable if it be aided in attaining the reward of the effort by the power of the divine mercy." We not only set forth words which come from the sacred fountains of the scriptures, but with these very words we associate prayers to the Lord, and wishes that, as well to us as to you, he would not only unfold the treasures of his sacraments, but would bestow strength for the carrying into act of what we know. For the danger is all the greater if we know the Lord's will, and loiter in the work of the will of God. Although, therefore, I exhort you always, as you are aware, to many things, and to the precepts of the Lord's admonition, for what else can be desirable or more important to me than that in all things you should stand perfect in the Lord? Yet I admonish you that you should before all things maintain the barriers of chastity, as also you do, knowing that you are the temple of the Lord, the members of Christ, the habitation of the Holy Spirit, elected to hope, consecrated to faith, destined to salvation, sons of God, brethren of Christ, associates of the Holy Spirit, owing nothing any longer to the flesh, as born again of water, that the chastity, over and above the will which we should always desire to be ours, may be afforded to us also, on account of the redemption, that that which has been consecrated by Christ might not be corrupted. For if the Apostle declares the Church to be the spouse of Christ, I beseech you, consider what chastity is required when the Church is given in marriage as a betrothed virgin. And I, indeed, except that I have proposed to admonish you with brevity, think the most diffuse praises due and could set forth abundant laudations of chastity, but I have thought it superfluous to praise it at greater length amongst those who practice it. For you adorn it while you exhibit it and in its exercise you set forth its more abundant praises, being made its ornament, while it also is yours, each lending and borrowing honour from the other. It adds to you the discipline of good morals. 
you confer upon it the ministry of saintly works, for how much and what it can effect has on the one hand been manifest by your means, and on the other it has shown and taught what you are wishing for, the two advantages of precepts and practice being combined into one, that nothing should appear maimed, as would be the case if either principles were wanting to service or service to principles. Chastity is the dignity of the body, the ornament of morality, the sacredness of the sexes, the bond of modesty, the source of purity, the peacefulness of home, the crown of concord. Chastity is not careful whom it pleases but itself. Chastity is always modest, being the mother of innocency. Chastity is ever adorned with modesty alone, then rightly conscious of its own beauty if it is displeasing to the wicked. Chastity seeks nothing in the way of adornments. It is its own glory. It is this which commends us to the Lord, unites us with Christ. It is this which drives out from our members all the illicit conflicts of desire, instills peace into our bodies, blessed itself, and making those blessed, whoever they are, in whom it condescends to dwell. It is that which they can never accuse, even who possess it not. It is even venerable to its enemies, since they admire it much more, because they are unable to capture it. Moreover, as mature, it is both always excellent in men and to be earnestly desired by women. So its enemy, unchastity, is always detestable, making an obscene sport for its servants, sparing neither bodies nor souls. For their own proper character being overcome, it sends the entire man under its yoke of lust, alluring at first that it may do the more mischief by its attraction, exhausting both means and modesty the foe of continency, the perilous madness of lust frequently attaining to the blood, the destruction of a good conscience, the mother of impenitence, the ruin of a more virtuous age, the disgrace of one's race, driving away all confidence in blood and family, intruding one's own children upon the affections of strangers, interpolating the offspring of an unknown and corrupted stock into the testaments of others and this also very frequently burning without reference to sex, and not restraining itself within the permitted limits, thinks it little satisfaction to itself, unless even in the bodies of men it seeks not a new pleasure, but goes in quest of extraordinary and revolting extravagances, contrary to nature itself, of men with men. But chastity maintains the first rank in virgins, the second in those who are continent, the third in the case of wedlock, Yet in all it is glorious with all its degrees, for even to maintain the marriage faith is a matter of praise in the midst of so many bodily strifes, and to have determined on a limit in marriage, defined by continency, is more virtuous still, because herein even lawful things are refused. Assuredly to have guarded one's purity from the womb, and to have kept oneself pure as an infant, even to old age throughout the whole of life, is certainly the part of an admirable virtue only that never to have known the body's seductive capacities is the greater blessedness. To have overcome them once known is the greater virtue, yet still in such a sort that that virtue comes of God's gift, although it manifests itself to men in their members. The precepts of chastity, brethren, are ancient. Wherefore do I say ancient? Because they were ordained at the same time as men themselves. For both her own husband belongs to the woman for the reason that besides him she may know no other, and the woman is given to the man for the purpose that, when that which had been his own had been yielded to him, he should seek for nothing belonging to another. And in such wise it is said, two shall be in one flesh, that what had been made one should return together, that a separation without return should not afford any occasion to a stranger. Thence also the apostle declares that the man is the head of the woman, that he might commend chastity in the conjunction of the two. For as the head cannot be suited to the limbs of another, so also one's limbs cannot be suited to the head of another, for one's head matches one's limbs, and one's limbs one's head, and both of them are associated by a natural link in mutual concord, lest by any discord arising from the separation of the members the compact of the divine covenant should be broken. Yet he adds and says, because he who loves his wife loves himself, for no one hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as Christ the Church. From this passage there is great authority for charity with chastity, if wives are to be loved by their husbands, even as Christ loved the Church, and wives ought so to love their husbands, also as the Church loves Christ. 
Christ gave this judgment when being inquired of. He said that a wife must not be put away save for the cause of adultery. Such honor did he put upon chastity. Hence arose the decree, ye shall not suffer adulteresses to live. Hence the apostle says, this is the will of God, that ye abstain from fornication. Hence also he says the same thing, that the members of Christ must not be joined with the members of an harlot. Hence the man is delivered over unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, who, treading underfoot the law of chastity, practices the vices of the flesh. Hence, with reason, adulterers do not attain the kingdom of heaven. Hence it is that every sin is without the body, but that the adulterer alone sins against his own body. Hence other authoritative utterances of the instructor, all of which it is not necessary at this time to collect, especially among you, who for the most part know and do them. And you cannot find cause for complaint concerning these things, even though they are not described. For the adulterer has not an excuse, nor could he have, because he might take a wife. But as laws are prescribed to matrons, who are so bound that they cannot thence be separated, while virginity and continency are beyond all law, there is nothing in the laws of matrimony which pertains to virginity, for by its loftiness it transcends them all. If any evil undertakings of men endeavor to transcend laws, virginity places itself on an equality with angels. Moreover, if we investigate it, even excels them, because struggling in the flesh, it gains the victory even against a nature which angels have not. What else is virginity than the glorious preparation for the future life? Virginity is of neither sex. Virginity is the continuance of infancy. Virginity is the triumph over pleasures. Virginity has no children, but what is more, it has contempt for offspring. It has not fruitfulness, but neither has it bereavement. Blessed that it is free from the pain of bringing forth, more blessed still that it is free from the calamity of the death of children. What else is virginity than the freedom of liberty? It has no husband for a master. Virginity is freed from all affections. It is not given up to marriage, nor to the world, nor to children. It cannot dread persecution, since it cannot provoke it from its security. But since the precepts of chastity have thus briefly been set forth to us, let us now give an instance of chastity. For it is more profitable when we come in the very presence of the thing, nor will there be any doubt about the virtue, when that which is prescribed is also designated by illustrations. The example of chastity begins with Joseph, a Hebrew youth, noble by his parentage, nobler by his innocence, on account of the envy excited by his revelations, exposed for sale by his brethren to the Israelites, had attained to the household of a man of Egypt. By his obedience and his innocence, and by the entire faithfulness of his service, he had aroused in his favor the easy and kindly disposition of his master, and his appearance had commended itself to all men, alike by his gracious speech as by his youthfulness. But the same nobility of manner was received by his master's wife in another manner than was becoming, in a secret part of the house and without witnesses, a place high up and fitted for deeds of wickedness, the unrestrained unchastity of the woman, thought that it could overcome the youth's chastity, now by promises, now by threats. And when he was restrained from attempting flight by her holding his garments, shocked at the audacity of such a crime, tearing his very garments and able to appeal to the sincerity of his naked body as a witness of his innocence, the rash woman did not shrink from adding calumny to the crime of her unchastity. Dishevelled and raging that her desire should be despised, she complained both to others and to her husband that the Hebrew youth had attempted to use that force to her which she herself had striven to exercise. The husband's passion, unconscious of the truth and terribly inflamed by his wife's accusation, is aroused, and the modest youth, because he did not defile his conscience with the crime, is thrust into the lowest dungeon of the prison. But chastity is not alone in the dungeon, for God is with Joseph, and the guilty are given into his charge, because he has been guiltless. Moreover, he dissolves the obscurities of dreams because his spirit was watchful in temptations, and he is freed from chains by the master of the prison. He, who had been an inferior in the house with peril, was made lord of the palace without risk. Restored to his noble station, he received the reward of chastity and innocence by the judgment of God, from whom he had deserved it. But not less from a different direction arises to us another similar instance of chastity from the continence of women. Susanna, as we read, 
the daughter of Chelsius, the wife of Joachim, who was exceedingly beautiful, more beautiful still in character. Her outward appearance added no charm to her, for she was simple. Chastity had cultivated her, and in addition to chastity, nature alone. With her, two of the elders had begun to be madly in love, mindful of nothing, neither of the fear of God nor even of their age, already withering with years. Thus the flame of resuscitated lust recalled them into the glowing heats of their bygone youth. Robbers of chastity, they profess love while they really hate. They threaten her with calumnies when she resists. The adulterers in wish declare themselves the accusers of adultery. And between these rocks of lust she sought help of the Lord, because she was not equal to prevailing against them by bodily strength. And the Lord heard from heaven, chastity crying to him, and when she, overwhelmed with injustice, was being led to punishment, she was delivered and saw her revenge upon her enemies. Twice victorious and in her peril, so often and so fatally hedged in, she escaped both the lust and death. It will be endless if I continue to produce more examples. I am content with these two, especially as in these cases chastity has been defended with all their might. The memory of noble descent could not enervate them, although to some this is a suggestive license to lasciviousness, nor the comeliness of their bodies and the beauty of their well-ordered limbs, although, for the most part, this affords a hint that, being, as it were, the short-lived flower of an age that rapidly passes away, it should be fed with the offered opportunity of pleasure, nor the first years of a green but mature age, although the blood, still inexperienced, grows hot and stimulates the natural fires, and the blind flames that stir in the marrow to seek a remedy, even if they should break forth at the risk of modesty, nor any opportunity afforded by secrecy or by freedom from witnesses, which to some seems to ensure safety, although this is the greatest temptation to the commission of crime, that there is no punishment for meditating it. Neither was a necessity laid upon them by the authority of those who bade them yield, and in the boldness of association and companionship, by which kind of temptations also righteous determinations are often overcome. Neither did the very rewards, nor the kindliness, nor the accusations, nor threats, nor punishments, nor death move them. Nothing was counted so cruel, so hard, so distressing, as to have fallen from the lofty stand of chastity. They were worthy of such a reward of the divine judge, that one of them should be glorified on a throne almost regal, that the other, endowed with her husband's sympathy, should be rescued by the death of her enemies. These, and such as these, are the examples ever to be placed before our eyes, the like of them to be meditated on day and night. Nothing so delights the faithful soul as the healthy consciousness of an unstained modesty. To have vanquished pleasure is the greatest pleasure, nor is there any greater victory than that which is gained over one's desires. He who has conquered an enemy has been stronger, but it was stronger than another. He who has subdued lust has been stronger than himself. He who has overthrown an enemy has beaten a foreign foe. He who has cast down desire has vanquished a domestic adversary. Every evil is more easily conquered than pleasure, because, whatever it is, the former is repulsive, the latter is attractive. Nothing is crushed with such difficulty as that which is armed by it. He who gets rid of desires has got rid of fears also. For from desires come fears. He who overcomes desires triumphs over sin. He who overcomes desires shows that the mischief of the human family lies prostrate under his feet. He who has overcome desires has given to himself perpetual peace. He who has overcome desires restores to himself liberty, a most difficult matter even for noble natures. Therefore we should always meditate, brethren, as these matters teach us, on chastity, that it may be the more easy, it is based upon no acquired skill, for the right will that is therein carried to perfection, which, were it not checked, is remote, silicet from our consciousness, is still our will, so that it is not a will to be acquired, but that which is our own is to be cherished. For what is chastity but a virtuous mind added to watchfulness of the body, so that modesty observed in respect of these sexual relations, attested by strictness of demeanour, should maintain honourable faith by an uncorrupted offspring. Moreover, to chastity, brethren, are suited and known, first of all, divine modesty, 
and the sacred meditation of the divine precepts, and a soul inclined to faith, and a mind attuned to the sacredness of religion, then carefulness that nothing in itself should be elaborated beyond measure, or extended beyond propriety, that nothing should be made a show of, nothing artfully coloured, that there should be nothing to pander to the excitement or the renewal of wiles. She is not a modest woman who strives to stir up the fancy of another, even although her bodily chastity be preserved. Away with such as do not adorn but prostitute their beauty, for anxiety about beauty is not only the wisdom of an evil mind, but belongs to deformity. Let the bodily nature be free, nor let any sort of force be intruded upon God's works. She is always wretched who is not satisfied to be such as she is. Wherefore is color of hair changed? Why are the edges of the eyes darkened? Why is the face molded by art into a different form? Finally, why is the looking-glass consulted, unless from fear lest a woman should be herself? Moreover, the dress of a modest woman should be modest. A believer should not be conscious of adultery, even in the mixture of colors. To wear gold in one's garments is as if it were desirable to corrupt one's garments. What do rigid metals do among the delicate threads of the woven textures except to press upon the enervated shoulders and unhappily to show the extravagance of a boastful soul? Why are the necks oppressed and hidden by outlandish stones, the prices of which, without workmanship, exceed the entire fortune of many a one? It is not the woman that is adorned, but the woman's vices that are manifested. What, when the fingers laden with so much gold can neither close nor open, is there any advantage sought for, or is it merely to show the empty parade of one's estate? It is a marvellous thing that women, tender in all things else, in bearing the burden of their vices, are stronger than men. But to return to what I began with, chastity is ever to be cultivated by men and women. It is to be kept with all watchfulness within its bounds. The bodily nature is quickly endangered in the body, when the flesh, which is always falling, carries it away with itself. Because under the pretext of a nature which is always urging men to desires, whereby the ruins of a decayed race are restored, deceiving with the enticement of pleasure, it does not lead its offspring to the continence of legitimate intercourse, but hurls them into crime. Therefore, in opposition to these fleshly snares, by which the devil both obtrudes himself as a companion and makes himself a leader, we must struggle with every kind of strength. Let the aid of Christ be appropriated according to the apostle, and let the mind be withdrawn as much as possible from the association of the body. Let consent be withheld from the body. Let vices be always chastised, that they may be hated. Let that misshapen and degraded shame which belongs to sin be kept before our eyes. Repentance itself, with all its struggles, is a discreditable testimony to sins committed. Let not curiosity be indulged in scanning other people's countenances. Let one's speech be brief and one's laughter moderate, for laughter is the sign of an easy and a negligent disposition. Let all contact, even that which is becoming, be avoided. Let no indulgence be permitted to the body when bodily vice is to be avoided. Let it be considered how honorable it is to have conquered dishonor, how disgraceful to have been conquered by dishonor. It must be said, moreover, that adultery is not pleasure but mutual contempt, nor can it delight because it kills both the soul and modesty. Let the soul restrain the provocations of the flesh, let it bridle the impulses of the body, for it has received this power that the limbs should be subservient to its command, and as a lawful and accomplished charioteer it should turn about the fleshly impulses when they lift themselves above the allowed limits of the body by the reins of the heavenly precepts, lest that chariot of the body, carried away beyond its limits, should hurry into its own peril, the charioteer himself as well as it. But in the midst of these things, nay, before these things, in opposition to disturbances and all vices, help must be sought for from the divine camp, for God alone, who has condescended to make men, is powerful also to afford sufficient help to men. I have composed a few words, because I did not propose to write a volume, but to send you an address. Look ye to the scripture, seek out for yourselves, from those precepts, greater illustrations of this matter. Beloved brethren, farewell. End of of the Discipline and Advantage of Chastity by Cyprian of Carthage On Patience by Augustine of Hippo This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That virtue of the mind, which is called patience, is so great a gift of God that even in him who bestoweth the same upon us, that, whereby he waiteth for evil men that they may amend, is set forth by the name of patience or long-suffering. So although in God there can be no suffering, and patience hath its name, a uh, paciendo, from suffering, yet a patient God we not only faithfully believe, but also wholesomely confess. But the patience of God, of what kind and how great it is, his whom we say to be impassable, yet not impatient, nay, even most patient, in words to unfold this who can be able. Ineffable is therefore that patience, as is his jealousy, as his wrath, and whatever there is like to these. For if we conceive of these as they be in us, in him are there none. We namely can feel none of these without molestation, but be it far from us to surmise that the impassible nature of God is liable to any molestation. But like as he is jealous without any darkening of spirit, wrath without any perturbation, pitiful without any pain, repenteth him without any wrongness in him to be set right, so is he patient without aught of passion. Now, therefore, as concerning human patience, which we are able to conceive and beholden to have, of what sort it is, I will, as God granteth, and the brevity of the present discourse alloweth, essay to set forth. The patience of man, which is right and laudable and worthy of the name of virtue, is understood to be that by which we tolerate evil things with an even mind, that we may not, with a mind uneven, desert good things, through which we may arrive at better. Wherefore the impatient, while they will not suffer ills, effect not a deliverance from ills, but only the suffering of heavier ills. Whereas the patient, who choose rather by not committing to bear than by not bearing to commit evil, both make lighter what through patience they suffer, and also escape worse ills in which through impatience they would be sunk. But those good things which are great and eternal they lose not, while to the evils which be temporal and brief they yield not, because the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared, as the Apostle says, with the future glory that shall be revealed in us. And again he says, This our temporal and light tribulation doth in inconceivable manner work for us an eternal weight of glory. Look we then, beloved, what hardships in labors and sorrows men endure for things which they viciously love, and by how much they think to be made by them more happy, by so much more unhappily covered. How much for false riches, how much for vain honors, how much for affections of games and shows, is of exceeding peril and trouble most patiently borne. We see men hankering after money, glory, lasciviousness, how that they may arrive at their desires, and having gotten not lose them, they endure sun, rain, icy cold, waves, and most stormy tempests, the roughnesses and uncertainties of wars, the strokes of huge blows and dreadful wounds, not of inevitable necessity but of culpable will. But these madnesses are thought in a manner permitted. Thus avarice, ambition, luxury, and the delights of all sorts of games and shows, unless for them some wicked deed be committed or outrage which is prohibited in human laws are accounted to pertain to innocence, Nay, moreover, the man who without wrong to any shall, whether for getting or increasing of money, whether for obtaining or keeping of honours, whether in contending in the match or in hunting, or in exhibiting with applause some theatrical spectacle, have borne great labours and pains, it is not enough that, through popular vanity, he is checked by no reproofs, but he is moreover extolled with praises. Because, as it is written, the sinner is praised in the desires of his soul, for the force of desires makes endurance of labours and pains, and no man, save for that which he enjoyeth, freely takes on him to bear that which annoyeth. But these lusts, as I said, for the fulfilling of which, they which are on fire with them most patiently endure much hardship and bitterness, are accounted to be permitted and allowed by laws. Nay, more, for is it not so that even for open wickednesses not to punish, but to perpetrate them, Men put up with many most grievous troubles. Do not authors of secular letters tell of a certain right noble parasite of his country, that hunger, thirst, cold, all these he was able to endure, 
and his body was patient of lack of food and warmth and sleep to a degree surpassing belief. Why speak of highway robbers, all of whom, while they lie in wait for travellers, endure whole nights without sleep, and that they may catch as they pass men who have no thought of harm, will, no matter how foul the weather, plant in one spot their mind and body, which are full of thoughts of harm. Nay, it is said that some of those are wont to torture one another by turns, to the degree that this practice and training against pains is not a whit short of pains, for not so much perchance are they excruciated by the judge, that, through smart of pain the truth may be got at, as they are by their own comrades, that, through patience of pain, truth may not be betrayed." And yet, in all these, the patience is rather to be wondered at than praised. Nay, neither wondered at nor praised, seeing it is no patience, but we must wonder at the hardness, deny the patience. For there is nothing in this rightly to be praised, nothing usefully to be imitated, and thou wilt rightly judge the mind to be all the more worthy of greater punishment, the more it yields up to vices, the instruments of virtues. Patience is companion of wisdom, not handmaid of concupiscence, Patience is the friend of a good conscience, not the foe of innocence. When, therefore, thou shalt see any man suffer aught patiently, do not straightway praise it as patience, for this is only shown by the cause of suffering. When it is a good cause, then is it true patience. When that is not polluted by lust, then it is distinguished from falsity. But when that is placed in crime, then is this much misplaced in name. For not just as all who know are partakers of knowledge, just so are all who suffer partakers of patience, but they which rightly use the suffering. These in verity of patience are praised, these with the prize of patience are crowned. But yet, seeing that for lust's sake, or even wickedness's, seeing in a word that for this temporal life and weal men do wonderfully bear the brunt of many horrible sufferings, They much admonish us how great things ought to be borne for the sake of a good life, that it may also hereafter be eternal life, and without any bound of time, without waste or loss of any advantage, in true felicity secure. The Lord saith, In your patience ye shall possess your souls. He saith not, Your farms, your praises, your luxuries, but your souls. If then the soul endures so great sufferings that it may possess that whereby it may be lost, How great ought it to bear that it may not be lost? And then, to mention a thing not culpable, if it bear so great sufferings for saving of the flesh under the hands of chirurgeons, cutting or burning the same, how great ought it to bear for saving of itself under the fury of any soever enemies? Seeing that leeches, that the body may not die, do by pains consult for the body's good, but enemies by threatening the body with pains and death would urge us on to the slaying of the soul and body in hell. Though indeed the welfare even of the body is then more providently consulted for if its temporal life and welfare be disregarded for righteousness' sake and its pain or death most patiently for righteousness' sake endured. Since it is of the body's redemption which is to be in the end that the Apostle speaks, where he says, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting the adoption of sons, the redemption of our body. Then he subjoins, for in hope are we saved. But hope which is seen is not hope, for what a man seeth, why doth he also hope for? But if what we see not we hope for, we do by patience wait for it. When therefore any ills do torture us indeed, yet not extort from us ill works. Not only is the soul possessed through patience, but even when through patience the body itself for a time is afflicted or lost, it is unto eternal stability and salvation resumed, and hath through grief and death and inviolable health and happy immortality laid up for itself. Whence the Lord Jesus, exhorting his martyrs to patience, hath promised of the very body a future perfect entireness, without loss, I say not of any limb, of a single hair. Verily I say unto you, saith he, a hair of your head shall not perish. That's so, because, as the apostle says, no man ever hated his own flesh. A faithful man may more by patience than by impatience take vigilant care for the state of his flesh and find amends for its present losses, how great soever they may be in the inestimable gain of future incorruption. But although patience be a virtue of the mind, yet partly the mind exercises it in the mind itself, partly in the body. 
In itself, it exercises patience when, the body remaining unhurt and untouched, the mind is goaded by any adversities or filthinesses of things or words to do or to say something that is not expedient or not becoming, and patiently bears all evils that it may not itself commit any evil in word or work. By this patience we bear, even while we be sound in body, that in the midst of the offences of this world our blessedness is deferred, of which is said what I cited a little before. If what we see not we hope for, we do by patience wait for it. By this patience holy David bore the revilings of a railer, and when he might easily have avenged himself, not only did it not, but even refrained another who was vexed and moved for him, and more put forth his kingly power by prohibiting than by exercising vengeance. Nor at that time was his body afflicted with any disease or wound, but there was an acknowledging of a time of humility, and a bearing of the will of God, for the sake of which there was a drinking of the bitterness of contumely with most patient mind. This patience the Lord taught when the servants, being moved at the mixing in of the tears and wishing to gather them up, he said that the householder answered, Leave both to grow until the harvest. That, namely, must be patience put up with, which must not be in haste put away. Of this patience himself afforded and showed an example, when, before the passion of his body, he so bore with his disciple Judas that, ere he pointed him out as the traitor, he endured him as a thief, and, before experience of bonds and cross and death, did, to those lips so full of guile, not deny the kiss of peace. All these, and whatever else there be, which it were tedious to rehearse, belong to that manner of patience by which the mind doth, not its own sins, but any evils soever from without, patiently endure in itself, while the body remains altogether unhurt. But the other manner of patience is that by which the same mind bears any troubles and grievances whatsoever in the sufferings of the body, not as do foolish or wicked men for the sake of getting vain things or perpetrating crimes, but as is defined by the Lord, for righteousness' sake. In both kinds the holy martyrs contended, for both with scornful reproofs of the ungodly were they filled, where, the body remaining intact, the mind hath its own, as it were, blows and wounds, and bears these unbroken, and in their bodies they were bound, imprisoned, vexed with hunger and thirst, tortured, gashed, torn asunder, burnt, butchered, and with piety immovable, submitted unto God their mind, while they were suffering in the flesh all that exquisite cruelty could devise in its mind. It is indeed a greater fight of patience when it is not a visible enemy, that by persecution and rage would urge us into crime, which enemy may openly and in broad day be by not consenting overcome. But the devil himself, he who doth likewise by means of the children of infidelity, as by his vessels, persecute the children of light, doth by himself hiddenly attack us, by his rage putting us on to do or say something against God. As such had holy Job experience of him, by both temptations vexed, but in both through steadfast strength of patience and arms of piety unconquered. For first, his body being left unhurt, he lost all that he had, in order that the mind, before excruciation of the flesh, might, through withdrawal of the things which men are wont to prize highly, be broken, and he might say something against God upon loss of the things, for the sake of which he was thought to worship him. He was smitten also with sudden bereavement of all his sons, so that whom he had begotten one by one he should lose all at once, as though their numerousness had been not for the adorning of his felicity, but for the increasing of his calamity. But where, having endured these things, he remained immovable in his God, he cleaved to his will, whom it was not possible to lose but by his own will, and in place of the things he had, he held him who took them away, in whom he should find what should never be lost. For he that took them away was not that enemy who had will of hurting, but he who had given to that enemy the power of hurting. The enemy next attacked also the body, and now not those things which were in the man from without, but the man himself, in whatever part he could, he smote. From the head to the feet were burning pains, were crawling worms, were running sores. Still in the rotting body the mind remained entire and 
horrid as were the tortures of the consuming flesh, with inviolate piety and uncorrupted patience it endured them all. There stood the wife, and instead of giving her husband any help, was suggesting blasphemy against God. For we are not to think that the devil, in leaving her when he took away the sons, went to work as one unskilled in mischief, rather how necessary she was to the tempter he had already learnt in Eve. But now he had not found a second Adam whom he might take by means of a woman. More cautious was Job in his hours of sadness than Adam in his bowers of gladness. The one was overcome in the midst of pleasant things, the other overcame in the midst of pains. The one consented to that which seemed delightsome, this other quailed not in torments most affrightsome. There stood his friends too, not to console him in his evils, but to suspect evil in him. For while he suffered so great sorrows, they believed him not innocent, nor did their tongue forbear to say that which his conscience had not to say, that so amid ruthless tortures of the body his mind also might be beaten with truthless reproaches. But he, bearing in his flesh his own pains, in his heart others' errors, reproved his wife for her folly, toward his friend's wisdom, preserved patience in each and all. To this man let them look who put themselves to death when they are sought for to have life put upon them, and by bereaving themselves of the present deny and refuse also that which is to come. Why, if people were driving them to deny Christ, or to do anything contrary to righteousness, like true martyrs they ought rather to bear all patiently than to dare death impatiently. If it could be right to do this for the sake of running away from evils, holy Job would have killed himself, that being in so great evils, in his estate, in his sons, in his limbs, through the devil's cruelty, he might escape them all. But he did not. Far be it from him, a wise man, to commit upon himself what not even that unwise woman suggested. And if she had suggested it, she would, with good reason, here also have had that answer which she had when suggesting blasphemy. Thou hast spoken as one of the foolish women. If we have received good at the hand of the Lord, shall we not bear evil? Seeing even he also would have lost patience, if either by blasphemy, as she had suggested, or by killing himself, which not even she had dared to speak of, he should die, and be among them of whom it is written, Woe unto them that have lost patience, and rather increase than escape pains. If after the death of his body he should be hurried off to punishment, either of blasphemers, or of murderers, or of them which are worse even than parasites, for if a parasite be on that account more wicked than any homicide, because he kills not merely a man, but a near relative, and among parasites too, the nearer the person killed, the greater criminal he is judged to be. Without doubt, worse still is he who kills himself, because there is none nearer to a man than himself. What then do these miserable persons mean, who, though both here they have inflicted pain upon themselves, and hereafter, not only for their impiety towards God, but for the very cruelty which they have exercised upon themselves, will deservedly suffer pains of his inflicting, do yet seek moreover the glories of martyrs, since even if for the true testimony of Christ they suffered persecution and killed themselves, that they might not suffer anything from their persecutors, it would be rightly said to them, Woe unto them which have lost patience! For how hath patience her just reward, if even an impatient suffering receives the crown? Or how shall that man be judged innocent, to whom is said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, if he commit murder upon himself, which he is forbidden to commit upon his neighbor? Let then the saints hear from holy scripture the precepts of patience. My son, when thou comest to the service of God, stand thou in righteousness and fear, and prepare thy soul for temptation, bring thine heart low, and bear up, that in the last end thy life may increase. All that shall come upon thee, receive thou, and in pain bear up, and in thy humility have patience. For in the fire gold and silver is proved, but acceptable men in the furnace of humiliation. And in another place we read, My son, faint not thou in the discipline of the Lord, neither be wearied when thou art chidden of him. For whom the Lord loveth he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. What is here set down, son whom he receiveth, the same in the above-mentioned testimony is acceptable men. For this is just, that we, who from our first felicity of paradise, for contumacious appetence of things to enjoy, were dismissed, 
through humble patience of things that annoy may be received back, driven away for evil doing, brought back for suffering evil, there against righteousness doing ill, here for righteousness' sake patient of ills. But concerning true patience, worthy of the name of this virtue, whence it is to be had must now be inquired, for there are some who attribute it to the strength of the human will, not which it hath by divine assistance, but which it hath of free will. Now this error is a proud one, for it is the error of them which abound, of whom it is said in the psalm, a scornful reproof to them which abound, and a despising to the proud. It is not, therefore, that patience of the poor which perisheth not for ever, for these poor receive it from that rich one to whom is said, My God art thou, because my goods thou needest not, of whom is every good gift and every perfect gift, to whom crieth the needy and the poor, and in asking, seeking, knocking, saith, My God, deliver me from the hand of the sinner, and from the hand of the lawless and unjust, because thou art my patience, O Lord, my hope from my youth up. But these which abound and disdain to be in want before God, lest they receive of him true patience, they which glory in their own false patience, seek to confound the counsel of the poor, because the Lord is his hope. Nor do they regard, seeing they are men, and attribute so much to their own, that is, to the human will, that they run into that which is written, Cursed is every one who putteth his hope in man. Whence, even if it chance them, that they do bear up under any hardships or difficulties, either that they may not displease men, or that they may not suffer worse, or in self-pleasing and love of their own presumption, do with most proud will bear up under the same. It is meet that concerning patience this be said unto them, which concerning wisdom the blessed apostle James saith, This wisdom cometh not from above, but is earthly, animal, devilish. For why may there not be a false patience of the proud, as there is a false wisdom of the proud? But from whom cometh true wisdom, from him cometh also true patience. For to him singeth that poor in spirit, unto God is my soul subjected, because from him is my patience. But they answer and speak, saying, if the will of man, without any aid of God, by strength of free choice, bears so many grievous and horrible distresses, whether in mind or body, that it may enjoy the delight of this mortal life and of sins, why may it not be that in the same manner the selfsame will of man, by the same strength of free choice, not thereunto looking to be aided of God, but unto itself by natural possibility sufficing, doth, in all of labor or sorrow, that is put upon it, for righteousness and eternal life's sake, most patiently sustain the same. Or is it so, say they, that the will of the unjust is sufficient without aid of God for them, yea, even to exercise themselves in undergoing torture for iniquity, and before they be tortured by others, sufficient the will of them which love the respiting of this life, that, without aid of God, they should, in the midst of most atrocious and protracted torments, persevere in a lie, lest, confessing their misdeeds, they be ordered to be put to death, and not sufficient the will of the just, unless strength be put into them from above, that whatever be their pains they should, either for beauty's sake of very righteousness, or for love of eternal life, bear the same. They which say these things do not understand that as well each one of the wicked is in that measure for endurance of any ills more hard, in what measure the lust of the world is mightier in him, as also that each one of the just is in that measure for endurance of any ills more brave, in what measure in him the love of God is mightier. But lust of the world hath its beginning from choice of the will, its progress from enjoyableness of pleasure, its confirmation from the chain of custom, whereas the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, not verily from ourselves, but by the Holy Spirit which is given unto us. And therefore from him cometh the patience of the just, by whom is shed abroad their love of him, which love of charity, the apostle praising and setting off, among its other good qualities, saith that it beareth all things. Charity, saith he, is magnanimous. And a little after, he saith, endureth all things. The greater then is in saints the charity or love of God, the more do they endure all things for him whom they love, and the greater in sinners the lust of the world, the more do they endure all things for that which they lust after. And consequently, from that same source cometh true patience of the righteous, 
from which there is in them the love of God, and from which that same source, the false patience of the unrighteous, from which is in them the lust of the world, with regard to which the Apostle John saith, Love not the world, neither the things that be in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him, because all that is in the world is lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes and pride of life, which is not of the Father, but is of the world. This concupiscence, then, which is not of the Father, but is of the world, in what measure it shall in any man be more vehement and ardent, in that measure becometh each more patient of all troubles and sorrows for that which he lusteth after. Therefore, as we said above, this is not the patience which descendeth from above, but the patience of the godly is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. And so that is earthly, this heavenly, that animal, this spiritual, that devilish, this godlike. Because concupiscence, whereof it cometh that persons sinning suffer all things stubbornly, is of the world, but charity, whereof cometh that persons living aright suffer all things bravely, is of God. And therefore, to that false patience it is possible that without aid of God the human will may suffice, harder in proportion as it is more eager of lust, and bearing ills with more endurance the worse itself becometh. While to this, which is true patience, the human will, unless aided and inflamed from above, doth not suffice, for the very reason that the Holy Spirit is the fire thereof, by whom, unless it be kindled to love that impassable good, it is not able to bear the ill which it suffereth. For, as the divine utterances testify, God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God dwelleth in him. Whoso therefore contends that love of God may be had without aid of God, what else does he contend but that God may be had without God? Now what Christian would say this, which no madman would venture to say? Therefore in the apostle, true, pious, faithful patience, saith exultingly, and by the mouth of the saints, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Not through ourselves, but through him that loved us. And then he goes on and adds, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is that love of God which is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit which is given unto us. But the concupiscence of the bad, by reason of which there is in them a false patience, is not of the Father, as saith the Apostle John, but is of the world. Here, some man shall say, if the concupiscence of the bad, whereby it comes that they bear all evils for that which they lust after, be of the world, how is it said to be of their will? As if truly they were not themselves also of the world when they love the world, forsaking him by whom the world was made. For they serve the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Whether then by the word world the Apostle John signifies lovers of the world, the will, as it is of themselves, is therefore of the world, or whether under the name of the world he comprises heaven and earth and all that is therein, that is, the creature universally, it is plain that the will of the creature, not being that of the creator, is of the world. For which cause, to such, the Lord saith, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. And to the apostle he saith, If ye were of the world, the world would love his own but lest they should arrogate more unto themselves than their measure craved. And when he said that they were not of the world, should imagine this to be of nature, not of grace. Therefore he saith, But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. It follows that they once were of the world, for that they might not be of the world, they were chosen out of the world. Now this election, the apostle demonstrating to be not of merits going before in good works, but election of grace, saith thus, And in this time a remnant by election of grace is saved, but if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. This is election of grace, that is, election in which through the grace of God men are elected, 
This, I say, is election of grace, which goes before all good merits of men. For if it be to any good merits that it is given, then is it no more gratuitously given, but is paid as a debt, and consequently is not truly called grace, where reward, as the same apostle saith, is not imputed as grace, but as debt. Whereas, if, that it may be true grace that is gratuitous, it find nothing in man to which is due of merit, which thing is well understood in that saying, Thou wilt save them for nothing, then assuredly itself gives the merits, not to merits is given. Consequently, it goes before even faith, from which it is that all good works begin. For the just, as is written, shall live by faith. But, moreover, grace not only assists the just, but also justifies the ungodly. And therefore, even when it does aid the just and seems to be rendered to his merits, not even then does it cease to be grace, because that which it aids it did itself bestow. With a view, therefore, to this grace, which precedes all good merits of man, not only was Christ put to death by the ungodly, but died for the ungodly, and ere that he died he elected the apostles, not, of course, then just, but to be justified, to whom he saith, I have chosen you out of the world. For to whom he said, Ye are not of the world, and then, lest they should account themselves never to have been of the world, presently added, But I have chosen you out of the world. Assuredly, that they should not be of the world was by his own election of them conferred upon them. Wherefore, if it had not been through their own righteousness, not through his grace, that they were elected, they would not have been chosen out of the world, because they would already not be of the world, if already they were just. And again, if the reason why they were elected was that they were already just, they had already first chosen the Lord. For who can be righteous but by choosing righteousness? But the end of the law is Christ, for righteousness is to every one that believeth. Who is made unto us wisdom of God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that, as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. He then is himself our righteousness. Whence also the just of old, before the incarnation of the word, in this faith of Christ and in this true righteousness, which thing Christ is unto us, were justified, believing this to come, which we believe come, and they themselves by grace were saved through faith, not of themselves, but by the gift of God, not of works, lest haply they should be lifted up. For their good works did not come before God's mercy, but followed it. For to them was it said, and by them written, Long ere Christ was come in the flesh, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will show compassion on whom I will have compassion. From which words of God the Apostle Paul should so long after say, It is not therefore of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. It is also their own voice, Long ere Christ was come in the flesh, My God, his mercy shall prevent me. How indeed could they be aliens from the faith of Christ, by whose charity even Christ was foreannounced unto us, without the wisdom of whom not any of mortals either hath been, or is, or ever shall be able to be righteous? If then, being already just, the apostles were elected by Christ, they would have first chosen him, that just men might be chosen, because without him they could not be just. But it was not so, as himself saith to them, not ye have chosen me, but I have chosen you. Of which the Apostle John speaks, Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. Since the case is so, what is man, while in this life he uses his own proper will, ere he choose and love God, but unrighteous and ungodly? What, I say, is man, a creature going astray from the Creator, unless his Creator be mindful of him, and choose him freely, and love him freely? Because... He is himself not able to choose or love, unless, being first chosen and loved, he be healed, because by choosing blindness he perceiveth not, and by loving laziness is soon wearied. But perchance some man may say, In what manner is it that God first chooses and loves unjust men, that he may justify them, when it is written, Thou hatest, Lord, all that work iniquity? In what way, think we, but in a wonderful and ineffable manner? And yet even we are able to conceive that the good physician both hates and loves the sick man, hates him because he is sick, loves him, that he may drive away his sickness. Let thus much have been said with regard to charity, without which in us there cannot be true patience, because in good men it is the love of God which endureth all things, 
as in bad men, the lust of the world. But this love is in us by the Holy Spirit which was given us. Whence, of whom cometh in us love, of him cometh patience. But the lust of the world, when it patiently bears the burdens of any manner of calamity, boasts of the strength of its own will, like as of the stupor of disease, not robustness of health. This boasting is insane, it is not the language of patience, but of dotage. A will like this, in that degree, seems more patient of bitter ills, in which it is more greedy of temporal good things, because more empty of eternal. But, if it be goaded on and inflamed with deceitful visions and unclean incentives by the devilish spirit, associated and conspiring therewith in malignant agreement, this spirit makes the will of the man either frantic with error or burning with appetite of some worldly delight, and hence it seems to show a marvellous endurance of intolerable evils. But yet it does not follow from this that an evil will without instigation of another and unclean spirit, like as a good will without aid of the Holy Spirit, cannot exist. For that there may be an evil will even without any spirit either seducing or inciting, is sufficiently clear in the instance of the devil himself, who is found to have become a devil, not through some other devil, but of his own proper will. An evil will, therefore, whether it be hurried on by lust, whether called back by fear, whether expanded by gladness, whether contracted by sadness, and in all these perturbations of mind, enduring and making light of whatever are to others, or at another time more grievous, this evil will may, without another spirit to goad it on, seduce itself, and in lapsing by defection from the higher to the lower, the more pleasant it shall account that thing to be which it seeks to get, or fears to lose, or rejoices to have gotten, or grieves to have lost, the more tolerably for its sake bear what is less for it to suffer than that is to be enjoyed. For whatever that thing be, it is of the creature of which one knows the pleasure." because, in some sort, the creature loved approaches itself to the creature loving in fond contact and connection to the giving experience of its sweetness. But the pleasure of the Creator, of which is written, And from the river of thy pleasure wilt thou give them to drink, is of far other kind, for it is not, like us, a creature. Unless, then, its love be given to us from thence, there is no source whence it may be in us and consequently a good will by which we may love God cannot be in man save in whom God also worketh to will. This good will, therefore, that is, a will faithfully subjected to God, a will set on fire by sanctity of that ardour which is above, a will which loves God and his neighbour for God's sake, whether through love, of which the Apostle Peter makes answer, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee, whether through fear, of which says the Apostle Paul, in fear and trembling, work out your own salvation, whether through joy, of which he says, in hope rejoicing, in tribulation patient, whether through sorrow, with which he says, he had great grief for his brethren, in whatever way it endure, what bitterness and hardship soever, it is the love of God which endureth all things, and which is not shed abroad in our hearts, but by the Holy Spirit given unto us, whereof piety makes no manner of doubt, but as the charity of them which holily love, so the patience of them which piously endure, is the gift of God. For it cannot be that the divine scripture deceiveth or is deceived, which not only in the old books hath testimonies of this thing, when it is said unto God, My patience thou art, and from him is my patience, and where another prophet saith, that we receive the spirit of fortitude, but also in the apostolic writings we read, because unto you is given on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but to suffer for him. Therefore let not that make the mind to be as of its own merit uplifted, wherewith he is told that he is of another's mercy gifted. But if, moreover, any not having charity which pertaineth to the unity of spirit and the bond of peace whereby the Catholic Church is gathered and knit together, being involved in any schism, doth, that he may not deny Christ, suffer tribulations, straits, hunger, nakedness, persecution, perils, prisons, bonds, torments, swords or flames or wild beasts, or the very cross, through fear of hell and everlasting fire. In no wise is all this to be blamed, nay, rather, this also is a patience meet to be praised. For we cannot say that it would have been better for him that, by denying Christ, he should suffer none of these things, 
which he did suffer by confessing him, but we must account that it will perhaps be more tolerable for him in the judgment than if by denying Christ he should avoid all those things, so that what the apostle saith, if I shall give my body to be burnt, but have not charity, it profiteth me nothing, should be understood to profit nothing for obtaining the kingdom of heaven, but not for having more tolerable punishment to undergo in the last judgment. But it may well be asked whether this patience likewise be the gift of God, or to be attributed to strength of the human will, by which patience one who is separated from the church doth, not for the error which separated him, but for the truth of the sacrament or word which hath remained with him, for fear of pains eternal, suffer pains temporal. For we must take heed, lest haply, if we affirm that patience to be the gift of God, they in whom it is should be thought to belong also to the kingdom of God. But if we deny it to be the gift of God, we should be compelled to allow that without aid and gift of God there can be in the will of man somewhat of good. Because it is not to be denied that it is a good thing that a man believe he shall undergo pain of eternal punishment if he shall deny Christ, and for that faith endure and make light of any manner of punishment of man's inflicting. So then, as we are not to deny that this is the gift of God, we are thus to understand that there be some gifts of God possessed by the sons of that Jerusalem which is above and free and mother of us all, for these are in some sort the hereditary possessions in which we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, but some other which may be received even by the sons of concubines, to whom carnal Jews and schismatics or heretics are compared. For though it be written, Cast out the bondmaid and her son, for the son of the bondmaid shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And though God said to Abraham, In Isaac shall thy seed be called, which the apostle hath so interpreted as to say, That is, not they which be sons of the flesh, these be the sons of God, but the sons of the promise are counted for the seed, that we might understand the seed of Abraham in regard of Christ to pertain by reason of Christ to the sons of God who are Christ's body and members, that is to say, the church of God, one, true, very begotten, Catholic, holding the godly faith, not the faith which works through elation or fear, but which worketh by love. Nevertheless, even the sons of the concubines, when Abraham sent them away from his son Isaac, he did not omit to bestow upon them some gifts, that they might not be left in every way empty, but not that they should be held as heirs. For so we read, And Abraham gave all his estate unto Isaac, and to the sons of his concubines gave Abraham gifts, and sent them away from his son Isaac. If then we be sons of Jerusalem the free, let us understand that other be the gifts of them which are put out of the inheritance, other the gifts of them which be heirs. For these be the heirs to whom is said, Ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption of sons, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Cry we therefore with the spirit of charity, and until we come to the inheritance in which we are always to remain, let us be, through love which becometh the freeborn, not through fear which becometh bondmen, patient of suffering. Cry we, so long as we are poor, until we be with that inheritance made rich seeing how great earnest thereof we have received, in that Christ, to make us rich, made himself poor, who, being exalted unto the riches which are above, there was sent one who should breathe into our hearts holy longings, the Holy Spirit, of these poor, as yet believing, not yet beholding, as yet hoping, not yet enjoying, as yet sighing in desire, not yet reigning in felicity, as yet hungering and thirsting, not yet satisfied, of these poor then, the patience shall not perish for ever. Not that there will be patience there also, where ought to endure, there shall not be, but will not perish, meaning that it will not be unfruitful, but its fruit it will have for ever, therefore it shall not perish for ever. For he who labours in vain when his hope fails for which he laboured, says with good cause, I have lost so much labour. But he who comes to the promise of his labor says, congratulating himself, I have not lost my labor. Labor, then, is said not to perish or be lost, not because it lasts perpetually, but because it is not spent in vain. So also the patience of the poor of Christ, who yet are to be made rich as heirs of Christ, shall not perish forever, not because there also we shall be commanded patiently to bear, but because 
for that which we have here patiently borne, we shall enjoy eternal bliss. He will put no end to everlasting felicity who giveth temporal patience unto the will, because both the one and the other is of him bestowed as a gift upon charity, whose gift that charity is also. End of On Patience by Augustine of Hippo Funeral Oration on Miletius by Gregory of Nyssa This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Footnote. Miletius, Bishop of Antioch, died at Constantinople, whither he had gone to attend the Second Ecumenical Council, A.D. 381. Of the translation of the remains to his own metropolis described in this oration, Sosomon says, quote, The remains of Miletius were at the same time conveyed to Antioch and deposited near the tomb of Babylus the Martyr. It is said that by the command of the emperor the relics were received with honor in every city through which they had to be conveyed, and that psalms were sung on the occasion, a practice that was quite contrary to the usual Roman customs. After the pompous interment of Miletius, Flavian was ordained in his stead. This gave rise to fresh troubles, end quote. The rationale of the rising relic worship, at all events of the sanctity of tombs, is thus given by Origen, quote, a feeling such as this, of bodies differing as tenanted by different souls, has prompted some to go so far as to treat as divine the remains of uncommon men. They feel that great souls have been there, while they would cast forth the bodies of the morally worthless without the honor of a funeral at the masse. This perhaps is not the right thing to do, still it proceeds from a right instinct, enuas ugius for it is not to be expected of a thinking man that he would take the same pains over the burial of an Anatus as he would over a Socrates, and that he would place the same barrow or the same sepulchre over each. End quote. Contra Celsus. Again, quote, The dwelling place of the reasoning soul is not to be flung irreverently aside like that of the irrational soul, and more than this, we Christians believe that the reverence paid to a body that has been tenanted by a reasoning soul, passes to him also who has received a soul, which by means of such an instrument has fought a good fight. End quote. End footnote. The number of the apostles has been enlarged for us by this our late apostle being reckoned among their company. These holy ones have drawn to themselves one of like conversation, those athletes, a fellow athlete, those crowned ones, another crowned like them. The pure in heart, one chaste in soul, those ministers of the word, another herald of that word. Most blessed indeed is our Father, for this his joining the apostolic band and his departure to Christ. Most pitiable we, for the unseasonableness of our orphaned condition does not permit us to congratulate ourselves on our Father's happy lot. For him, indeed, better it was by his departure, hence to be with Christ, but it was a grievous thing for us to be severed from his fatherly guidance. Behold, it is a time of need for counsel, and our counsellor is silent. War, the war of heresy, encompasses us, and our leader is no more. The general body of the church labors under disease, and we find not the physician. See in what a strait we are. Oh, that it were possible I could nerve my weakness and, rising to the full proportions of our loss, burst out with a voice of lamentation adequate to the greatness of the distress, as these excellent preachers of yours have done, who have bewailed with loud voice the misfortune that has befallen them in this loss of their father. But what can I do? How can I force my tongue to the service of the theme, thus heavily weighted and shackled, as it were, by this calamity? How shall I open my mouth, thus subdued to speechlessness? How shall I give free utterance to a voice now habitually sinking to the pathetic tone of lamentations? How can I lift up the eyes of my soul, veiled as I am with this darkness of misfortune? Who will pierce for me this deep, dark cloud of grief, and light up again, as out of a clear sky, the bright ray of peace? From what quarter will that ray shine forth now that our star has set? O oh, evil moonless night that gives no hope of any star! 
With what an opposite meaning, as compared with those of late, are our words uttered in this place now. Then we rejoiced with the song of marriage, now we give way to piteous lamentation for the sorrow that has befallen us. Then we chanted an epithalamium, but now a funeral dirge. You remember the day when we entertained you at the feast of that spiritual marriage and brought home the virgin bride to the house of her noble bridegroom, when, to the best of our ability, we proffered the wedding gifts of our praises, both giving and receiving joy in turn. Footnote. This all refers to the very recent installation of Gregory of Nazianzum in the Episcopal Chair of Constantinople, on which occasion also Gregory of Nyssa seems to have preached. End footnote. But now our delight has been changed to lamentation, and our festal garb become sackcloth. It were better, maybe, to suppress our woe and to hide our grief in silent seclusion, so as not to disturb the children of the bride-chamber, divested as we are of the bright marriage garment, and clothed instead with the black robe of the preacher. For since that noble bridegroom has been taken from us, sorrow has all at once clothed us in the garb of black, nor is it possible for us to indulge the usual cheerfulness of our conversation, since envy has stripped us of our proper and becoming dress. Rich in blessings we came to you, now we leave you bare and poor. The lamp we held right above our head, shining with the rich fullness of light, we now carry away quenched, its bright flame all dissolved into smoke and dust. We held our great treasure in an earthen vessel, vanished as the treasure, and the earthen vessel, emptied of its wealth, is restored to them who gave it. What shall we say who have consigned it? What answer will they make by whom it is demanded back? O oh, miserable shipwreck, how even with the harbour around us have we gone to pieces with our hopes? How has the vessel, fraught with a thousand bales of goods, sunk with all its cargo, and left us destitute who were once so rich? Where is that bright sail which was ever filled by the Holy Ghost? Where is that safe helm of our souls which steered us while we sailed unhurt over the swelling waves of heresy? Where that immovable anchor of intelligence which held us in absolute security and repose after our toils? Where that excellent pilot, footnote, Meletius was president of the council, end footnote, who steered our bark to its heavenly goal? Is, then, what has happened of small moment, and is my passionate grief unreasoning? Is it not rather that I reach not the full extent of our loss, though I exceed in the loudness of my expression of grief? Lend me, or oh lend me, my brethren, the tear of sympathy. When you are glad, we shared your gladness. Repay us, therefore, this sad recompense. Rejoice with them that do rejoice. This we have done. It is for you to return it by weeping with them that weep. It happened once that a strange people bewailed the loss of the patriarch Jacob and made the misfortune of another people their own, when his united family transported their father out of Egypt and lamented in another land the loss that had befallen them. They all prolonged their mourning over him for thirty days and as many nights. Ye, therefore, that are brethren and of the same kindred, do as they who were of another kindred did. On that occasion the tears of strangers was shed in common with that of countrymen. Be it shed in common now, for common is the grief. Behold, these your patriarchs. All these are children of our Jacob. All these are children of the free woman. No one is base-born, no one suppositious. Nor indeed would it have become that saint to introduce into the nobility of the family of faith a bondwoman's kindred. Therefore he is our father, because he was the father of our father. Footnote, i.e. the spiritual father of Basil, the father, brother, really, of Gregory. End footnote. Ye have just heard what and how great things an Ephraim and a Manassas related of their father, and how the wonders of the story surpassed description. Give me also leave to speak on them. For this beatification of him from henceforth incurs no risk, neither fear I envy, for what worse evil can it do me? Know then what the man was, one of the nobility of the East, blameless, just, genuine, devout, innocent of any evil deed. Indeed, the great Job will not be jealous if he who imitated him be decked with the like testimonials of praise. But envy that has an eye for all things fair cast a bitter glance upon our blessedness 
and one who stalks up and down the world, also stalked in our midst and broadly stamped the footmark of affliction on our happy state. It is not herds of oxen or sheep that he has maltreated, unless in a mystical sense one transfers the idea of a flock to the church. It is not in these that we have received injury from envy. It is not in asses or camels that he has wrought us loss, neither has he excruciated our bodily feelings by a wound in the flesh. No, but he has robbed us of our very head. And with that head have gone away from us the precious organs of our senses. That eye which beheld the things of heaven is no longer ours, nor that ear which listened to the divine voice, nor that tongue with its pure devotion to truth. Where is that sweet serenity of his eyes? Where that bright smile upon his lips? Where that courteous right hand with fingers outstretched to accompany the benediction of the mouth? I feel an impulse as if I were on the stage, to shout aloud for our calamity. O church, I pity you. To you, the city of Antioch, I address my words. I pity you for this sudden reversal. How has your beauty been despoiled? How have you been robbed of your ornaments? How suddenly has the flower faded? Verily, the grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. What evil eye, what witchery of drunken malice has intruded on that distant church? What is there to compensate her loss? The fountain has failed. The stream has dried up. Again has water been turned into blood. Oh, the sad tidings which tell the church of her calamity. Who shall say to the children that they have no more a father? Who shall tell the bride she is a widow? Alas for their woes! What do they send out? What do they receive back? They sent forth an ark. They received back a coffin. The ark, my brethren, was that man of God, an ark containing in itself the divine and mystic things. There was the golden vessel full of divine manna, that celestial food. In it were the tables of the covenant written on the tablets of the heart, not with ink, but by the spirit of the living God. For on that pure heart no gloomy or inky thought was imprinted. In it, too, were the pillars, the steps, the chapters, the lamps, the mercy seat, the baths, the veils of the entrances. In it was the rod of the priesthood which budded in the hands of our saint, and whatever else we have heard the ark contained was all held in the soul of that man. But in their stead, what is there now? Let description cease. Cloths of pure white linen, scarves of silk, abundance of perfumes and spices, the loving munificence of a modest and beautiful lady, for it must be told, so as to be for a memorial of her, what she did for that priest when, without stint, she poured the alabaster box of ointment on his head. But a treasure preserved within, what is it? Bones, now dead, and which even before disillusion had rehearsed their dying, the sad memorials of our affliction. Oh, what a cry like that of old will be heard in Rama, Rachel weeping, not for her children, but for a husband, and admitting not of consolation. Let alone ye that would console, let alone force not on us your consolation. Let the widow indulge the deepness of her grief, let her feel the loss that has been inflicted on her. Yet she is not without previous practice in separation. In those contests in which our athlete was engaged, she had before been trained to bear to be left. Certainly you must remember how a previous sermon to ours related to you the contests of the man, how throughout, even in the very number of his contests, he had maintained the glory of the Holy Trinity, which he ever glorified, for there were three trying attacks that he had to repel. You have heard the whole series of his labors, what he was in the first, what in the middle, and what in the last. I deem it superfluous to repeat what has been so well described, yet it may not be out of place to add just so much as this. When the church, so sound in the faith, at the first beheld the man, she saw features truly formed after the image of God, she saw love welling forth, she saw grace poured around his lips, a consummate perfection of humility beyond which it is impossible to conceive anything further, a gentleness like that of David, the understanding of Solomon, a goodness like that of Moses, a strictness as of a Samuel, a chastity as of Joseph, the skill of a Daniel, a zeal for the faith, such as was in the great Elijah, a purity of body like that of the lofty-minded John, an unsurpassable love as of Paul. She saw the concurrence of so many excellences in one soul, and, thrilled with a blessed affection, she loved him. 
her own bridegroom, with a pure and virtuous passion. But ere she could accomplish her desire, ere she could satisfy her longing while still in the fervor of her passion, she was left desolate when those trying times called the athlete to his contests. While, then, he was engaged in these toilsome struggles for religion, she remained chaste and kept the marriage vow. A long time intervened, during which one, with adulterous intent, footnote, he alludes here to Paulinus and Demophilus, two Arians mentioned by Socrates and Sosimon, in footnote, made an attempt upon the immaculate bridal chamber. But the bride remained undefiled, and again there was a return, and again an exile. And thus it happened thrice until the Lord dispelled the gloom of that heresy, and sending forth a ray of peace, gave us the hope of some respite from these lengthened troubles. But when at length they had seen each other, when there was a renewal of those chaste joys and spiritual desires, when the flame of love had again been lit, all at once his last departure breaks off the enjoyment. He came to adorn you as his bride, he failed not in the eagerness of his zeal, he placed on this fair union the chaplets of blessing, an imitation of his master. As did the Lord at Cana of Galilee, so here did this imitator of Christ. The Jewish water pots, which were filled with the water of heresy, he filled with genuine wine, changing its nature by the power of his faith. How often did he set before you a chalice not of wine, when, with that sweet voice, he poured out in rich abundance the wine of grace, and presented to you the full and varied feast of reason. He went first with the blessing of his words, and then his illustrious disciples were employed in distributing his teaching to the multitude. We too were glad and made our own the glory of your nation. Up to this point, how bright and happy is our narrative, what a blessed thing it were with this to bring our sermon to an end. But after these things, what follows? Call for the mourning women as says the prophet Jeremiah. In no other way can the burning heart cool down, swelling as it is with its affliction, unless it relieves itself by sobs and tears. Formerly the hope of his return consoled us for the pang of separation, but now he has been torn from us by that final separation. A huge intervening chasm is fixed between the church and him. He rests indeed in the bosom of Abraham, but there exists not one who might bring the drop of water to cool the tongue of the agonized. Gone is that beauty, silent is that voice, closed are those lips, fled that grace. Our happy state has become a tale that is told. Elijah of old time caused grief to the people of Israel when he soared from earth to God, but Elisha consoled them for the loss by being adorned with the mantle of his master, but now our wound is beyond healing, our Elijah has been caught up, and no Elisha left behind in his place. You have heard certain mournful and lamenting words of Jeremiah, with which he bewailed Jerusalem as a deserted city, and how, among other expressions of passionate grief, he added this, The ways of Zion do mourn. These words were uttered then, but now they have been realized. For when the news of our calamity shall have been spread abroad, then will the ways be full of mourning crowds, and the sheep of his flock will pour themselves forth, and like the Ninevites utter the voice of lamentation, or rather will lament more bitterly than they. For in their case their mourning released them from the cause of their fear, but with these no hope of release from their distress removes their need of mourning. I know too of another utterance of Jeremiah, which is reckoned among the books of the Psalms, it is that which he made over the captivity of Israel. The words run thus, We hung our harps upon the willows, and condemned ourselves as well as our harps to silence. I make this song my own, for when I see the confusion of heresy, this confusion is Babylon. And when I see the flood of trials that pours in upon us from this confusion, I say that these are the waters of Babylon by which we sit down and weep, because there is no one to guide us over them. Even if you mention the willows and the harps that hung thereon, that part also of the figure shall be mine, for in truth our life is among the willows, the willow being a fruitless tree, and the sweet fruit of our life having all withered away. Therefore we have become fruitless willows, and the harps of love we hung upon those trees are idle and unvibrating. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, he adds, may my right hand be forgotten. Suffer me to make a slight alteration to that text. It is not we who have forgotten the right hand, but the right hand that has forgotten us, and the tongue has cleaved to the roof of his own mouth, 
and barred the passage of his words so that we can never again hear that sweet voice. But let me have all tears wiped away, for I feel that I am indulging more than is right in this womanish sorrow for our loss. Our bridegroom has not been taken from us. He stands in our midst, though we see him not. The priest is within the holy place. He has entered into that within the veil, whither our forerunner Christ has entered for us. He has left behind him the curtain of the flesh. No longer does he pray to the type or shadow of the things in heaven, but he looks upon the very embodiment of these realities. No longer through a glass darkly does he intercede with God, but face to face he intercedes with him, and he intercedes for us and for the negligences and ignorances of the people. He has put away the coats of skin. No need is there now for the dwellers in paradise of such garments as these. But he wears the raiment which the purity of his life has woven into a glorious dress. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of such a man, or rather, it is not death but the breaking of bonds, as it is said, Thou hast broken my bonds asunder. Simeon has been let depart. He has been freed from the bondage of his body. The snare is broken and the bird hath flown away. He has left Egypt behind, this material life. He has crossed not this red sea of ours, but the black, gloomy sea of life. He has entered upon the land of promise, and holds high converse with God upon the mount. He has loosed the sandal of his soul, that, with the pure step of thought, he may set foot upon that holy land where there is the vision of God. Having therefore, brethren, this consolation, do ye who are conveying the bones of our Joseph to the place of blessing, Listen to the exhortation of Paul, Sorrow not as others who have no hope. Speak to the people there, relate the glorious tale, speak of the incredible wonder, how the people in their myriads, so densely crowded together as to look like a sea of heads, became all one continuous body and like some watery flood surged around the procession bearing his remains. Tell them how the fair David distributed himself in diverse ways and manners among the innumerable ranks of people and danced before that ark in the midst of the men of the same and of different language. Tell them how the streams of fire from the succession of the lamps flowed along in an unbroken track of light and extended so far that the eye could not reach them. Tell them of the eager zeal of all the people, of his joining the company of apostles, and how the napkins that bound his face were plucked away to make amulets for the faithful. Let it be added to your narration how the emperor showed in his countenance his sorrow for that misfortune, and rose from his throne, and how the whole city joined the funeral procession of the saint. Moreover, console each other with the following words. It is a good medicine that Solomon has for sorrow, for he bids wine to be given to the sorrowful, saying this to us, the laborers in the vineyard, give therefore your wine to those that are in sorrow, not that wine which produces drunkenness, plots against the senses and destroys the body, but such as gladdens the heart, the wine which the prophet recommends when he says, wine maketh glad the hearts of man. Pledge each other in that liquor undiluted and with the unstinted goblets of the word, that thus our grief may be turned to joy and gladness by the grace of the only begotten Son of God, through whom be glory to God, even the Father, for ever and ever. Amen. End of Funeral Oration on Miletius by Gregory of Nyssa On Pilgrimages by Gregory of Nyssa this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Since, my friend, you ask me a question in your letter, I think that it is incumbent upon me to answer you in their proper order upon all the points connected with it. It is, then, my opinion that it is a good thing for those who have dedicated themselves once for all to the higher life to fix their attention continually upon the utterances in the gospel, and just as those who correct their work in any given material by a rule, and by means of the straightness of that rule, bring the crookedness which their hands detect to straightness, so it is right that we should apply to these questions a strict and flawless measure, as it were, I mean, of course, the gospel rule of life, and in accordance with that, direct ourselves in the sight of God, now, there are some amongst those who have entered upon the monastic and hermit life who have made it a part of their devotion to behold those spots at Jerusalem where the memorials of our Lord's life in the flesh are on view. 
It would be well then to look to this rule, and if the finger of its precepts points to the observance of such things, to perform the work as the actual injunction of our Lord. But if they lie quite outside the commandment of the Master, I do not see what there is to command anyone who has become a law of duty to himself to be zealous in performing any of them. When the Lord invites the blessed to their inheritance in the kingdom of heaven, he does not include a pilgrimage to Jerusalem among their good deeds. When he announces the Beatitudes, he does not name amongst them that sort of devotion. But as to that which neither makes us blessed nor sets us in the path to the kingdom, for what reason it should be run after, let him that is wise consider. Even if there were some profit in what they do, yet even so, those who are perfect would do best not to be eager in practicing it. But since this matter, when looked closely into, is found to inflict upon those who have begun to lead the stricter life a moral mischief, it is so far from being worth an earnest pursuit that it actually requires the greatest caution to prevent him who has devoted himself to God from being penetrated by any of its hurtful influences. What is it, then, that is hurtful in it? The holy life is open to all, men and women alike. Of that contemplative life the peculiar mark is modesty, but modesty is preserved in societies that live distinct and separate, so that there should be no meeting and mixing up of persons of opposite sex. Men are not to rush to keep the rules of modesty in the company of women, nor women to do so in the company of men. But the necessities of a journey are continually apt to reduce this scrupulousness in a very indifferent observance of such rules. For instance, it is impossible for a woman to accomplish so long a journey without her conductor. On account of her natural weakness, she has to be put upon her horse and to be lifted down again. She has to be supported in difficult situations. Whichever we suppose, that she has an acquaintance to do this yeoman service or a hired attendant to perform it, Either way, the proceeding cannot escape being reprehensible. Whether she leans on the help of a stranger or on that of her own servant, she fails to keep the law of correct conduct, and as the inns and hostelries and cities of the East present many examples of license and of indifference to vice, how will it be possible for one passing through such smoke to escape it without smarting eyes? Where the ear and the eye is defiled and the heart too by receiving all those foulnesses through eye and ear, how will it be possible to thread without infection such seats of contagion? What advantage, moreover, is reaped by him who reaches those celebrated spots themselves? He cannot imagine that our Lord is living in the body there at the present day, but has gone away from us foreigners, or that the Holy Spirit is in abundance at Jerusalem, but unable to travel as far as us. Whereas, if it is really possible to infer God's presence from visible symbols, one might more justly consider that he dwelt in the Cappadocian nation than in any of the spots outside it. For how many altars there are on which the name of our Lord is glorified? One could hardly count so many in all the rest of the world. Again, if the divine grace was more abundant about Jerusalem than elsewhere, sin would not be so much the fashion amongst those that live there. But, as it is, there is no form of uncleanness that is not perpetrated amongst them. Rascality, adultery, theft, idolatry, poisoning, quarreling, murder are rife, and the last kind of evil is so excessively prevalent that nowhere in the world are people so ready to kill each other as there, where kinsmen attack each other like wild beasts and spill each other's blood merely for the sake of lifeless plunder. Well, in a place where such things go on, what proof, I ask, do you have of the abundance of divine grace? but I know what many will retort to all that I have said. They will say, Why did you not lay down this rule for yourself as well? If there is no gain for the godly pilgrim in return for having been there, for what reason did you undergo the toil of so long a journey? Let them hear from me my plea for this. By the necessities of that office in which I have been placed, by the dispenser of my life to live, it was my duty, for the purpose of the correction which the Holy Council had resolved upon, to visit the places where the church in Arabia is. Secondly, as Arabia is on the confines of the Jerusalem district, I had promised that I would confer also with the heads of the Holy Jerusalem churches, because matters with them were in confusion and needed an arbiter. Thirdly, our most religious emperor had granted us facilities for the journey by postal conveyance, 
so that we had to endure none of those inconveniences which in the case of others we have noticed. Our wagon was, in fact, as good as a church or monastery to us, for all of us were singing psalms and fasting in the Lord during the whole journey. Let our own case therefore cause difficulty to none, rather let our advice be all the more listened to, because we are giving it upon matters which came actually before our eyes. We confessed that the Christ who is manifested is very God, as much before as after our sojourn at Jerusalem. Our faith in him was not increased afterwards any more than it was diminished. Before we saw Bethlehem, we knew his being made man by means of the Virgin. Before we saw his grave, we believed in his resurrection from the dead. Apart from seeing the Mount of Olives, we confessed that his ascension into heaven was real. We derived only thus much of profit from our travelling thither, namely that we came to know, by being able to compare them, that our own places are far holier than those abroad. Wherefore, O ye who fear the Lord, praise him in the places where ye now are. Change of place does not affect any drawing nearer unto God, but wherever thou mayest be, God will come to thee if the chambers of thy soul be found of such a sort that he can dwell in thee and walk in thee. But if thou keepest thine inner man full of wicked thoughts, even if thou wast on Golgotha, even if thou wast on the Mount of Olives, even if thou stoodest on the memorial rock of the resurrection, Thou wilt be as far away from receiving Christ into thyself as one who has not even begun to confess him. Therefore, my beloved friend, counsel thee, brethren, to be absent from the body, to go to our Lord, rather than to be absent from Cappadocia, to go to Palestine. And if any one should adduce the command spoken by our Lord to his disciples that they should not quit Jerusalem, let him be made to understand its true meaning. Inasmuch as the gift and the distribution of the Holy Spirit had not yet passed upon the apostles, our Lord commanded them to remain in the same place until they should have been endued with power from on high. Now if that which happened at the beginning, when the Holy Spirit was dispensing each of his gifts under the appearance of a flame, continued until now, it would be right for all to remain in that place where that dispensing took place. But if the Spirit bloweth where he listeth, those... Two who have become believers here are made partakers of that gift, and that according to the proportion of their faith, not in consequence of their pilgrimage to Jerusalem. End of On Pilgrimages by Gregory of Nyssa The Passion of St. Symphorosa and Her Seven Sons by Julius Africanus this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. When Adrian had built a palace and wished to dedicate it by that wicked ceremonial and began to seek responses by sacrifices to idols, and to the demons that dwell in idols, they replied and said, The widow, Symphorosa, with her seven sons, wounds us day by day in invoking her god, if she, therefore, together with her sons, shall offer sacrifice, we promise to make good all that you ask. Then Adrian ordered her to be seized, along with her sons, and advised them in courteous terms to consent to offer sacrifices to the idols. To him, however, the blessed Symphorosa answered, My husband, Jetalius, together with his brother, Amantius, when they were tribunes in thy service, suffered different punishments for the name of Christ rather than consent to sacrifice to idols, and, like good athletes, they overcame thy demons in death. For rather than be prevailed on, they chose to be beheaded and suffered death, which death, being endured for the name of Christ, gained them temporal ignominy indeed among men of this earth, but everlasting honor and glory among the angels, and moving now among them, and exhibiting the trophies of their sufferings, they enjoy eternal life with the King Eternal in the heavens. The Emperor Adrian said to the Holy Symphorosa, Either sacrifice thou, along with thy sons, to the omnipotent gods, or else I shall cause thee to be sacrificed thyself, together with thy sons. The blessed Symphorosa answered, And whence is this great good to me, that I should be deemed worthy, along with my sons, to be offered as an oblation to God? The Emperor Adrian said, I shall cause thee to be sacrificed to my gods. The blessed Symphorosa replied, Thy gods cannot take me in sacrifice, but if I am burned for the name of Christ, my God, I shall rather consume those demons of thine. 
The Emperor Adrian said, Choose thou one of these alternatives, either sacrifice to my gods or perish by an evil death. The blessed Symphorosa replied, Thou thinkest that my mind can be altered by some kind of terror, whereas I long to rest with my husband Jetalius, whom thou didst put to death for Christ's name. Then the Emperor Adrian ordered her to be led away to the Temple of Hercules, and there first to be beaten with blows on the cheek, and afterwards to be suspended by the hair. But when by no argument and by no terror could he divert her from her good resolution, he ordered her to be thrown into the river with a large stone fastened to her neck. And her brother Eugenius, principal of the district of Tiber, picked up her body and buried it in a suburb of the same city. Then, on another day, the Emperor Adrian ordered all her seven sons to be brought before him in company, and when he had challenged them to sacrifice to idols, and perceived that they yielded by no means to his threats and terrors, he ordered seven stakes to be fixed around the temple of Hercules, and commanded them to be stretched on the blocks there. And he ordered Crescens, the first, to be transfixed in the throat, and Julian, the second, to be stabbed in the breast, and Nemesius, the third, to be struck through the heart, and Primitivus the fourth to be wounded in the navel, and Justin the fifth to be struck through in the back with a sword, and Stractius the sixth to be wounded in the side, and Eugenius the seventh to be cleft in twain from the head downwards. The next day again the Emperor Adrian came to the temple of Hercules and ordered their bodies to be carried off together and cast into a deep pit, and the pontiffs gave to that place the name to the seven Biothanati. After these things, the persecution ceased for a year and a half, in which period the holy bodies of all the martyrs were honoured and consigned with all care to tumuli erected for that purpose, and their names are written in the Book of Life. The natal day, moreover, of the holy martyrs of Christ, the blessed Symphorosa and her seven sons, Crescens, Julian, Nemesius, Primitivus, Justin, Stractius, and Eugenius, is held on the 18th July. Their bodies rest on the Tibetine Road, at the eighth milestone from the city, under the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom is honor and glory for ever. Amen. End of the Passion of St. Symphorosa and Her Seven Sons by Julius Africanus